the stream. Why? Um, just to be awkward. It's a bit mean, isn't it? Yeah. A bit cruel. Cruella. Oh man, Cruella too. That's that is hype. Oh. <laughs> What's the Ella. subtitle gonna be? Do you think? What well, Ryzen said, too well. Oh, wait, did the first one do well? <clears throat> well enough to justify well, a sequel, apparently. Apparent. I mean, it's, it's a Disney mm. movie, so despite its quality, it probably did quite well. Yeah. Um, fair enough. And there were people, <laughs> apparently, who liked the fashion in it. Oh, yeah, oh. the fashion was my favorite part. This is my favorite part. It was the, the way that fashion was portrayed in that movie is indistinguishable from randomness, which is why I loved it so much. My favorite kind of fashion. Mm. Is it It'll beautiful? It'll be called Cruella it with an R. Oh, oh. oh, that's they might do that. Cruella. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, I hate it. Oh, that's so horrible. They might, they might just do it. What would you rather see, they Cruella might. 2 or Captain Marvel 2? <laughs> I'm getting I both, so... Be, <laughs> that wasn't the question, Marvel. Jay! I think I would rather see Captain Marvel 2. Cruella was like, that was a really unpleasant experience. At least Captain Marvel 2 is connected to a universe that, like... Makes things well, worse. I, I, I might have projects that I, are... I don't have that much investment in anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was about the to say... Cruella that Cinematic in, Universe? I like, well, no. Oh, no. But I guess the thing is, is that you can absolutely do a story with Captain Marvel, and you could still do a story with the one that we've got in the MCU. Like, there's a story that you can tell there. I don't know what story I'm interested in for Cruella, you know? Well, yeah. um, what if Cruella decides to apply for a management slash ownership of a local Chick-fil-A? <laughs> I feel like you could do a story about her trying to become Be a manager of a Chick-fil-A. Because, yeah, because yeah, Chick-fil-A, they're very particular about who they give, you know, management rights to, you know, who they franchise that out to. They're very particular. They have a they have a very good reputation when it comes to food service, staff quality, and the logistics of getting all those people fed and I would unironically you know, taken watch care of. this. Yeah, but you have to be really like tip top ship shape. If you've ever gone to a Chick-fil-A, it is almost always busy, and the parking lots are designed in such a way that they can have multiple lanes of drive throughs There are people, the way that they have their system set up is atypical for most fast food places where people, they'll have workers but there. The, the generally opening like of younger. the film is just Cruella narrating this to the audience. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. could put her little spin on explaining the Chick-fil-A logistics and tactical manual to the you know, to the average moviegoer who might not understand that a lot goes into making a Chick-fil-A work smoothly while also producing delicious chicken Rex, sandwiches. Did you, work, did, you, did you used to work at Chick-fil-A? No. Oh, this you know is just Rags's creative I, imagination. It's just it's wonderful. This is actually has nothing to do with imagination. I've just noticed whenever I go to a Chick-fil-A, right? I you just sort of notice that it's ran in a different way than other fast food places. Uh, often, a lot of the times, it'll be young people who are passing out food and taking numbers, marking down which car needs what. Young be people, very nice. disgusting. Yeah, they yeah, are actually zoomers. quite. Um, that, no, yeah, here's the, that's the weird thing, though. They're, they're actually quite not disgusting as far as young people go. That is weird. They're, they're <laughs> polite. Weird, yeah. yeah, they're so polite weird. and they're nice and they want to make sure that you have a good time. The last one that I went to down in Hearst, Texas, uh, about last a week or person. so ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure many of you have been there, uh, but there was this old guy as like the lobby greeter and he and he was just going around saying hi to everyone, making sure things were OK, asking how their day went. And he'd pick up some stuff and adjust the chairs and he was just going around and his job was just to make sure everything was all right with everybody. And that place was packed and boy, they scoot him in and out. This this podcast is not sponsored by Chick Fil A. Just so we're clear, are we live already? Well, yeah, yes, and we are you actually sponsored you, by Quib Gift, though. We are sponsored by Quib <laughs> Gift, everyone. If by the way, if you put in your referral code EFAB at quibgift.com, you will get twenty percent off your next uh, month's worth of Quib Gift uh, Quib Gift subscriptions. Yes, um, but that's only for the first uh, ninety-three people who uh, sign up. 
That's true. Yeah. Seven have preemptively signed up because they no, know us that well. Was, no, 93 was the number. Fight, Don't, do fight, fight, fight. Don't do this to me live, Fringy. Don't do this to me live, Fringy. That's, that's, we have to I'm appear. Just, we have to appear to, united. Green's trying to cover it up. I, the reality is, the seven of us here right now signed up because it's such an amazing deal. So that was down yeah, from 100 to 93. This, it's called insider trading, mm -hmm. and it's not illegal and if you're not a government employee. I think. So I think it is. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know. It's about not illegal that. if we don't tell Use, anyone. Using using referral codes isn't illegal, but owning stock options is, which I guess that's a problem. We don't own stock in Quib Gift. Well, you don't. Because uh, yeah, yeah, you um, Quibgift is not a publicly it. traded company. Yeah. It is. Um, it's ran by the 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 Quib family, of course, of which it gets its name. Ronald the Quib, namesake of Quib Gift. Not like the Quib gift Quib family, prizes. just so we're clear. Yeah. Quib Enterprises, International Org. Quib Who's your favorite member of the Quibs? Flat Quib. Oh, I don't um, know them personally. It's hard to. Actually. It's yeah, and I feel like even if I did, it would be hard to choose, right? Like I wouldn't want to say. Do it with real people here. here. Yeah, exactly. I, in a forum such as this, I don't feel it would be appropriate to pick and choose our favorites amongst yeah. the Quib. The quib kin. It's not about any individuals. It's about the gift of quib uh, gift uh, quiblet. Yes, when it comes to the quib family, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Absolutely, and isn't that just a wonderful? Oh, isn't that kind of an insult? To it is one of the parts. No, it isn't. No, I think that they would agree. I think, for instance, if you put like the seven of us, right, individually, we are very powerful. However, yeah. if you combine us, we are we are powerful plus. An unspecified what if we, sum what if we of power. squabble and bicker and 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 fail to achieve our goals due to that? Um, I mean, I guess in this hypothetical, maybe I suppose that probably would never happen. But in the event, unlikely as it is that it did, I I don't know. I hope that I die never knowing. Well, I can arrange that. Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> By like not telling me. Just to take you out to the woods and. I'm crying as I'm stroking my gun. Oh, you you don't know about the EFAP lore. I get like a plus 10 terrain bonus in the woods. That's not where you want to take me. <laughs> oh, I'll take you I'm, to the desert then. That's sort of still the wilderness in general. All right, fine. I'll take you to fucking Arby's. Don't take don't me care. to the desert. That's where the Tuscan Raiders are, and they're going to brutal, <laughs> brutalize every, us. If you take him to, that's where the gun it. trains are in the desert. <laughs> if you well, take him to the desert, he'll be so fascinated. If you take him to Chick Fil A, he'll be so fascinated yeah, by yeah, how yeah. the whole thing runs. He'll just be distracted, and you know, you can get. Yeah. I'll just really be easy. happy to be served by these wonderful, pleasant people who give me delicious chicken sandwiches. Mm. What, one last good memory cool. before you get put down. Yeah, that's nice. Put yeah. down like they've been carrying me around. Like you carry a dog around, and then you put it down so it could go wherever it wants to go. Yeah, that's the spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Look at it that, that way. That sounds nice. That's good. I, I appreciate people who can respect my independence. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Eva, everyone. Now. Hello, everyone. Hi. Episode 169. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're nice. doing a sex nice. fat for, in celebration of the sex number. High <laughs> five, you guys. 169 is a sex number? Yeah. Is that worth there's just a guy with an erection watching? <laughs> yes. <laughs> as you 69 with someone else? It's a 169? That's what the kids call <laughs> it, yeah. precisely what it is. Nice. Um, what, a, what a special EFAP we've decided to do today. Where we are, we are gonna we're gonna have a nice long chat between all seven of us. And all seven. There's something that links the seven of us. You see, something nobody saw coming, but I figured Columbia? it out between the weeks of figuring out what what Eve episodes we're gonna be doing, and I was like, mm -hmm. I think we all like stories. I looked into it. Oh, I thought this was about. That's true. That yeah, Fuck. my parents are architects, and so as a result, I've grown up with a love of stories. <laughs> I get it. I'm, I can't wait to put you down. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can go to different stories? Climb yes. them stairs, the story, and pass the, through all the, the stories. The final story. The highest we're going to take you down world. a couple stories, Rags. We're going to take you down. We're going to take you. That's, that's what architects say to each other when one of them's a little too haughty. And, <laughs> and the other ones go, we're going to take you down a couple stories. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> spiders say that they're going to put dirt in each other's eyes and architects say that they're going to take each other down a few stories. It all lines mm -hmm. up. It's pretty cool. The whole culture there. Yeah. Um, now I've, I've put all of our names into a custom list randomizer so that I will ask questions and then it'll just tell us who's going to be answering in what order. And that's the most structure I want for this in any way, shape or form. <laughs> 
other than that, cool. everyone's job is to interrogate everyone. So when someone says, yeah, I, I, I like this. Wait, wait, goes, why, why is that fuck? our job? Where were you yesterday between 9 and 11 p.m.? <laughs> Not yeah. 9 11. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where were you on 9 11? I, have... the I was in, I was in I was school. I was playing. Because some of us, Jay, were you even alive when 9 11 yeah. happened? Yes, I was alive when 9 11 happened, but no, I okay. wasn't old enough to remember. Now, a lot of people stopped being alive when 9 11 happened. Oh, that's true. That's because no. it's, tra it's a tragedy. It's a terrible tragedy. What happened yeah. on 9 11? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ask Hassan about that. I agree. So anyway, hey, I know who that is. Hassan, the chicken man. <laughs> Mr. Hassan. Man, we're on a roll already. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so the idea here is I have provided four incredibly complicated questions to everyone here. And uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty broad, you know. And you can interpret away and answer as you wish. But let us discover of the first question, which you don't even know which order I'm asking them, except Duma probably. <laughs> because he's the one that inspired me to change it. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me, let me, get, there we go. Here's a list. Now, what have we got? Uh, oh, well, looks like, well, uh, you know, I'll just, uh, just share the list with you guys. I feel nervous, like I'm in, a, yeah, like I'm in should. high school again, and it's math <laughs> class, and I don't want to get called on, because I don't know what the fuck numbers mean. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to hit you. Well. Uh, oh, you're implying my teachers did, or <laughs> me, and they didn't know? Maybe. I'm not like them, Rags. I won't beat you. Oh, no. But this this is the order that we've been provided by the gods of random listings. Um, okay. So, question number one. What is the most important element of storytelling? Jay? I think that it is cohesion <gasps> and efficiency in conveying information to an audience. Wow. You had that answer just things. straight up like that. It's like you knew I was going to ask you. Fuck uh, you. <laughs> no. So I've never heard these questions before. I'm just very smart. Oh, I had a feeling. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by cohesion, then? So as far as I see it, right, when you're a writer, um, when you're writing a little, little story to entertain your little cuck audience, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the main things that you're doing is um, you're conveying information to the audience, right? That's the purpose of everything you're doing is you are sharing information through uh, loads of different methods, right? If it's on screen, then you can, you can show them stuff and then you can, they can also hear the words. But even if it's you know, in prose, you've got so many different methods of just word choice, um, things like that, to communicate to your audience um, any information that you want to. And I think the effectiveness of how you communicate that information is one of the most fundamental aspects of storytelling that you can't really do without. You can't just have one five minute scene to show that a character is angry, right? You, you show that a character is angry while you also characterize them in other ways, while you also show how other characters are reacting to it, while you also have cohesion with the world that you're building and you have cohesion with, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's important stuff. I disagree. That's the end of my sentence. <laughs> it's, it's time for someone else's turn to hop in. Your critiques are poor. Well, because you, the second one you said was um, like efficiency. Was it, I'm assuming the Sorry, getting the information I, across efficiently. Yeah, yeah, efficiency of information, right? Is that like brevity? Um, I suppose so, but more so um, accomplishing more than one thing with the same scene. Um, you know, you don't just have a scene that. Well, you can, but you you can just have a scene for characterization. But it's also important to think, okay, can I get um, world building and plot in the same scene where I'm getting characterization? Because I, I, I don't know, like, a lot of you gets... probably think that, you know, um, have seen a movie where a scene exists purely for exposition and plot. And it's like, oh, this, can we get other stuff here as well, though? Can we, like, maybe spend some time learning about the characters? Because I like the characters. Was one of the things about like good dialogue writing is achieving more than one thing. Yeah. Line. If you can, if you can advance the plot while also developing character or tying it into theme, or uh, using like subtext to like, imply more than what you know than what is on the surface. Like, there's a lot of ways to try and 
condense it down or achieve yeah more than one thing at a time in all of the stories i've consumed as well i don't think i've seen anything that's painfully bad where i'm also able to go man look at all of the stuff this one line is doing though like yeah it, mm -hmm. it, it, it seems to be a hurdle that um that it, it really takes talent and understanding of other forms of writing well other aspects of writing to really uh hop over that little hurdle um, well, is it so? Is it always preferable to have more things achieved? Not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. No, but you you want to have a reason for what you're doing. And when would you yeah, say that's... like it makes more sense to limit it to one thing or fewer than than more? When you really want to have a scene to have focus, um, you don't want anything. I mean, that was the last thing, right? Um, because it is sort of. Um, Confusing because like I, I was I was I was ready there to say like yeah when you want to see to have focus you know you don't want to be bothering with world building right now but like the whole point of it is that like um it's like let's say you want to focus on character for a scene if if um if it is done naturally and and with cohesion then you're not going to be distracted by the fact there's world building going on at the same time because the world building is just a natural result of all of the character that you're seeing as well like you know the turn of phrase that a character might use is also cohesive with the world and and not just their frame of mind that the, the writer is trying to convey at that one time. Uh, I think, I guess, it's it's always important to uh, never lose sight of cohesion within your story um, and then have things being congruent with each other as a result of your hyper-focus on one aspect. So if you are trying to characterize, you know, if you're trying to character, if you're trying too hard to characterize a character that your world suffers or that your plot suffers, then you've got, you know, an issue. But if yeah. you if you just if you've just got a scene where oh no world building happened to be relevant here, um, even though I think you're probably always going to get some form of world building in the attitudes of your characters. But let's say um, oh let's say no plot is happening in this scene, right? No you've plot just got is two happening. Characters in this scene. talking. No, just me. Um, All right. What, what, are you, what are you up to, Rags? What's that? I don't get it. I, I was just doing what I'm told, but it's fine. I was the only one who did. It's not worthy of mention further. You can carry on. Did you I say say? I did say say, didn't I? You did. Let's say that no plot is happening in this scene. No plot is hap. You know what, Jay? We're the only ones having fun, so I wouldn't even worry about you it. Enjoy the bit. <laughs> yeah, my I fun is so... watching you do it. <laughs> I was yeah. so ready for. I was <laughs> <Yeah>. so ready. For... <laughs> I was so ready for more than one of you. All of you little little cucks to just join in there, and it's just it's just my my faithful little rags doing it. We're, uh, That's how I'm describing we're it from now on, rags. We're just... Rags has got our back. Yeah. I think as long as every scene has gratuitous sex and a track by Aerosmith, <laughs> you're probably fine. Yeah. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. That's I don't want to close my eyes. Don't want to. It sounds like the room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when, when I was talking, thinking of that. Yeah. <laughs> so when like talking about cohesion, I don't think it's necessarily I mean, achieving a lot of stuff in one in one scene is a really valuable skill to have as a writer, but it's not always necessary. It's just necessary to not forget aspects of your story that and, and to let them suffer just because you're focusing on something else. Yeah, everything yeah, is awesome. everything is an interwoven tapestry. Ooh. I think it's particularly important in film because the main constraint is time. You just do not have very much time and a story needs to accomplish a lot of different things. So pretty much always, I mean, I can think of exceptions like the beginning of Wally is an example where there's not that like it's very character and world building focused and very little else is going on. Like there's almost no, no plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really depends but, like what you're trying to achieve with your film. Yeah, but I mean, the, yeah, the, the number of exceptions are pretty small. I mean, I, I know from having to you know try and write myself that this is exactly something you're paying attention to it's like okay we've got plot goals and character goals right and the scene needs to be interesting on its own and all these things need to happen all at the same time um and if you aren't if you aren't usually accomplishing a bunch of different things at the same time the scene probably sucks <laughs> in my it, experience it, it just kind of stops dead in its tracks right it's just like what are we doing here and and like you don't want to reach a point where at the end i always feel like when you think about a lot of the best stories very few of them waste time like it's very it's very rare that you think about yeah we could have done without that scene like i think about a lot of the best films it's like man you're really making effective use of like every moment of time that you have to advance yeah. in some way yeah I that's mean, that's brevity yeah I, I guess it's the idea that like a moment wasted is 
It's like, well, you could have used that moment to push us a little bit further to add like a little bit uh, more, I guess, supporting evidence for like some main point or to start building up maybe like an adjacent th uh, like thematic element to run through the story. It's, you know, like you don't want to waste time, essentially. Yeah, um, one of my hotter takes about film is that when you're watching a film, I can usually tell whether it's like exceptional within about like 30 seconds, even if nothing in particular is going on. Because like they will have gone so far out of their way to try and pack as much as possible into that 30 seconds, right? Um, and it, yeah, like great films make incredibly good use of their time. And, that's in, not, in terms of storytelling and conveying information yeah, that's, not, that's not that's not pacing that's not you know as, as many things as possible have happened within 30 seconds it's just the amount of information that you as the audience are learning right yeah because like oh, in no country I'm for old men is very little is being communicated it's just the way it's you know the way things are being communicated is incredibly good right yeah what do you think? where you can draw things from will tell you what you're in for is that like i is that the point that you were making jay like that the way in which it's communicated. I mean, honestly, I think I, I was struggling to choose. I was struggling to choose just one aspect of stories, and I thought, hey, if I say mm -hmm. cohesion, that's kind of <laughs> all of them, isn't it? <laughs> kind of, because you can yeah, apply that to all of plot, the world, and theme. Yeah. yeah, everything needs to be cohesive. Um, but yeah, I mean, treating it as um, treating it as an interwoven thing, as as you can't just well, you can just do one at a time. But understanding that most scenes are probably going to be more effective if you're doing more than one. If you're um, and doing and doing one in a truly you know effectively written story, um, taking care of one of these things is going to help you also take care of the others because the characters you know is going to be going to be informed by the world in which they live and they're going to be informed by the events of the plot they're going through. All that kind it's of jazz. It's going to be hard to have a really like amazing jazz. scene that's like advancing the plot without also reinforcing the characters and, yeah. you know, yeah. setting an interesting yeah. tone and like matching up with pacing and yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure there are examples in the wild of like scenes that have advanced the plot that have like nothing to do with our main characters that we're actually focusing on. And it's just like, I don't know, we cut to the, we cut to the, the king of the land who is not a character in the story, but he's making an important decision. And it's shown here that how you know that the decision he makes and some very important to the story. You know, I'm sure that that's happened in in, in great stories. Um, but usually, you know, you you're in a situation where if you're seeing plot happen to the characters, that's informing your impression of the characters and your understanding of them. You you can't just have plot happen to the characters and not learn about the characters. That doesn't work. And yeah. something that's gonna. Something that's going to kind of come up with this question is that there's very little, if anything, that applies to every single story. <laughs> it's like uh, most of the things that you could think that would be good almost all the time. Like you can find an exception. Yeah. Um, but like you, I, I like to think of things in terms of like actionable intelligence. It's like how useful is this to think about? How much does this help me write or how much does this help me understand films? And yeah, that's that, that's definitely up there in terms of uh, things to pay attention to for sure. Um. Unless anyone wants to poke or prod a bit more on Jay, we could move to the next contestant. Stop poking and prodding me. <laughs> hey, Rags. Hello. What is the most important element of storytelling? Well, I thought about this for an amount of time. And I think when we talk about most important kinds of things of really any kind, it's important to go super, super foundational almost maybe to levels that you don't typically even think to think about because they're sort of assumed and take it for granted. But I think that the most important thing that a story needs to have in terms of its elements is that it needs to be comprehensible. Everything that you pull from a story, everything that you pull from the world around you has to be noticeable. You have to be able to detect it with your senses and then you have to make sense of it after that. But everything from logic and consistency and internal non-contradictions and stuff of that nature, it all flows downstream from you being able to sort of grasp what it is. You have your brain has to recognize it for as a thing that needs to be decoded and translated. Um, if it's not comprehensible, then nothing else really will matter. Uh, even in dreams right dreams are 
nonsensical and weird and they're they're not quite right and they just don't work like normal but even then there's a part of you that comprehends what's happening in a dream even as as bizarre as it is it's a rearrangement of details and places and things and stuff that your subconscious is mishmashing together but you still understand it in some way and in some level and i think that a story needs to make sure that whenever it puts something out whenever it has a character doing a thing or it exists in a place or portrays the passage of you know time and events leading to other events there has to be a level of a, a brain must be able to take that and recognize it for something that's happening that brain yeah um, brain i wish directors at amateur film festivals understood that <laughs> yeah I, I was actually gonna gonna point that out this is such a problem with indie films sometimes like um a lot of a lot of times People will think, oh, you know, most films are linear in chronology, right? I'm going to do a nonlinear film because that's more interesting. And then you just can't tell what the fuck is going on. And it's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> it so, like I guess the that's, uh, when, we, when it's comprehensibility as a how do you think that comprehensibility applies or changes when we talk about different mediums of storytelling, like a book versus a film or a video game? Oh, that's so hard to tell because, like, James Joyce is not very comprehensible, right? But people have well, regarded I, him as like, I, one of the best guess, authors uh, ever. I mean, I guess it's a, a question of like, so comprehensibility. It's like, so what what happens when I decide to write some prose that is a little more tricky, right? Like, why? How do I present the argument that I shouldn't tell everything as total matter of fact if uh, comprehensibility and like achieving maximum comprehensibility is like the most important aspect of storytelling? I might have ordered it a little poorly. Um, I think it's because it's not oh, really go, something go that we it. think about because it's no, so, I don't think so we take it for granted so much. But if someone like oftentimes we use the words making sense and nonsense in ways that are a little bit higher tier than what we really mean. Like when you see someone who's no, no, I, I think a dream sort of is, is a decent enough example where dreams don't make sense, but they also kind of do. And where you, you draw the line them. at. Yeah, you, you understand what's happening in a dream. And a lot of times you don't even recognize you're in it. So it makes some level of sense. So it's not really not completely unsensical. Uh, and when a story, because you, ha you have to use uh, really an indie medium, whether it's using text in a, in a book or images and sound in a movie um, or in a game as well, if you can't convey that information and if the person just can't grasp what you're actually trying to tell them, not, and, and I'm not meaning that in terms of themes or anything, even in universe, we're just talking about, this is still in the meta um, of being able to just convey these sorts of things to another person. If you can't even do that, then it's, it's kind of all for nothing unless it's only something that's meant for yourself. And even then uh, I don't even know if you could, design something incomprehensible for yourself because you're the mind that kind of created it for yourself so you know where it's all coming from i guess um a question i would have is the show don't tell right that's always the appeal to the idea that there is something to be gained from not presenting something directly uh rather hinting at it subtly through the way that a character reacts to something being said or the subtext, like the way that they respond to a situation or something that's like kind of just unspoken uh, about the world. How do we reconcile the idea of conveying information in a way that's clear and easy to understand with the fact that a lot of the best stories will convey their information in an indirect way um, that is more effective at getting the, uh, like more, 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 I guess for lack of a better word, interesting to watch or read. I think we're still going a little bit to um, like whenever you whenever you're watching a story and you see a character do a thing or say a thing that has a meaning that is not yet apparent yet or that character is operating on information that the viewer doesn't have yet. Whenever you have verbal or dramatic irony in a story or a situation, that's all still going past like all of that is built off of an even more foundational concept of things being comprehensible. You understand that a character is speaking. You understand that there is a space in which a person or an object is existing. 
you understand that your senses can detect all of these things and you can make sense of them through what you understand about the world and language and what objects generally mean or what their purpose normally is. I um, guess um, what I'm getting at is like if we take Starry Night and we put it against like a hyper-realistic, super, super detailed, just like Baroque painting of a night sky... What, could someone make the argument that the Baroque painting is more comprehensible than Starry Night, and that if so, that there is something to be said about it being stronger? Comprehensible, sure, but I would say that we're talking about elements of a story, and I think that an image is not the same story that a a well, typical... I, mean, I would say that like if you take a piece of art, that it is a story, like a, a painting is a story. In a sense, in, yeah. In a sense. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'd I'm say you're... As an example. Yeah, I, I would say they're two different things in the way that a um, like a surrealist. So, all right, so surrealism is generally the the, uh, the artistic movement and the style of surrealism is often described as uh, internally contradictive and nonsensical. Even though, if you have one, it's not contradictive in the same way that a story can be contradictive. Uh, if you're talking about generally imagery, like you could have two symbols that are next to each other that mean different things. And that could be mm -hmm. explained to someone as this image is contradictory, but that is used in a different sense. than if you're watching a story and two things will contradict each other at different points in the film, that is a different form of that kind of concept. Um, so in terms of a, a story like a, a, a narrative structure that exists within a movie, within a book, within a game. I think those are kind of a different, they're different but similar to how a, a single still image can tell a story. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to agree because like when we talk about stories, it's, you know, the fundamental is, is, is a series of events. And I guess it's a, a bit different to think about what a series of events means in a still image in terms of what you pull from it yeah. as a series of events yeah i mean it, a still image can really... convey a series of events i but... think oh yeah i think it can i guess it's yeah it can think about in a the difference in the way yeah it can in a different way fundamentally like, if you... like linear storytelling right where it's like this is the first scene this is the second scene this is the third scene um but then i guess it becomes more interesting to think about like a non-linear story a story that is presented yeah. you know like in chronological, you know, from even, beginning to end in terms of time, but but like it jumps around a different yeah, point even, in the story. Even things that are um, like told in nonlinear fashion or in very strange, uh, you know, structure sets for movies or really any form of media. Um, I guess I I don't know if I could say any blanket stuff on how that sort of relates to this. I suppose it might be just I'd have to see specifics or. And even then, all of these things would rely on, is the information able to be understood? Um, but What would be I, an example that you'd give for, like, incomprehensibility? And are there degrees of incomprehensibility that we'd be talking about when it comes to stories? Let's say someone... All right, uh, I, I can just well, make up a quick example just, here. Quick question, yeah, though. Uh, would you define, like, the characters not knowing which way is up as an entire faction in Star Wars, would that almost be incomprehensible because it's just like an impossibility or are we talking about something it's strange different? it's strange you bring up this example because while i was just kind of idly thinking about this concept that's something that sort of popped into my head and i asked really does it make <laughs> sense that somebody doesn't know which way is up well i guess if you get super basic and technical i guess it makes sense that somebody wouldn't know which way is up i, I guess it's possible that someone could do it I mean that that is a that's a concept that could be that that could be an attribute of someone's state of mind, but it doesn't make sense in the same way that mm. these people in this situation would not know which way is up. So I guess it depends on how deep you want to go with it. Like it's not it's not one of those um, like explicit kinds of like I guess if it's I guess I, we often. I feel like I need a, a phrase or a word to sort of really get into the nitty gritty of what I'm talking about in terms of making sense as a concept or being comprehensible because of the way uh, that we clarity? normally. Hmm? What about clarity? Um, 
kind of things have to be clear in a sense that you have to, you can comprehend them uh but if someone is like let's say you had one person who was like actually speaking just gibberish and making noises right that's not comprehensible there you're there there's there's really not anything being conveyed there it is just noise it was interesting you say that though was in the context is a thing, of is an event I was going to say, in the context of like an exorcism, that would be comprehensible in the sense that we know what's happening, but we don't know what this person means or is trying to say necessarily. Like, there's well, degrees I, of comprehension there, I guess. Yeah, like I was, I was going to yeah, follow that up with a person who's just talking to you normally, and they're still making noises and sounds, but you can recognize that these noises and sounds relate to the concepts of objects and abstracts, and you can understand what they're trying, what information they're trying to get across. Like how these two things are similar but vastly different in how you can interpret them and what they actually mean i was curious about um especially in relation to using the word comprehension but how does lovecraft sort of move into this then when being represented in stories i don't know um i suppose it depends on the th the specific thing especially because if it's Lovecraftian stuff like how do you truly convey to someone the something incomprehensible all right especially to the point where it makes you go insane ah spooky tentacles that's very scary um and how do you really get that idea across well there's, like, there's well, a good I example guess, i guess yeah. arguably you, you probably couldn't and it relies on the person to think of an abstract thing that doesn't really exist and how powerful they can sort of lose themselves in that imagery, um, whatever it is to that person. I think the father is a good example here because it's it's very clearly communicating to the audience the experience of having dementia and kind of losing your mind in a way. But the actual like the actual parts of story in some sense aren't comprehensible or there's something unclear. And that's kind of the yeah. point. That's well, how it accomplishes the, goal. the, the whole. Is. The reason that the father works is because of the parts of it that you can comprehend so that you know that something else is wrong. You wouldn't be able to have that sense of, of, of cohesion from his life missing if you didn't understand the other aspects that were leading you towards that conclusion. Right, so your ability to comprehend what is happening is how you make sense of the incomprehensibility of, uh, of what's happening. Yeah, like We stick with him but throughout that story as well. He's quite consistent yes. with us. Yeah. In yeah, yeah. the same way that Mahler brought up, it's really kind of strange at this point, but Mahler brought up specifically the not knowing which way is up thing. In the same way as I was thinking about this, the father is specifically another example that I floated around in my head where the character, I, I for, actually forget his name in the, in the story. Um, Anthony. Anthony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, in each one of those isolated events, those instances, for lack of a for, to use a gamer term, um, each one of those instances, he, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's the wrong inward instance. Uh, but he 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 recognizes people as people, maybe not the right ones, but he can recognize that they're talking to him. He can respond to them. He knows that he's in a, a space and can move around. Yeah. But each one of those instances isn't connected in a way that is comprehensible to him. But each one of those isolated, he can sort of like exist in. It might it does might not all make sense to him, especially the context of it all. But he can still sit on the couch and talk to this person and respond to them and think yeah. about the things that they say. And he recognizes I that he's in a place. I think mean, it's really important that you point out that he can still recognize a person as a person because that's the kind of thing that that has to be there have there have to be more basic consistencies like that that make the story comprehensible. You know, he he doesn't he, he doesn't start he doesn't mistake like some guy for the fridge. Yeah. If, if you got, if you if you if you took it to that level of absurdity, the story probably wouldn't be you you probably wouldn't understand the story as a viewer. Yeah, like you wouldn't would even know what's funny. even being, it would be hilarious. Um, but there is an aspect of you, you have to be able to get these ideas across and you have to be comprehensible enough to where just other people can get it. There is something to get. There's something to latch on to that, that ears can hear it, that eyes can see it, that it can be felt and that it can be translated into ideas.
which is generally something you don't even think about doing because it's so commonplace and it's so basic mm -hmm. that it's it's I don't even know if I can think of an example of a story where it's not even at that kind of level, but it's all foundational to it. Well, the, uh, the other question I was going to ask is like, I'm assuming your answer is only going to be that this is tough to figure out a lot of the time, but you know, like, do we need to explain what a gun does in a movie so that everyone can comprehend it? And it's like, probably not. Like, should we explain uh, what sci-fi weapons do, though, when they're brand new? This is this is the level of meta knowledge that we take into movies. That's yeah, it's inescapable, really. Um, like, oh, like, oh, the meta knowledge of knowing English. Oh, all the care you you take that information with you. The film doesn't even tell you what these words are. You know, it's you have to I think it's just a necessary aspect of being able to tell a story in these mediums I don't think it can function without it if we just just through utility oh absolutely it's just um, hard to draw the line I suppose right it is yeah it if you yeah stuff that isn't I think there's a a decent uh most of I, I think most of us even the people we cover on EFAP even the people who disagree with us I think there's a a general agreed upon line and it's a thick line. It's not, I don't think it's a thin line. I think it's a really thick line of stuff that is acceptable meta knowledge. Um, guns are a good example. We know what guns are and what they do. But if you presented us with some strange piece of sci-fi technology that doesn't look like a gun and it doesn't seem to be treated like one, we don't know what it is, what it does. I think most of that we could generally um, agree upon. Yeah, especially if, I guess, even if we get hmm? like weapons that are like fleshy or like abstract they're still being handled like a gun like they don't put them on their feet and start using them with their toes or something well, yeah and yeah. you have the benefit of they don't necessarily have to explain them if they show them to do things we will pick that up and we'll assume yes. that is what their yeah. limits are i immediately think of uh, rick and morty i was just fucking they, thinking them, about that <laughs> mention, <laughs> the dimensional guy has his little floompy thing and the, just holds it like you a killed gun. my gun yeah. <laughs> oh or south park where they have walkie talkies that's actually <laughs> yeah. still yeah. i don't want to understand how fucking great that example is it's the time cop he pulls a thing it's like a squelchy thing and it looks like he's aiming it like a gun and they i think they put their hands up because they don't know what it is they're just like yeah. oh no what is that <laughs> and then he like kind of cocks it like, yeah like, <laughs> well um, i like this one because it's uh, not it's like in in universe, it probably doesn't make sense that this thing is that is entirely well. No, it makes sense. It's not. It doesn't contradict anything. But it seems unlikely to me that something would exist that's so fundamentally different from a gun that it's fleshy and gooey, um, and killed is an appropriate word to use for it. But it's still cocked like a normal gun. <laughs> but like if I'm cocking it wet. like a normal gun is how they communicate to the audience what it is and what's going on, and you know it, it's it's. It's it gets away with that because of the tone that it's going for, really. I think. Well, that's a question. How do jokes factor into the idea of comprehensibility? If, like, for instance, it not like comprehending it joke, is the point. Well, yeah, like if a joke, if the joke is that that doesn't make sense, is are we talking the about why it be, works? You can probably extend this to just absurdist content in general. Um, mm. Things that are that are like that Xavier renegade angel kind of just wacky <laughs> absurdity, right? Where you can have mm -hmm. comprehensible, it's a very, very clever show, um, but it, it takes place in this sort of strange, absurd world, you know, where individual parts you can recognize as commentary. You could understand the lines. You know what the characters are saying and you, you could see how they behave the ways they do in this crazy, wacky world. But the whole thing is just it's it, it it's a it's a loose kind of what we would call nonsense in a, in a way. There mm -hmm. has to be something to latch on to, I think, is probably the the best broad answer that I can give off the top well, of my yeah, head. It, I think in all the absurdist comedies, they still start grounded almost always to give us a uh, canvas before they start making things insane. Yeah, you know, Rick and Morty has Rick and Morty who are point of view characters that we can understand the perspectives of. Yeah, it's yes. Xavier wants something like, hey, look at this. He goes to look, a place. He talks it's to a not, person. you know, a floompy gun interacting with a, a wet cr crumbo. Mm -hmm. I know what Even a wet something crumbo like is. the Holy Mountain. Even something like the Holy Mountain starts off a lot more grounded than it eventually gets to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess why not? Let's let us. Who is next in the in the randomizer? It was Fringy. Uh, 
Sorry, sorry, just to add to that, the um, uh, regarding comprehensibility, the Lovecraftian approach to horror is an interesting thing to bring to that because uh, I think p part of the reason that horror works is because there's a layer of incomprehensibility on it where you the the monster or whatever the threat is doesn't really fit within the bounds of logic you don't really know what the characters are up against yeah and uh the as i think the the thing that always must be comprehensible is like what the main character is going through and the but, experience like, of the people in the story is like your latching on point yeah, not necessarily all the things the main character is like seeing and reacting to, but you have to just understand where they're at all the time, at, at the very least. Because yeah, no, there, there's some things that. where, like we were talking about, incomprehensibility is kind of the point. Well, I think like, what what, alien strength was back in the day <laughs> before it got ruined. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> when it bursts out of um, his chest, I think it, all the characters are horrified by the blood and guts, but also just the the scenario this yeah this creature just burst out of his rib cage like what in the fuck um yeah and sometimes that works it. horror fucks this up all the time because they pl they show too many other cards and like they'll show the big dumb cgi alien with like a stinger sound and say oh my god fuck off mm -hmm. like i wish you would just like use the, the power of the audience's imagination here to kind of enhance the horror rather than just like show me yeah, like, I wish What's... you earned that reveal that we've been waiting for. Yeah. yeah. Instead we'll just of... just rely on the fact that is. fear of the unknown is incredibly powerful and effective. Well, and so on, yeah. like, unexplained is not the same as incomprehensible. Exactly. Like, true. Yes. That's true, yes. Uh, it makes me think of um, near the end of Alien, where Ripley spots it, like, hiding in... Uh, among like pipes and different like storage things and you can't even quite make out where it what it is if you know what i mean because it's covered in what looks to be similar things to its own body um yeah right so I, i'd go as far as saying i guess that it skirts the line at that point between unexplained and incomprehensible because at that point you're just like terrified of whatever this fucking thing is and what it might be able to do um yeah, I agree with that. I th I think with the thing with Lovecraftian horror is that you can't quite explain it, even if you tried. Yeah, it relies on a very. It, I guess the whole it relies on you not knowing what it is you're supposed to be afraid of, in a sense, which is an mm -hmm. which is an odd place to be in when you're trying to communicate things to an audience as a storyteller. It's almost at odds with the whole point. Yeah. Well, let us move to the next person. Someone said, like, what's the point in randomizing it if you're asking everyone the same question? I was like, because I don't know what order to ask everybody. <laughs> no, like we're not really asking reason. everybody the same questions. Well, te yeah, technically we asked the same first question, but it always is, is branching off. Well, I like how much we've branched off so far. It's neat. The, the, the value as well, dear Chatter, in, in the random order is that by listening to other people go first, that's making me think about yeah. my, yeah, um, it's, it's, my this question. Is great. Bastard. I, uh, in which I, case, I am wondering now. Yeah. Bringy, what is the most important element of storytelling? Um, I think that the most essential element of storytelling is character. I think the character is, is sort of like at the heart of storytelling. Um, so much so that I think even if you were to have a story without a character, you could even go so far as to say that, like, the POV of the narrator or even the POV of you factors into it. But, I mean, in a general sense, I think that what we want and get out of storytelling is facilitated principally through seeing characters in a situation and how they react to it and how they grow or potentially don't grow from the experience. But, like, at the core of pretty much like all great stories is strong characters um mm -hmm. i it, in a in a i guess uh like if you were to boil it down to its basics it's like people reacting to situations or other people is essentially what a story uh is about if we are to say that a story at its most base element is cause and effect a causes b causes c causes d um but I, I think that the, the, the investment and the reason why we're interested and the reason why we get something out of it is to see 
people react to those situations and not not necessarily people right it because of course you could be like robots or aliens or um animals um but i think it is ultimately person with traits how do they respond to this situation or how do they respond to that situation uh how do they respond to situations that are challenging for them how do they respond to situations that are easy for them uh, how do they respond when uh, somebody else uh, who they like or dislike is challenged or has something happen to them? Um, it's like that exploration of reactions to things and how that changes us or the characters rather is like what it's kind of like what I'm there for. Um, that transformative element of like how characters change across time, what they learn. Yeah, you, know, you can absorb a lot of value from that. I I think that's that's what uh, that's like what that's kind of what we're there for. Yeah, can a story exist without characters? That was uh, gonna be my yeah. question. Like yeah. Koya, Koya Quantic or uh, whatever. I I guess the, I guess the thing is is like, if there is a story with no characters, um, does does the the narration POV? I think it does. Because uh, the narrative is going to be giving perspective on stuff that happens like, almost if, inherently by the yeah, like choice we, of words, if, even. That that was kind of where I was getting at is like, is there is there character in prose? Is there character in shot composition? Uh is there character in sound? Like what 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 get why are we is the decision to focus on something? Does that is that indicative of, of perspective in a certain sense? Like, why are we yes. seeing this story? So, but also, like, what 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 even story can you have without any any like entity to perceive it? So, like, I, I guess well, like I a like rock that's... falling off a cliff and landing with another rock. I think that's I think well, that's kind that's... of where I would I I would get at. I guess is that like story is the reason why story means anything is because of perspective. Um, if if there were no people, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be stories. There'd just be things happening. You yeah, could, you could have like a be. I don't know. You could have what if 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 every mind in the universe disappeared, <laughs> would books still be stories? Well, I would, guess would I Harry guess Potter I mean still is, be a um, story without people and meanings to interpret from it? It would just be ink on a page. It's like the perspective is what gives it um, the meaning in, as a story. Well, you could have like a, a non-narrative audiovisual experience, like uh, Oyan Iskatsi, but I, I don't think I would call it a story. Um, what about, I mean, it's like you're, you're experiencing something. But. If I were describing the events of World War II in like a really clinical fashion and mainly just nations, not even really mentioning any individuals, like where they moved, what damage they sustained and stuff, uh, I'm assuming that would be considered a story. And then at that point, the character at best, I suppose, as you've said, would be the narrator. Or the, uh, well, I the, guess, uh, or maybe the nations I, themselves. Well, the, I guess well, the characters, characters could be, can like, be... The coll like a collective of nations, right? Yeah, like like um, like Inglorious Bastards. Is, more basic. In, just, Inglorious Bastards. About a, you go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, Inglorious Bastards. I think is a good example of where the actual bastards themselves don't have much individual character that's distinct from one another. They sort of exist as a collective. Hmm. Uh, like there's there there are unique things about the individual members, but the the traits of the group itself are shared by almost everyone, and it's way more important than any individual. So yeah, like can, characters yeah, can like, be groups. Can, can, it, it, that's yeah yeah in some cases um characterizations are elements of world building so every single character that exists in a story will have certain qualities right and that, that that's sort of what defines like the world building of a woody allen movie for example or like the things that are true about every character in that film that aren't necessarily going to be true about other stories so yeah characters doesn't have to be like one individual well, say, person even with nations you could actually get to the point of progressing to the story and everyone starts to feel like particular countries are underdogs one of them is super aggressive one of them yeah. is greedy like well, and the idea yeah of, like what is the character of a location you know like new york has a character that uh that you can pull from it as a location or like mm. a quiet town you is know, that like, just the same like word, or does it? If, if you're talking about nations it... in a war, you have entities with clear motivations there, and I think it's perfectly valid to call those characters. We, yeah, because yeah, like it's a an character, entity, a character, like having basically. an agent with a mind is different of a character in a way that you could say, oh, this building has a lot of character to it. 
Well, it depends how fundamental do we want to go. I mean, you as an individual are comprised of billions of living cells and there are organisms within you, but like we don't really think about those little entities when we think about the whole that is you. Could you just extrapolate that more to like the whole that is a city or a nation? Yeah. Or a specific um, group I don't I I think a mind is distinctive enough from a from a building or something constructed that isn't an agent to make a very well, clear difference. I guess what I mean is like when we talk about the consciousness of an individual versus i guess like what you pull from a collective like a, a town right like a I, I guess the reason why i would be i would say that it, it depends on how vaguely we wanted to find character but i mean you could say that like south park that the town of south park has a character it's this weird absurd oh. town filled with neurotic crazy people and a I small think... group of like uh kids who are much more observant and perceptive of the world and so it's often the interactions of like the core kids. So Stan, Kyle, Cartman and Kenny, who will all have their own distinct personalities, often having to interact with the town, like the character of the town. Um, and so I, I have a, got... sorry. Yeah, go for it. Oh, go so it. I think I have a, a clear example of a, a story that some of the people in this call know that doesn't have any characters in the conventional sense. And that is, um, it's not, it's not really a rigid story, but Stellaris. Um, yeah, Stellaris. Play that, yeah. yeah, it's um, the the closest thing we have to characters. Like sometimes we get told that like a person did a thing. They're not characters in in the sense you know that they're, they're treated more like events more so than anything. You don't get their perspective or what they're like as people um, most guess, of the time. Well, one of the I'm factions is technically one character. That's true. Uh, cl cloned. <laughs> I guess now I'm start. I'm I'm starting. I'm wondering if like. This is why I like this conversation. I'm wondering if character <laughs> is describing what I mean, or if it's more so just fundamentally perspective. That like that like it it becomes a story through perspective. I I, um, I think it's well. Character. How would you like define to... story? Uh, well, I I guess that's the thing. When we were talking about this, when I because if we talk about like the most inextricable element from storytelling, it is a sequence of events. Like it is A then B. It's not A. Like there's it seems like some some kind of progression of some sort is like fundamental the once you pull it from that like if this if if i just say bob like is that a story versus bob walked to the store it's like that that becomes a story by virtue of he did something that was like a and then b but i mean if you just say bob well, there is a story i mean incredibly I, loosely I there I'm is a story be, implied yeah. by like bob oh that's someone's name someone must have been named bob right well there if, is a sequence to be of a little you can infer to be a little pedantic, Bob going to the store isn't a story. You telling me that Bob went to the store is a story. Because Great I would story, say that that's, that's, would, that's, that's the reason why I'm starting to lean more towards perspective. Because right? a like story, the, I would say, is an account of events, not the events themselves, in the same way that a, a map is uh, different yes. than the place. Well, I, I think that was what I was getting at, right? Like, if there were no human beings, there would be a universe that has cause and effect going on, where things happen. But it's like, but no stories would be told because no well, one's telling they them. They wouldn't. I guess they wouldn't be described as stories anymore because there is no there is no entity or perspective um, to to interpret it. And I guess it's like when we think about stories in the conventional sense, we are thinking about people in a situation reacting to things. It's like their worldview, their values are uh, the perspective that they are bringing to the story and to see those perspectives challenged. Um, that's like, that's like what we're there for. And so like, when we think about great stories, we're usually thinking about stories where people are put in difficult situations or, I mean, um, the Suicide Squad is a really strong example, right? It's a story with a pretty nonsense plot, but the characters are all reacting in yeah. ways that make sense given what we know about them. I think um, I want to as well to, to enhance your point about it being about perspective is that I think um, that you totally can have um, like if I said if I told you a story about um, some like beautiful natural formation that then uh, stood for like a million years like a geology just, textbook like, like well yeah, I suppose so um, it's this beautiful natural thing that stood for a million years and then it was just um, destroyed uh, you know, out of the blue, random avalanche came down, just freak chance, wasn't likely to happen, but it did, and it was destroyed. And it's like, it there's stuff that you can take avalanche? from that story, but you can only take stuff from that story because you have the perspective. Like, this is an old thing. Like, without, without beautiful, 
uh, in that story. I feel like you've not really got much that you can take from it. It's like, oh, a thing. You, oh, it thing was broke. there, and now it's not okay. anymore. Okay. So yeah. That's yeah, an account like, of Scarlett Johansson events. causing the avalanche. Um, well, so yeah, Jay, you're saying like, so if, if we had instead described series of rocks have been moving around in different positions and some have fallen as a result of wearing up and tearing of, of air and water damage or something like that, that isn't a story until I start adding stuff like the beautiful rocks were destroyed by a... Uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, you can call it a story if you want, but it's like, I don't see the value in it until that you, and, or the potential value in it until you start adding someone's well, perspective surely. on the events. Well, what if humans what if can do a have... lot of interpreting, right? Like, I suppose. Well, I, I was, here's something to add to that. We, we, let's give the rock a name. You know, like right. if we tell, we, tell the, we tell the story, like a rock, you know, a rock got I mean, eroded versus a rock, is almost a rock called, you could say, Dwayne that, Johnson. I, I guess. <laughs> So, I guess, sorry. <laughs> to make, yeah, to make the point clear, Dwayne Johnson is, the, is a rock, and the rock got <laughs> eroded by the water. Like, it feels like people are going to immediately personify the rock because it has a name. Um, so, it's kind of a related subject that uh, probably gives my perspective on this. So, my definition of art is the intentional communication of the unspeakable. So, there's two important things there. One, it has to be intentional, right? So I wouldn't consider okay. a tree art, but if you take a picture of a tree, that's art, right? Because you made choices about how you're going to take the picture. And you know, there's if you take a professional system. photographer, there there's going to be something about the way they take the picture that's going to be way more meaningful than how an idiot like me would take it. You know, I don't have any idea how to properly take a picture of a tree to communicate things, right? And then beyond that, there needs to be something that you're communicating that isn't straightforward, right? So like Bob crosses the street. Um, I mean, I, I don't even know if I would call it. You know, it's just it's just relaying some very very straightforward information with nothing left out. But if I'm trying to evoke an emotion in you, I couldn't just well, say you need to feel is, anger, right? It could, it's could like you say that it's been left out that I haven't said why he went to the shops, that we don't know why he went to the shops or how far it was to get to the shops or what time of day it is. I mean, there's tons there's of things of that there's tons of things that could happen. It's just you need to be communicating something, in my, at least in my opinion, that isn't you know just a, a base uh, level relaying of information. Well, there, I, I guess some, I mean, some element the of the experience. Part, I, I'm fine with the necessity of an agent. But I like so if someone just drew a square on the wall, that isn't art because it's too basic. Or I mean, it, it is it is it communicating something? Okay, when you say depends uh, on the okay. context and the meaning of the square, right? That, 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 that's what I was going to say. So, it, it, is there something about it that isn't relayed by saying there's a picture of a square on a wall? Like, if the answer to that question is yes, then it's art. That, that's my would, answer. Is it? Would it be possible to not have it that way? Can well, I? Uh, is it even possible well, for I someone, mean, for an agent, to draw a square and have it not be art? Then. Well, I, I guess here's one. Like, I mean, an architectural, like a floor plan that is entirely technical and exactly precise in a way that you look at it and you know exactly what it's like. I, I feel like I'd still call that art, right? There is an artistry to the creation of that uh, that plan. I'll tell you that as a child, I made one of those for fun. So, yeah, I, I guess that's what I was a really fun that. child. I had lots of friends. <laughs> I, think, no, I think I think like stuff that is matter of fact can still be art. Like I, I don't know that. Um, I, I guess I would agree with Rags. I agree with the first definition that like art is is like defined by the fact that it's like an agent exerting something on the world. But uh, I'm not sure that I think stuff can be spoken and still be art that is communicated. I feel like. But I feel like you're on the right track to something. I just think that there's right. it's more fundamental, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Do we say part of it was that they intend meaning to be drawn from the thing? Uh, just the, yeah, it's like it's created for an audience. Like the, the, you're oh, you're trying you're creating oh, something with the purpose with of evoking one. a reaction. I don't agree with that, I I don't agree with that one either. I feel like we can have art if there's one human being in a room and he's the only human being in, in existence. Like if he drew uh, a. a box like even if he is the only person who will ever see it it would still count as well, would he count as the audience then he point? would be the audience um um so i guess at that point it would be that so it, it is even... created it is what created i was going to say is i think a person can something. accidentally create art though um uh, well I, I, I guess the idea would be that um that when we mm -hmm. talk about intentionality it's not like the intentionality to create art but like that there is that there is an agent who made a decision to do something 
right? Like it's so, uh, like it has to be made by somebody. Maybe is like the more well, fundamental. Just so, so I, 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 I'm, just, I just want to just to be clear, right? So like someone's just doing a fucking some kind of job where they're clearing paint off the walls or something, and stripping it, stripping it all, and then they they look, they take a few steps back and they go, oh shit, and they've accidentally painted like the Mona Lisa by doing it. I would just be curious what it would be classify that as. I would, would you draw that any that I, think, I think that it, it becomes art the, the second that they decide to um, that they decide to um, note it as something unusual or, or, or worthy of being well, seen, right? If that's the case, then would it I be art if I saw a nice part. looking... Wait, Rags, what are you... What's up? Yeah, wait, hold on, because, yeah, I was about to say, if I go outside yeah. and see a nice looking tree, well, and yeah, I just so notice that, let's, let's does go that back. make that become art? I think, I th I think maybe Let's go back does. just a little bit. Um, so to the wall thing, um, cause I, I'm going to hold fast to the, an agent being required. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I sit on whether it's intentional or not, but I think the question here will be in this example of the wall and the paint and in, there was an intention to do something, thus their scraping of the paint and whatnot. Does the intention require that they were attempting to express themselves or can the expression of their work, maybe not their personality, but just by them doing work, that is sort of an expression of yourself in some way. Does the intentionality come from trying to express yourself or trying to just do the thing and incidentally something that is artistic emerged from that? I feel like that there has to be incidental art, that that just has to be something that exists. Um, but like it, I, I feel like that's that has to happen, right? Where you can do something inadvertently that creates something that appeals to you aesthetically. Well, let me ask so, this. Then... then, so moving to let let's take the let's take that example, which is very very hands on, and let's change it to something where there's a little bit more of a removal between the quote unquote art and artist. Um, somebody, let's take this construction worker, and he accidentally bumps into a bag of gravel and it spills out on the ground and it creates um, a, a picture of a human face, right? Logically possible, just unlikely, and mm -hmm. now it has occurred. Um, is that art? I mean, that's what I was asking too, because I'm not sure what I think yet. <laughs> I think that, I I think so, that in so, the loosest on. possible sense, that the act of um, that in itself is an art, but the act of noticing it and framing it as something special, that becomes uh, art in a very loose sense. So w when I was thinking about this a lot, this is years ago, literal decade ago, um, I asked a lot of people the question, is a tree art? And my experience was that there was a 100% correlation between whether someone believed in a material creator deity and whether they said yes. Basically, I anybody who doesn't believe that there's like, that the tree was created size. by God to be... Like twenty or thirty, enough people to where it's non-trivial. So, like, if if someone thinks the tree was created by God to be beautiful, they'll usually say it's art, and or in my case, they all said it's art. And if someone doesn't believe that it was created that way, nobody would say it's art, right? So, yeah. like, does anyone disagree with that? Like, do you do you think that a tree is art just because it's beautiful? No, no. no. I think that um, what you can say is, let's say um, some let's say some person comes and finds like a beautiful tree standing somewhere, right? And they say, they say to someone else, hey, come over here and look at this beautiful tree. I think that in the act of doing that is in a way art. Yeah, yeah. I feel, so that, that, I feel a bit pretentious, but that's what I think. Well, no, so that, that's, that's the, that's the, well, that's the so picture of a tree example. We right are now. dealing with a horrifically broad term. That's why it's yeah. tough. Well, that's, yeah. That's the difficult yeah, and part like, with art, yeah. Can you define, like, so, yeah, your, your definition of art is what again? The, the, the intentional communication of the unspeakable and and the what purpose is the of this is the unspeakable means that there's something that's being communicated that isn't like there's a reason you have to create art to express it you can't just say it so like if Do i draw you feel like um whoa uh, can i not sorry actually i uh, uh finish finish what you were saying first um so so like if so like my example is if i just go take a shitty picture of a tree there's probably nothing there that I that you don't get by just saying it's a shitty picture of a tree. But if you were to find it like a professional mm -hmm. photographer who did who, you know, went out of their way to try and create something beautiful, there would be something there. You can't just say it's a picture of a tree. You need to look at it. Right. And it, it like if I'm evoking an emotion in you, I can't just say you feel anger. That has to be evoked by creating a stimulus that would 
you know, arise anger within you. And, and you can't just say, oh, you know, um, it makes you feel angry. That, that wouldn't communicate the same experience. You have to actually go look at the art. Like basically there's a reason you have to make it as art. You can't just express it directly. There's something indirect um, that elevates it above other things like me just drawing a square on a wall. Like it's not going to evoke anything in anyone. Um, and you can understand the whole thing by me just saying, I, as an unskilled person, you know, scribbled a stupid square on my wall and there's nothing that's left out, right? But if you had someone I, who's an app, yeah, what, what if it did though? My question, would be, my question would be, can we go more fundamental than that? Because I think, like, I, I, I think, um, if someone like draws a square, in terms of what it is in reality, it is like atoms on atoms in a universe filled with atoms, right? Like, like fundamentally, it's just like. It's it's so well, um, we can take the square it's just example things, but the perspective of an individual who looks at that change like when when we say the unspeakable, is that not like could you just say that it's like fundamentally is is perspective, right? That the the interpretation, like the human perspective on anything as opposed to what it is, which is just things happening. Well, I'm saying that I'm saying that if if I write down a grocery list, this isn't art because there's nothing that's well, there's no I mean, meaning here besides you know I need eggs and could, you know could it not fruit be like whatever a shopping. Imagine a hundred years from now, uh, like if we lived in a post scarcity society, right? And someone looks back on that shopping list and they start thinking about man, he had to like compile a list of you know like could you imagine a hypothetical scenario where like someone sure, will it's, appreciate it's, it's it what as we... art based on differing information. Well, or different I don't people. know that I would use the word art, but it, again, the act of displaying it in a context completely different from the context in which it was created would be part of what made that. You know, it's like a picture of a tree. You know, it, it, it's not just that there's a tree. There, there's a way that it's being displayed and interpreted well, that would give it a meaning beyond, you know, just being a tree. You said or um, just being a shopping list. If I took a shitty picture of a tree, nothing is achieved compared to me saying it's a shitty picture of a tree. But like, what if someone says, like, they look at your picture and they go, oh, and you go, what? And they're like, oh, I get it. It's that's pretty awesome, man. You know, like I have no idea what you're talking about. And they go, well, isn't this about like the nature of shelter and what it means to be? Oh, and you're like, no. And so I'm assuming you're saying the component of your intention has to be there. Uh, I mean, f first of all, we're describing an event that is like preposterously unlikely. I think, but it's not even you, wait, wait, necessarily wait, about pause. my it's not even necessarily about my intention it, you think it's, it's unlikely it, I, that you could take a photo of a pic of, of a tree and that someone could find meaning in it i i think it is unlikely that if i randomly took a picture of a tree with no understanding of photography that you would find any meaningful number of people who would call it art right you can always find someone i don't but, even see you know, how it's relevant let, how many people found it art or not so, I mean, um, that's, it's an intersubjective I, I, thing, so it's pretty relevant. I don't know if this is a tangent, but um, in relation to the the shopping list, someone in chat said that's not art. The shopping list is a primary historical source. Um, if we just have like a historic, if we have something that was like a matter of fact, like document retelling of something, and then we just like jump a hundred years into the, or I don't even know if we need like a time jump, right? Like if I write something down, that what describes if the font reality, that I use expresses my ex personality? Well, so, yeah, that, that was my immediate thing, right? Why did I make the decisions to put this information here? Why didn't I include every single piece of information, like the movements of the ants on the floor? Like, doesn't... Like, sure, surely an interpretation... I mean, is it is, is it as fundamental as just, like, an interpretation of, like, something, anything at all? Um, I guess the problem is that how do we factor in, like, if, would that make a tree art just by virtue of it existing and me noticing it? I mean, so the, the purpose of the definition isn't necessarily to try and we might have slightly different goals. My purpose in this definition is to give direction to artists and art analysis. So it's like, well, what would separate great films from good films, from bad films, from terrible films, right? It's like, well, you know, it's what is trying to be communicated and the methods of communication and, and like the uh, how successful it was, right? Mm -hmm. it, it gives you direction there. If you're sitting down to write a story, um, I can at least say from my perspective, my definition gives me a, an incredible amount of direction, right? It's like, well, what am I doing? Well, first of all, I need to be intentionally communicating. Like, it, it, I, I don't want to rely on just randomly scraping the wall with a paintbrush and, you know, something falling out. It's like, I, you know, 
I, I, I want to be doing something purposeful. And beyond that, I want to be trying to communicate something that isn't straightforward, something that would require art, right? Something that you would need art to express. Um, not like a grocery list, right? More like a story that, you know, evokes emotions and, and, and themes and all, all sorts of things in the audience's mind and suspense and all these other things, right? So the definition gives uh, direction both for analysis and for actually creating art. I mean, that, that's, that's what the purpose is for me. And it's like, you can sort of poke at the edges of it and be, try and find, oh, well, maybe there's some things that don't fall under. I mean, I personally don't agree, right? Like I, I, I think maybe the act of displaying an accidental paint scraping could be artistic, but just random. I don't, I don't think like scraping paint off a wall is art. I don't think just a tree is art. Right. And it, it, and it is true I that if you, I mean, there's, there's examples of people who create art in isolation for only themselves. I'm um, much more willing to dude. follow those first two than I am. You're taking a picture of a, of a tree. You're as far as you're concerned, it's like, meh, it's no sure, different it, than me saying it. Like, I find that strange. Well, I mean, okay, you could say that it's shitty art. <laughs> I guess. Sure. Well, it, I mean, like, uh, yeah, because there, there, like, there is, there is, there, there is something there, right? But there's well, just well, no by crack. your own definition, right? You would have taken that picture. You would have moved into a position. You would have decided what stays in the frame and what doesn't. Yeah, that's part. Sure, I would say so that's part of the craft. I, I think. I think. Uh, I guess to to clarify, like, I'm not. I think. I think this particular conversation right now, I'm not trying to figure out like what makes for good or bad. I guess I'm trying to figure out what the fundamental Does it qualify? is. Because like when. It, when it comes to the craft of storytelling, for instance, like I don't think that you can just like pound your keyboard and just have a bunch of like letters on the page. It's like this is writing, this is a story. Like it's you know like when we think about storytelling, it's like we try to go more fundamental, right? A sequence of events accounted for. You know, there is perspective, there are characters and, and theme and world. I guess, and and so like in that sense, I would agree with the idea that like some kind of working definition or adding things on to try and help you, guide you in a direction is valuable. But like right now, I'm trying to figure out if a tree is art. Like that's, that's well, um, what I'm trying to figure out right I'll now. I'll try and keep an eye out for hyper relevant super no. chats. But someone's just asked, like, what about when animals commit to making images, and especially ones that don't even understand what they're doing necessarily? Like when an orangutan gets handed a stick and a, a knife, and he starts carving it into like a little, like a different looking stick, right? Surely. Oh. The, well, uh, the I mean, fish that, become... that, that, that make elaborate displays to attract a mate with their nests, but it's entirely for like some practical utility. Yeah, you know, yeah. To, like, I, I, yeah, I would, I would actually thinking how much do they want to fuck. Well, yeah, I, I like designing a car for efficiency, to... but then it's like, well, yeah, but, but hey, it's also what if somebody incredible decides, to look at. What if, what if somebody I, decides I would tend to... to become an artist just to fuck, right? Like, is, is that any more valuable? Yeah, don't the don't denigrate my screenplays. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but no, like, I, I would actually tend towards maybe it is, right? I mean, like, we can't fully understand the, the cognitive experience of an animal, right? I have a dog. I'm around him all the time. I don't I don't know or want to know what's going on in that dude's head. Um, but I mean, you. it's it's com <laughs> it's completely <laughs> it's completely possible that. Um, I mean, there is something there, right? I mean, it, it could be that, you know, Maybe. an elephant scribbling paint on a thing, um, it, it means more to them than just a, a random thing that they did, right? There could well, be I mean, we can pretty clearly well, say that it does. I guess that's the thing, though. Let's, we can go basic it... to the, like an ant. Like, is an ant colony, uh, is that art? Would you count an ant as an agent? Would you say that this is, this, uh, this act warrants us saying that this is a an expression of any part of their being in any way i i don't know that i would consider an ant an agent and i don't know that there is an that there's any function of the ant colony aside from a pragmatic purpose but would you like, consider a dog an agent uh sure well why a dog and not an ant i mean the, the much I'm more also complicated fine with yeah, I, I'm also fine with saying that a dog is much more likely to be an agent than an ant is. Um, I guess, because there I guess is... this depends at this point, like, how pedantic we want to get. Because you could say that, like, was it called, like, uh, like I don't know, like, plankton or cy cyanoplankton or whatever it's called, like, or just bacteria. These are things that are alive in the same way that we're alive. I guess just, is it, like, consciousness? Is, is that what we we're can... going for? I think it's more than just consciousness. <laughs> well, define consciousness um, at that point. We're gonna have to start right, yeah, rolling exactly, back. Yeah. We've gone way too far. Well, I think we can. <laughs> I, I think we can all agree, though. Yeah, yeah I, I think we can all agree, though, that like a, a human being is definitely an agent, and a a, a single cell bacteria is not an agent. Yeah, and there's a whole there's a whole world in there where you could spend all your life and never get the answers. So yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm fine with. I'm comfortable just saying people yes, dog maybe and no. 
I'm not comfortable <laughs> saying Ant no. <laughs> I'm com- yeah, I, I'm fairly comfortable saying Ant no, but I, I do think that there is a point of complexity where uh, a, a sufficiently advanced brain becomes an agent. Uh, but that's obviously getting into a different. But I mean, again, if we talked about how like a town can have a character, can an ant colony, the combined efforts of well, thousands of of individuals, certainly when David Attenborough fucking something commentates. Well, exactly. Like, but that's exactly. David. But is that David Attenborough's character, or is that? No, I'm talking the, about like, if you'll be like their desperation to reach the the pond in time, they'll have to defend their queen. You know, just stuff like that. Yeah. Where, yeah. I, well, I would say that that is his storytelling. You know. I mean, he's like definitely it. a storyteller. He's giving us uh, yeah, the David, character. David Attenborough. David Attenborough yes. could film someone taking a shit and then playing the Binding of Isaac and make it fucking compelling. So absolutely, I mean, basically anything, right? Yeah. I would say the difference between like a town having character and us as characters is, it's almost like the, it's an agreed upon general attribute that a thing has instead of a thing itself because of what it does. I mean, could you say about an ant colony generally agreed upon attributes of like the ant colony? Well, we could, in the sense of that this ant colony has a certain character to it, right, is different than the ant colony is a character because it's it's not even alive. It isn't an agent. However, based off of generally agreed upon aspects and attributes of that ant colony's construction, generally it is agreed upon that it has a certain like I said, attributes that we could say, which which we call something having character. We use that word to describe generally agreed upon attributes. Yeah. But those but things are commented on by POV outside though, sources. Right. And, yes. Yeah, like it has to be, because you could say the same thing about like a galaxy, right? It's like billions and billions and billions of individual like pieces, like stars, planets, nebulae, um, like all sorts. And then you could boil it down even more, right? So like atoms and, and different... Um, different uh elements and stuff but like ultimately like what gives that meaning is again like a human perspective the milky way galaxy exists because we have defined a galaxy as this but like that's because of us otherwise it would just exist as this thing it doesn't really have a story without us to put in meaning into it so you could say the same thing about i guess like the hypothetical story of the ant colony that has no characters other than the ants in the colony itself or even not describing the ants but just the colony but it's like the POV of the narrator and then the POV of you is like what gives it form. Which brings us neatly back to characters. The I was actually going to say, we're still on point, technically. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. This has all been about what even it makes for a character um, that yes. to then lead into what I do. Which, I don't know, if everyone's happy, we could then move into the next contestant. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um... This makes me think of that scene in American Beauty where the bag's blown around in the wind and then the, mm-hmm. the guy films it on tape and shows the girl and it, show, it has that music playing over top it. Um, but like, I wonder like if was it art before it was put on film is like, is the medium a necessary component of it? Or did that guy find art in that bag blowing around just I, in the fact that it was there and it looked so elegant to him. I think yes. That's a good And point. the reason that I would say yes is because if art is an, an expression, you know, if you have this, is an agent expressing some aspect of their being, then it necessarily requires a medium. Hmm. Well, what because happens that, if I uh, like if yeah, I, I if I'm making a film and then I commission an artist to do like a poster that's going to be in my film? And then the poster ends up in the film and it's like a really important part of the film. Did it, I, it became art as soon as it became the poster and then it became a different type of art when it became contextualized within the film? Yeah, I, yeah. Mean, I, I would say so. Yeah, because you could have that poster figure, yes, and that poster. But... Yeah, yeah. That it could be the poster could be on the wall. You could take a picture of a poster and get an extra layer of an image. You could film it as you threw it through the air. You could fold it up into a cool hat. That you wear at parties, and it, it that same I want physical cool thing. hat rags. Give it to me. Mm, someone, um, someone, I am not a someone. purveyor of hats. I cannot oh. help you in this endeavor. My hats are someone, made only for myself. Someone in chat has said something that has made me think. They said, "What about stage plays?" Now, what 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 happens when we talk about art that is like non permanent, like uh, like a stage play that is performed in front of no cameras, and then after it happens, the script gets burned, all, and all the people, well, all, all, you know, like all mediums non-permanent. are non permanent. Oh, yeah, right. I guess if we go big enough. 
I mean, that was usually screenplay is like, I think it's fair to draw a distinction. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, performative? Like, something that's performative? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe if we I'm could... Fine, um, well, yeah. I, I'm assuming we all agree, on, like, the act of acting is a form of art, right? It's an expression, It yeah. has to be, yeah. You are, so therefore, you are expressing yourself through the medium of your body's locomotion, and yeah. that is that art. It's like, yeah, I, you know, we could ask a lot of questions about where we draw lines on all of that for definitions as well. I just don't know if you mm. want to go down that road. Skull Godot's acting art. It, no, mm. that is a war crime. <laughs> That's a war crime. <laughs> However, to be clear, it isn't a war crime in the first Wonder Woman because it's not a war crime the first time. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, guess... I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, like, I find all the takes here really interesting, but I'm not sure I agree with the consensus here. I, I, I I'm not. Which one? Really? Well, Which I'm one? not. I don't. <laughs> yeah, is there a consensus? I don't. I don't, I don't everyone disagreed with me. Well, I, I see some overlap here between all of you, where you like you think art uh, needs uh, either an artist or a medium or both, and I don't really think it needs either necessarily i mean it can and a lot of it does obviously but i think people can find art in anything isn't then isn't you know, then like, the art i the think that is the art, well so the problem with that is if it comes a word that's meaningless is art is everything yeah right? yeah but, i think that might be a different i think you might be using the word art but referring to a different concept I, well, that almost sounds like people can people can find me. people can find meaning in anything but yeah if art is just anything then i mean like Technically speaking, it has no meaning, right? Because the signified is everything. So the signifier the way, doesn't have a purpose. The way I think of art is if it moves somebody. That's my fu my fundamental definition of something. Like we, we're talking about trees, for instance. Like if, if like you're saying, just looking at a, a picture of a tree is art, but just looking at a tree isn't art. But I can personally can look at a tree and find art in uh like say for instance it's like bursting out of like the cement or something or there's some kind of like well, for sure um but, mechanical but I, I think, thing I that nature is, is kind of forging its way out through and you can take that as a statement on the resilience and well, like brute force of you, yeah nature I, itself. I think i think i've been using beautiful rotation rather than the say, thing could, happening itself say, uh, yeah could you your, say your explanation your of that is, is the art, art. yeah Okay, I, I, because it sounds or, like you're, I, I, you've replaced meaning with art. Like you, wherever you find meaning, you're looking at art automatically. Right. Like whatever, whatever you can impart. Because yeah, I think that's an interesting one, right? Is like the story that you've told about the tree, like that, which that is you, like the agent, the art, and the right? medium of it's, your language. You you pulled it from something that you didn't create, but like you created the interpretation of it. And like by virtue of creating that interpretation, that is that has like become the art. Yeah, because like, I don't mm -hmm. think any of us here. Are, well, maybe other than Duma, but I don't think any of us here are too definitive on the definition of art. As you can no, see, we're I, all I, still I, kind I, of figuring I, out the yeah. ifs, ands, and buts. I'm pretty you know? sure. Set. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty. Not, I'm, I'm not. I'm pretty set on the broad I, concept yeah. of um, uh, agent and expression as the two uh, necessary components. Of course, that's subject yeah, to change, I but I'm, I'm pretty. Know. I'm pretty solid with that one. Well, I'm not sure, but I'm also not bothered by that. I like the idea that I keep thinking about it every once in a while. It's not really changing much of anything about my day to day. You know, not having a definitive yeah, definition no, of art. Yeah. Well, because um, often I'm, you don't get challenged to this level, right? Like it's rare that you're going yeah, to. Yeah, I find it fun to talk about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You see something that's I was like, oh, this painting of a dot has been sold for billions of dollars. I was like, <laughs> art? What? Why? You, huh? Like the toilet. <laughs> You, you guys can clip that. Mahler calls himself a film critic, but he doesn't even know what art is. <laughs> True. <laughs> I think if you ask 20 film critics what art was, you might get 10, Well, look at what's happened answers. today. <laughs> I think yeah. you get 20 different answers. Well, it's because art and is just one of those... In and of itself. It's so it's broad, subjective. and everyone mm -hmm. thinks of it in their own way, so you don't have to explain yourself, because everybody... No, no one criticizes or pokes apart someone else's definition when everyone works off of this broad, ambiguous kind of concept that in each one of their individual minds is overlapping enough with everybody else's broad and ambiguous definition that it doesn't matter. That's a, that's a great yeah. way to start an argument is to define something. <laughs> no, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we may not, we I mean, may not all be able to like agree on what art is, but we can all agree. But I, we can agree that I'm right. Spot, so, so it makes it better. True. I, I would say, though, that I don't think art requires an observer. Yeah. I don't I think don't it know. I don't know. 
I don't I, think I disagree it, with that, but this is I a long conversation. I just, <laughs> to, to, to me, to me, that's the key. Honestly, is somebody observing it and like being a, moved by it. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's just the thing of if we all cease to exist, is there art anymore? I, I don't know. I don't mm. know if like the the <laughs> Mona Lisa yes. or like I ain't committing either know way. <laughs> I I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not sure. This I would say yes answer. because it adheres to the fact that there was an artist who expressed themselves in a medium and that makes it art and whether or not anyone knows about it, whether or not minds even exist to perceive it. Um, I, I still don't think that takes away from what it is. Well, so yeah, cause the thing that's making me wonder is like, I don't know, like a human makes a painting and then he just disappears immediately. And then like a billion years later, another agent comes to be and then finds the painting and is able to interpret it. It's like, so was it art? And then it wasn't art. And then it became art again, as soon as he existed. Like this, yeah. When the last art, mind in the it, cosmos mm, dies, is it, it did all art suddenly disappear? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and if you're um, talking in terms of just a practical sense of like, okay, is it art if no one's there to observe it? At that point, it doesn't fucking matter what it is. No one's there. <laughs> yeah, point, it's a bit like the a tree falls in the woods kind of thing. Yeah, like if, exactly. If, well, I would so say that the tree falls in the woods. If that does, does make, it, make a sound, sound it doesn't fucking yeah. matter. No one's there. Yeah. That's not addressing well, the I, question, Jay. Yeah, and it, it does make a sound, obviously, but... Uh, um, yeah, I, just, what that question is really asking you is, define sound. Pretty much, yeah. We have one of those, yeah. yeah. Mm. Sound exists um, uh, independent of minds and observers, so we would know that the tree would make a sound. Well, I color suppose... Doesn't. What you're asking someone if they think that the word sound to them means the, the perception of sound in the human brain or the vibration of uh, whatever medium it's carrying through. Well, yeah, it is hearing. But I mean, the question, the answer to this question might uh, change depending on um, languages and dialects that you're asking it in. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, yes, nice. if, if the meanings of all the words we use change, then yes, the sentence would not mean the same. Shut the fuck else. up, Rags. I do, I do agree, <laughs> Jay. You will have no hats from me. Wow. Um, no, take I'm going to take steal your hat. fucking He's hats. a beanie. A beanie's a hat. I do like beanies. Is, met, is metal, like is your headset a hat? How no. big does a headset have to get until it's a hat? How much of the head does it have to cover? Three. Seventy-three percent. All right. So, Metal, what's the most important part of storytelling? No, wait. Yeah, Metal. was going to say something. <laughs> I was just going to say, to tie a ball on it, I still think that character is the most important part of storytelling in a general sense. Okay, now <laughs> Duma can that. ask Metal the question. Yeah, Duma, yeah, Metal. Duma has no power here. I will not <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> Metal, what's the most important part of a story? Uh, I think for me, since we've watched so many bad stuff these past couple of years, uh, uh, it is <laughs> it takes me back. Yeah. It takes me back to well, to speaking of time. tomorrow, I'm Boba Fett back. episode three reaction coming <laughs> no. out. Oh, oh. <laughs> coming out. Oh, I thought oh, okay, I have to watch another bad thing. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I heard that's terrible. It's so bad. It, it is. is. It's, it's the worst. So before. awful. I don't mean to. Go ahead, Mel. <laughs> That's fine. Yes. I'm, I'm used to being fucking interrupted all the time. Shut up, Mel. <laughs> uh, no, it's pretty much consistency, and that counts for storytelling and characters together. Because from from all this all the shitty shit I've seen, so uh, how do I say that properly? So all the shitty shit, yeah. All shitty shit, yeah. <laughs> So if we have a character that can do thing A, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it can do the character can do thing B, and everyone is sitting there like, wait, why can you do that? Like, why is that a thing? Let's talk. Let's take No Way Home for example, when Strange suddenly has a spell to make people forget things. It's like, oh, that's like super useful in everything that's happened before. I guess that's on a greater spectrum though, because we have like a whole universe that already happened but also people can just fight all of a sudden like in bad woman when all of a sudden whichever bad woman it is like oh you you can fight all these people now and you also know how to do all these things and you're also allowed to do all these things it makes like for a really frustrating experience it's just <laughs> interesting to think about because we have so many things now that don't make sense at all continuity-wise for characters and storytelling, but 
I feel like a lot of people don't care about that at all. Yeah. I feel like um, they don't either. Yeah, I, I think we're in an unprecedented era for fucking consistency being thrown out the window. Out of curiosity, though, I'm assuming yeah. you'd want to make caveats like there are times where an inconsistency can be used to give us information, um, such sure. as if Doctor Strange did turn out to be Mephisto, we could then praise the writing because we could be like, there was yeah. plenty of clues that he was out of character because this is not what he would do, that sort of thing. I think we mentioned that a bunch of times in, in the EFAB over it, right? Uh, about it. It's like, oh, if he would have been an evil man, that would have made sense. Would have made sense that he that he would go that way to use that and fuck up the universes, I guess, or dimensions or whatever it was. But in that case, we just we just had Strange doing a really stupid fucking thing and destroying the 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 established character that we have. If um, in Doctor Strange three, not even two. They actually did establish retroactively that he was Mephisto in No Way Home the whole time. Mm -hmm. Does that then fix No Way Home? Or does it fix the wider story, but No Way Home still suffers as an individual story? Because it didn't give you that context. That's an interesting. interesting question. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's I think... a judgment of how much net meta knowledge is allowed to factor in, really, isn't it? Um, because at that yeah. point, I would go down Doctor the road, Strange I... being Mephisto becomes meta knowledge. Uh, so a lot of this, you can, we talk about objectivity a lot. It's possible to be objective and be incorrect, right? While mm -hmm. still working with yes. all of the information that you have at your hands. And I think this is probably uh, in a similar kind of place where if you're working off of all of the information that you could possibly have at any given time and ensuring that all of your biases have been removed sufficiently, um, you can still say with objective commentary that is correct that they're i guess correctly objective instead of objective that is correct um commentary that like dr strange obviously this doesn't work here and then it's not that it retroactively became a different way so much as it is retroactively we discovered information that showed we were not correct in our conclusion but that's why conclusions are always tentative Mm-hmm. Well, I guess like in the in the case of Strange, if we go with what Mala said, I think it still w wouldn't make sense in that context because why would he have stopped the spell at the end? Then? Oh, well, obviously, I'm assuming this is an abstract thing. Like we're pretending hypothetically yeah, just, that it okay. it does I'd, fit. Like all of it, it fits. I, yeah, I just thought about that. Example you just needed to cause some universe flooping and yeah. not all of it. Yeah, like we get, I mean, we get all the can... explanation we need to make it all work. I mean, I guess it's fine. I guess would be awkward for the time. I don't, I don't know how I would see that. I would probably need to think more about it. But what if it all makes about... sense, if it all oh, makes sorry. sense at the end, I, I guess it would be fine. So I was just gonna. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll be... it's like you're on that topic, so continue. So the way I would probably try and do it is the same conclusion I reached when I was doing Dark Souls 2. People were like, if all of these things you say about Scar of the First Sin as a critique of Dark Souls 2 aren't applicable to Dark Souls 2, the base version, then, like, how like, how do you reconcile that? You're saying, like, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and then I just decided, okay, fine, I'm talking about Scar of the First Sin, that's specifically what I'm talking about, and if you you know, are wondering what my opinions are on the base game. It's just like, I don't know if they're applicable or not, because that's not the version I'm playing. In the same vein, I think that being critical of No Way Home as an individual piece remains, but the MCU yes. is a yeah. story that's evolving all the time, and I think you could even, in a valid sense, and this applies to everyone's reviews of everything, basically, like critiquing Snoke and how he fits into the story in TFA, and then someone's like, yeah, but TLJ makes it all make sense. And then you watch that and you're like, oh yeah, it does actually. Like, well, are your criticisms of TFA still valid? And it's like, I think it depends on how many of like the, the payoffs are dependent on your understanding at the time. Um, and I, so I would still say like No Way Home needed to give us uh, more context to have been able to understand that. I think it's still a flaw from No Way Home as it stands on its own that we have to simply believe that the Doctor Strange is a fucking moron. But in the wider context of the MCU, perhaps I would argue uh, once that third Doctor Strange comes out that um, there was ways they made it work and that you just have to have some patience with this wide story that you 
compactly consider all at the same time, which is getting more and more complicated with the TV shows, and I'm not sure how much yeah. um, you can push that before it becomes ridiculous as an idea. I mean, right. A lot of this comes down to your how fervently you adhere to the concept of conclusivity, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which shouldn't be, you know, some things can be more, dare I say, more conclusive than others uh, based on the information that you have. But if everything's tentative and you're working with the best that you've got, then it makes it a lot easier to make statements based on the information that you have. What happens yep. if we take a book that was complete and then we later chop it in half uh, and two separate things and we burn all of the copies of the original book? How do we draw the line in terms of like if the book is utterly incomprehensible in its first half but the second half reconciles everything? Sorry, so we have but one book that's chopped in half. It is one book and we cut it in half as two books and all copies of the first book uh, as, as a sole book are destroyed. So what are you and asking about the first? The just an the first do we know of... it's, it was one book before? Do we know no. the story isn't over? When we There's a difference right? between being incomprehensible and being incomplete, right? Yeah, I mean, I like we have examples of this in history, right? You're like you find a document, but you only find part of it. I mean, you're just being an incomplete historical artifact, I would think. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is... People are saying, dude... Have... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> first <laughs> half is incomprehensible. I guess we're talking about the idea of, you know, you can rely on stuff that comes after to reconcile issues and stuff like that. Let's say that we have a book that was written as one complete book at 600 pages. We chop it into two 300 page books. Uh, part one is incomprehensible. Part two explains everything and it's perfect. Uh, and all copies of the first book are destroyed. They cease to exist and nobody, nobody has access to them anymore. Um, how to, like, does that mean that the first book is terrible and the second book is fantastic and fixes everything, or how do we draw the line? I mean, like, I suppose if, if you erased information from the cosmos, then I don't know what grounds you could have to say that it would not be terrible. I mean, like, in I general, I think it's how consistently how much the intent of the author factors in, you know? Like, you have situations like R plus L equals J, where it started being hinted at like 20 years ago or whatever, and it didn't really get confirmed until like three years ago, right? Yeah. But the reveal is completely consistent with the information that we had. Whereas if you have like a more of a Star Wars situation, it seems like things, if, if the things that are being established in the later work are inconsistent with what was established in the earlier work, then I think you've got a problem. And I do think we should draw a difference between like having mystery boxes in their most positive and pure form of like happy thumbs up and as a revealed like oh cool <laughs> versus you know wait how did they do all of that yeah, it's yeah, like it's well cool. maybe you'll find out some other time and you're like what no i mean how did they all survive that encounter it's like maybe you'll find out in episode three you're like no that yeah if, <laughs> if you essentially treat every issue in a story as it's unfalsifiably bad because of a potential explanation that's just not helpful. Yeah. It turns out if every character, how did this character do that? Well, they could secretly be some mega super mutant from the future with magic powers. It's the same thing as that. Yeah, you actually that, notice people doing that a lot and it gets really frustrating. That's the yeah. extension you can take it to that means basically like the sequel trilogy. We can still contextualize that to make all of it make sense without extra. Yes, trilogy. and then Ray woke up and it was all a dream. That's the easiest way, yeah, to be like, see, yeah, like, now, I, now none of it doesn't make sense. And you're like, right. The correct what, move. What I try to do with film analysis is to look at like what is the most logical thing to happen given the information that we have, not is it conceivable that something could happen given the information well, yeah. we have, because it, that gives you a lot of room to justify like basically anything. I, I it basically it, I gives you infinite uh, room, really. I think yeah, I can, can conceive of a lot. I think it can be complicated, right? It's like when we talk move. about, for instance, contrivance, like. We, I think we would all agree that a contrivance is not as significant as a whole. Like, a, a whole is irreconcilable. I would agree. It, it, yes. It, it, Patrick it Williams function. isn't here. Whereas, yeah, <laughs> yeah what, whatever. I mean, that's and, that's and like, a, definitionally it, true, right? Yeah, and the contrivance is like a stretch, right? So it's like, I can believe that that's possible. Unlikely impossible, but, yeah. Yeah, unlikely. it is likely and then we, possible, but extremely well, guess, unlikely. It's an extreme we coincidence. About, well, and I guess that's the thing, right? When we talk about degrees, right? stories will have contrivance well actually i don't want to say that most stories are going to end up with some level of contrivance because it's like difficult to write a story to get it to the places that you want like that's the challenge of storytelling and like you will get potentially yeah it's always on a it's always like on a spectrum oh, right of, a writer, out, though. 
Um, I think your goal, if your goal as a writer team. is to just create the most logical outcome of pieces that you've set up and you don't have any particular like individual payoffs that you're going you're aiming towards, then I don't think that you're going to have any contrivances at all, really. Uh, yeah, also, yeah, like I, I guess um, when we think about it, it's it's the idea of like how much can you get away with in terms of contrivance and how do we draw that line? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to cool. say that like my um my, my first screenplay is a good example because it's completely consistent and there's no plot contrivances and it's completely realistic. It's also boring, right? <laughs> it's like trying to do something interesting is, yeah, trying to yeah, do something interesting is where you run into we've problems. We've talked about I mean, the, yeah. uh, the accountant story of the accountant who does the books and it's all perfectly Yeah, and we talk about variables, uh, which is often why we just, re yeah. reward stories like, you know, which makes more sense, Lord of the Rings or maybe Office Space. And it's like, well... Probably office space, I guess, but I don't know if that's that fair because Lord of the Rings is dealing with an insane level of variables to maintain and all, timelines yeah, and all species. And when um, you're not relying on the real world as a point of like a story that like Breaking Bad is not going to have as many variables as the Book of Boba Fett, for instance. Well, yeah, like, <laughs> however, you know, the Book of Boba Fett is pretty worthless in terms of its plot and character. So maybe I need a better example. Like, I mean, it's pretty good art direction, though. Well, I guess. Uh, yeah, I well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I'd agree with those, that. Uh, those nifty that's, bikes. That's why I said it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was going to say he's aware. I guess, I guess if we use to a, <laughs> my only well, I mean, my only knowledge of this is oh, you guys no. shitting on it. I haven't actually watched. Well, I mean, it. I I guess if, here's a proper here's way a more to relevant one, take right? Disney like content. Twelve Angry Men is a really great film that has very, very, very low variables. We've got an incredibly limited setting. It is a mm -hmm. real world, like contemporary setting with normal people uh, and a pretty, pretty like normal. It, it's you know, like it's it's all grounded. Versus if you take something like Blade Runner, where it's like, so the story itself is like fairly grounded, but we are in a science fiction setting. We've got like more variables at play in terms of like replicants and space travel and technology and things like that. And it's like. Well, how impressive is it when Blade Runner achieves what it does with all of the complex things that get thrown in that will make it just naturally harder for any writer to make it work because you, you're create you're inventing so many new things versus a story that relies entirely on things that exist in the real world, real world systems of government apparatus, technology, you know. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. fact that before sunrise is consistent means next to nothing. I mean, it, it's two people literally walking around a city with a handy cam having one conversation i mean i, I don't know that I, hard I guess for it not to be know. consistent i mean i wouldn't right? go that far it depends well, on what else I'm character. Saying. yeah like it because there are you can yeah i wouldn't yeah. take away from the fact that the, the variables alone in character but the way to look at it i guess is like if if bill and bob are both juggling and bill dropped one ball while bob dropped five it's like oh man bill's better than it's like bill was only juggling two bob was juggling ten thousand like yeah. oh yeah exactly in exactly. that case bill has done shit like he couldn't juggle two uh yeah. which is we come across that quite a bit where we're like when when the, when a story deals with very few variables but can't even control them it's like oh good job as opposed to yeah like the more characters you throw in the more world building additional world building science fiction or fantasy or whatever that you throw in that's got to be worth something in terms of if you can nail it. It's like, wow, good job, man. Yeah. Like, that was actually really hard. You made it very hard for yourself and you did a great job versus you had no excuse. <laughs> it was, I feel that way about Boba Fett. Wanna... I know that Boba Fett is a sci-fi fantasy, but at the same time, it feels like the variables that's... are very easy to control. I think yeah. the variables yeah. are easy to control because of the stakes of the story and also that it's in a universe where a lot has already been laid out for you. You just got to yeah. follow the rules that have already been made for you. Yeah, because it, you want to be careful of what you give the audience as well. Because it's going back to Boba, because it's the most recent example as well. Just, I don't give a shit how he got a stupid fucking stick. Like, this <laughs> wow, wow, to me. So that was... we need an origin story for Boba's stick. Yeah, I'd rather get an origin story for Plank. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah it's like if you convey info or story or world building, that in the grand scheme doesn't matter. Just because so we have, in that case, a reason why he has the stick, even though that could be easily inferred in between what happened. Oh, he found a stick. He found a stick, yeah. Or he just took it from one of the Tusken Raiders he found in the <laughs> desert because he was in there. It's, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, I don't, it's, you need to be careful. Don't, don't do too much. Don't be, I guess, too consistent. Like, 
it's it's okay <laughs> well, if there's things in there you can infer. I guess two con I put that in well, quotations. I think too consistent. That's probably this it's is, like over explanation at that point, right? I think this over is the big challenge yeah, that are right. And it's like it's kind of like the challenge of trying to create stories is you want to make sure that it all follows and makes sense, but like probably some point that you want to make. Um, and it might be hard to like make that, and and that's like the challenge of storytelling, I guess, is to try and make the point that you want to make with the story, the art in the sense, or like the meaning of the art against all of the the ways that we get there, the ways that it's communicated, the you know the the building blocks basically. Which means John is next. <gasps> oh oh my god! What is the most important element of storytelling? Uh, chimp why is sidekick. it merchandising? Chimp sidekick. Yes, <laughs> preferably a cop resurrected <laughs> from the dead, and is somebody's ex partner. I like it. Um, and he has an attitude. Has a catchphrase. Right? Yes, attitude catchphrase. Ideally, incorporating the word banana each time. Um. Wow, these beat shifts are enough to <laughs> yeah. drive me bananas, Mahoney. <laughs> and then he no, actually uh, starts going bananas and screeching at the top of his lungs. <laughs> <laughs> punching, punching Mahoney. <laughs> Stop it! So, I'm about to say the meme word. Are you uh, ready? That's okay. oh, God. Themes. Like, hey. and, uh, I was hoping uh, someone would say it. I would hope, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, when you said uh, character, Fringy, um, I don't think that's really far off from theme because I, I consider characters I mean, as I vehicles for themes. And um, I don't think a theme always has to be crystal clear, but I think there's something needs to be there. And all the best movies, like all the movies that have really resonated with me, have it, they usually have a theme that's quite clear and you know respectable um i was just watching ratatouille the other day and right i fucking love that movie mm -hmm. it's and its theme is crystal clear i mean they lay it out in the first scene uh talent can come nice from anywhere rats. right yeah <laughs> Well, uh, there's a number like uh, film can have multiple themes, right? But it's typically there's one at the top, and then yeah. you have an, another bunch of them that kind of branch off of that, and all the all the plot beats kind of explore the nuances of those themes. And in the case of Ratatouille, it's not only is it a high concept, you know, uh, a rat, the last thing you would want in a kitchen, becomes the finest chef in Paris. Like you can immediately, you hear that log line and you're like, okay, cool. I'm on board. I get it. Uh, but beyond that, the theme is like talent can come from anywhere. Not, and they, they explain this in the Not movie as well. Not can be talented. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The c critic ego has this speech at the end. He writes his review of um, Gus G Gusteau's restaurant. Gusteau's. Yes. Yeah. He says, um, no, not everyone wants and dies. <laughs> not everyone can be a great artist but uh a great artist can come from anywhere like as long if you want to do something and you put your mind to it and you're willing to learn you can be great no matter where you're from who you are and uh i that always stuck with me like that's one of the best things I mean, there's a lot of things I like about that movie, but the fact that the, it's the story that it's telling is so clear. I know what it's about. And I leave the theater going, I was actually about something and I can really get on board with that message. You know, we were talking about uh, story earlier being a series of events. I agree that that's an essential component of it. But to me, the other essence, essential component is a meaningful series of, of events. What is what does the string of events mean? Because without anything holding it together, it's just a bunch of stuff happening, you know. And a, a bunch of stuff can happen where it's like exploding cars and tits and a sex scene and a montage. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> like that was I guess enjoyable on some kind of popcorn brain dead level. But I, I'm 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 not really leaving the theater with any kind of um, 
I mean, it's a theme or a movie doesn't have to be like profound and life changing well, or anything. Say, or like, have a you disqualify it as a story if you don't find meaning in it. Um. Hmm. I think so. Yeah. Okay. If, if it's what just a it bunch then? of stuff happening, I wouldn't say that's a story. Because like, if I were in the same situation, I'd be like, hey, it's a story, but I don't care about it. I just don't find it very valuable. Yeah, as a story. it's a story that I, just doesn't really have a meaningful theme to well, it or so a purpose or a message. I guess what I would say is that um, I agree that the theme is basically the point of like why we tell stories is the lessons and values that we can pull from narrative and like character is is like the empathy vehicle that helps it easy like become more like comprehensible and easy for us to understand. But I would say that there are absolutely like stories that. I guess the problem is I feel like you could put like you you could put a theme onto any story and then the conversation would just be how well executed is the theme, right? Like the theme of Transformers is I don't know, um be nice to your car because if you don't it might come <laughs> Man to life and machine and kill must you. work together to defeat. Yeah, well, and I, I could say else. that and it's like I guess if I had I could work really hard to try and pull that theme out, but it's it's bullshit, right? As opposed to like the themes of um the th the themes of Ratatouille, where it's like it's pretty clear that this is the point because there's so much in the story that supports that theme, and I guess that's where the conversation becomes: how well have you executed your theme? Because I do think that there are degrees to which themes are well executed and poorly executed. Yeah, like right, can be no, contradictory. No, to totally fair point. I I agree with that. Like uh, I, this reminds me. I talked about this on the podcast before, but I I had a, a friend. Uh, or a, a fan of mine email me asking for story advice. Oh, and you he, got fans. No need he to wanted to. He wanted to write a story that didn't have a theme deliberately, or uh, I think that's what he said. Yeah, and I, I, he he was asking me like, how would you do that? And I'm just like, well, I wouldn't do that. So I'm not really the guy to ask for advice on that kind of approach. To me, that's kind of essential to it. But uh, you're right in that. If I were to just write a bunch of stuff happening and deliberately try and not put a theme in there, I think I, there's going to be a, there's going to be a message embedded in that no matter what. Even but if someone I someone can pull from it, absolutely. I think well, yeah, that's, that's, that's the second counter board, I was you know. going to bring up was that how do you well, stop? There's always going to be someone who can find something in whatever story, even if it's one you've deemed like meaningless. Because I'm right. almost thinking like what Fringy just said that someone can pull something from it. I'm almost feeling like the phrase should be some like a theme that someone can put into it. Mm, right. Well, I guess the thing is, is that when you think about writing a story, a lot of the time, at least in my experience, there is like intentionality of like trying to have a point, I guess a lot of the time, like usually like whenever I think about a story, I want to tell there's usually like a point of some kind, uh, not necessarily a point of like this is correct, but like, wouldn't it be interesting to think about this concept, like something to do with I don't know fear or or heroism or like these are, I, and I feel like it traces back to like the epic of Gilgamesh is one of the earliest stories ever told. The theme is like to that like death is inevitable, right? And that's like one of the themes of that story. It's like right. one of the first stories we told. It seems to just be like a really important part of why we tell stories is some sort of message it's it's the whole idea of like parables and fables like aesop's fables and things like that is uh some sort of message about that you can apply to your life that's like what we're there for well as and as much as i appreciate the fuck out of messaging and, and themes and stuff is it not valuable in and of itself to be like you know what i'd like to just see werewolves and vampires fight each other in a story with some characters i don't need a i don't need to draw meaning yeah. out of it beyond that totally true I love movies that are totally, absolutely shallow and are just a string of action sequences. Um, I, th I would still say that all my favorite ones have some uh, res uh, message that I consider respectable. You know, where, where it's imagine. like it's some, it's some archetype that has like so, recurred over and over that you can apply to your own life in what's some like way. What's like the highest pedigree it can reach without a theme, do you think? Without a theme, uh, the raid. Uh, I feel like I has theme, does so, have a theme. You know, I, like, yeah, I don't think it's without yeah. theme. I'm not quite sure what it is. I need to. I so need right, to watch what it. I envision yeah, as a really problem cool here action. is that you might cite an example, and then someone they might be in chat will be like, "What do you mean? There's a theme <laughs> it's in that." It's got this theme. Yeah. Didn't yeah. you notice? Yeah. 
Am I weird? I guess uh, (laughs) because, yeah, because like The Red Redemption is a movie that pretty much everybody watches for the really awesome action scenes. But I'm pretty sure that like you could pull a theme from that film because it does have a narrative. It has characters and it has a plot. Um, Wait, and so, it has stuff to do with like, what? What's that? Someone in chat said, "I totally disagree, Bola. Action devoid of story is a disgusting waste of time." <laughs> Dude, this guy is fun at parties. <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm assuming I'm not alone in having watched action scenes devoid of context because they're awesome. I'm assuming you guys well, yeah, have done videos that on in your YouTube, life. right? Like if you watch like Dragon Ball Z compilation, hell yeah, scene, yeah, they're really yeah, cool. I like, I like to enjoy. Well, my toxic masculine oh, yeah. uh, entertainment. I guess that's the thing is like, if you're looking at a story that doesn't have much of a theme, but is incredibly, incre- imp- incredibly impressive, impre- <laughs> incredibly, <laughs> incredibly impressive, incredibly impressive, yes. Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly impressive. impressive on a technical level. Like it's got incredible fight scenes, amazing visual effects, great cinematography, awesome music, like everything is working, but it is just like a fight scene. I feel like that's got to be worth a hell of a lot in terms of just the craft of, you know, because I, yeah, I guess like and filmmaking, things. filmmaking is like, I guess storytelling is the umbrella term, but there's also like more to craft than that. In the same way that like with art, there's like paint strokes and brushes and and like uh, color, you know, how color plays into it, like the technical aspects of the craft. Like, for instance, really great prose describing nothing could be that could be really interesting in terms of like theme or uh, like that. It doesn't really have a theme at all, but it's just super impressive. Uh, in terms of the the technical craft, and yeah, that's got to be worth something. The the questions today though revolve around like what is the best of a number of elements of storytelling. Yeah. The best, what well, the best story, the best character. I would say when we're talking about the best stories, the cream of the crop are the ones that have are tied together by themes. You know, where I every scene you 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 see it like relates to something uh... unifying. And it, it's everything is driving towards one central thing, well, so Ryan, or like one main there, thing so and a bunch of sub themes as well. What would you? I don't say, know. Is Ryan, it's like a film that you really, really like and value that you don't r- particularly care about the theme. To be fair, oh, Rags, it, all he not, has to do is cite one that he he enjoys, but not for it. It doesn't have to well, not no, have I, a theme. I, I, just yeah, one that he doesn't yeah, enjoy for its themes. It wasn't that's, that. That's I think it was curious. the themes being the most important aspect of what makes like a story the greatest. You know, like if you had, especially if themes are more just emergent from characters and setting instead of more intentionally baked into the material. Um, Because I wonder, does a does a story like if we take the Lord of the Rings, right? And if we take all that that encompasses with the characters behaving and their dialogue and the plot carrying out as it does, um, is that story only as good as it is because of the themes that are present in it? Or if if all of those themes were more like again passively emergent, would that make the story worse? Well, I mean, I would I would say that like Lord of the Rings, the themes are not passively emergent. Like it's it's pretty clear what the theme of the Lord of the Rings is. It's like well, okay, so someone didn't see together. them. Well, then, but they um, loved it. I guess that's an interesting thing to think about. It, is it like did they actually appreciate it, but they? can't put their finger on it or do they are they like wholly they well, no, wholly I, well they could just talk about well, if the they characters. listen to all the words the dialogue yeah just purely right. pure characters this character does this and therefore he does that and so he says these things and that's consistent with how we say and he learned from this and so he did that they did that about the entirety of the lord of the rings but they're they just had they just didn't see the themes they just didn't notice them it just didn't occur to them that there were themes in it and then you mention it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I guess if you want to, yeah, I, I guess there was, yeah." I if they're really talking about that. the things that they like and are great about the characters, could you make the argument that, like, just by virtue of doing that, that they're going to talk about themes somehow? Like, if they talk about how much they love the relationship between Frodo and Sam in terms of like their friendship, that just by virtue of talking about that, they've kind of talked about themes. So, anyway. as so in that, I so I said. Well, the One Ring is a representation of the theme LMAO. Rags is wrong on this one. What What am I Rags wrong about? Wrong. I'm asking He's... a question about... Uh, <laughs> I'm describing a this hypothetical individual. A <laughs> well, yeah, I think... And we're getting closer and closer um, to the point, because if yeah. we can't separate the meaning you derive out of a character's story from theme, then at that point... Then uh, yeah, I guess everyone's appreciating of... theme no matter what, in some sense. Yeah, yeah to answer the question about specifically the friendship between Sam and Frodo, for instance, 
is the friendship that they have and are displayed to have different from the theme of friendship? I guess that's the thing, right? Because it, it, I think you can tie throughout that whole film, right? That it's basically friendship good is like the theme of Lord of the Rings, but like yeah. working together good. Because I um, think, because when I think about these two characters, my mind in no way goes to friendship as a theme. I am completely honed in and focused and notice these are two characters who are very good friends based on all the things they do and say. And I like that. Yeah, I'm compelled the, by it. That's right. Um, I think the themes go in subconsciously, though. You know, like if, they, if you're not appreciate if you if you're not if you don't acknowledge them on the surface and you don't leave the theater knowing what the themes are, if they're there, I think they go in well into your brain. The only you know, way we can figure that out then at that point is like Rags is telling me how much he enjoyed Fro Frodo and Sam. He assesses them as characters perfectly, their journeys and what they mean to each other. And then I go, well, sounds like you loved as well this the the idea of fellowship and how we can come together to beat any foe sort of thing. I could let's yeah. pretend hypothetically Rags was like, huh? Oh, I, like I genuinely guess so. baffled. The, but, yeah, the <laughs> theme doesn't have to be anything complex or profound. You know, well, I'm it just could even just the, be a word, not even a phrase. A theme? I'm suggesting that Rags in the hypothetical does not give a fuck about the theme whatsoever, but he's very definitive on what he's enjoying about the content as a story. Well, I, I often think of themes as like statements or yeah, questions. maybe define theme Some, for sometimes. Us. Def, oh, define theme. I guess <laughs> I don't know if theme and meaning are exactly interchangeable I what maybe says. that's the dictionary well yeah you can go to it you can go I'll let, I'll let you phone a friend <laughs> if you like but as would. as someone yeah as someone who's because i mean if theme so, is the thing that you think is most important i i feel you should have some kind of a definition for it theme <laughs> so the the definition of theme according to merriam webster is a subject or topic of discourse or of artistic representation b a specific and distinctive quality, characteristic, or concern. Uh, two, a melodic subject of a musical composition or movement. Uh, three, a written exercise. So I guess it would be definition 1A, a subject or topic of discourse or of artistic representation. Yeah, one for you. I, said a that. unifying idea. That's the one I'm inclined to. I feel like, like that's just probably something that ties everyone. everything together. I'm, like I'm saying, it doesn't have to be anything big or profound or life-changing or new like often they're not and they're not new they're historically recurring over and over again heroes you know? right we, um, for me, i think I, you described it as oftentimes the point which i i think i would agree I think with that's broadly. what i generally would say of, is yeah. the theme is the point of the story it's like if we have a story that has characters plot and world building like the actual stuff that's in there the theme is like the value that you pull from it in terms of um like a point or a lesson or a virtue um i feel like that's the best i could do mm -hmm. with a definition for theme anything else feels like it might leave stuff out um and i mean you think because a lot of the time themes of stories are like be brave or be kind to people or um failure is the best uh, teacher nah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no 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 it's the greatest teacher failure is <laughs> yeah it's a completely different thing watch the movie no, I didn't watch them. If movie. not, I then I oh, I you. envy you. Then I envy you. How many times have I, we seen TLJ? Too many. I what am think I, I've only seen it beginning to end. It might be just the one time. I I certainly only watch it once. I've time. definitely seen it more than once for making those yeah. videos. I think that's what's wild. I've only actually seen it beginning to end one time, and it was at the theater. The rest is a well, massive collection of clips and references and things of that nature i feel like it's, it's always like a good example of and i mean there are a lot of examples of it right like that you can come into a story with the intention of conveying a certain theme but the story itself can betray that theme yeah so like it's, absolutely. it's not you, you don't just earn it by default like the idea having the theme emerge in your head of like i want to tell this story with this point that's not that's a, that's not like anything necessarily. You got to put in the work to make that theme something of value. Work, um, you. What? I, I think so. I think yes. that um, and I think that's what makes theme valuable in like stories where it's really great. Is man, you work so hard to achieve this theme and make it cogent. And there are so many references in the film that I can point to 
that are um that you know that, we that support my interpretation of this theme like i appreciate all of the answers so far i don't disagree definitively with any of them and themes like the interesting thing about that one is that it's one of the most commonly like it's going to be between that and character for me to build a story up from the ground um because it is the, the two that you need everything else to comport to as far as i'm concerned well uh, yes. plot will like design itself once everybody is clear and, and the world is just just try not to fucking contradict yourself okay just well i careful. think it's the standard thing right it's it's very rare that people say man what a great plot i love that plot that plot yeah. was so cool i love how that event happened and then that event happened that but was you so do cool. find people characters saying, other events the you, characters were pretty lame though people you know? <laughs> people do say that on occasion like um i guess they stuff do with, with right. twists and yeah and turns That's and but usually, also like the social you know, network feels... is a very plot-driven film. Social network has oh, man. strong those characters, though. though. Like, yeah, those they're great. Those characters are awesome. Like that, that would be what I'd be pointing to there. And I mean, you think about it, like Steve Jobs, which is also written by Aaron Sorkin. It's like that's another one where it's like the plot is not that important at all. It's like character seeing these people interact with each other. Yeah, like, I was going to say the plot hardly exists. <laughs> you typically don't find people saying, "Oh, what a great plot of shitty characters," but you will find every once in a while people saying, "What a great world!" Like, what an incredible or, world! Yeah. What what great character. A world seems to carry you quite far sometimes. It can, yeah, I think. It can world. distract from not having any characters. Uh, but I mean, at that point, it's the character of the world almost feels like, or the potential of, oh, imagine this scenario yeah, yeah, with this yeah. character in this world. That'd be so oh. cool. Like, what if this character met the Balrog? What if this character mm. was present at this battle? One of my uh, favorite modern examples of theme holding a whole movie together is uh the second new spider-man far from home um where you have this idea of oh, can get controversial here <laughs> i i don't know what you guys maybe you guys hate it i don't know i really no, no, like no, the we, movie. we i think we all um are this relatively is one of positive the about it while having reservations get, about its yeah. th <laughs> plot right let him say I, the um, thing and then we'll kill him yeah I, uh, we're not gonna kill him this is fine I, we might i'm impressed do. i'm we impressed might, yeah. that that film manages to have this kind of uh light fluffy comedic feel to it all but it's it's so tied together by its theme of truth it's just really simple that's about it and then a bunch of kind of sub themes and questions branching off this central idea of truth like uh the difference between truth and fact uh the difference between the truth and a lie uh the truth in service of a lie a lie in service of truth um what the greater good of, of of like a broad situation is like uh the uh that what you were when fringy you're talking about characters being so important like i i totally agree I, characters are up there with theme for me because when you i think when you're brainstorming for stories i mean for me usually it's theme or character that comes first mm -hmm. and with spider-man far from home if you tell a story about truth like that comes along with certain characters and Mysterio is such an obvious character, a villain to go with when you're telling that kind of story, but, or maybe the character came first where it's like, okay, we want to do a movie about Mysterio. Mm. What do we do with that? It's like, okay, well with Mysterio comes these themes of what's real and what's not right. Cause that, that's kind of the essence well, of that, that villain. Yeah. I, uh, I, it's I, I don't I guess I don't want to because I know one of the, the the future topics is going to be but one of my favorite characters and just like stories in general part of the reason why I like him so much is that he's so rich for like theme there's so much you can do in terms of theme exploration yeah. with that character that it's like man what a great template for like for, for telling stories about these particular topics I, I definitely agree that like character and yeah. theme often go hand in hand because it's like the lesson that the hero learns is usually like the theme that you want the person to walk away with the challenges often, that they face yeah. tied into the, often not always necessarily sometimes it might be the villain right Who well it's just a great it's a great it. way to it's a great way to teach a lesson isn't it to show a character well, learning it through the empathy character. right that's, yeah that's like the strength of storytelling is it, it leverages like human empathy to uh to get to a to, to a place um i, I see people I think... already guessing i'm not telling yet <laughs> I think that movie does a really good job of exploring all the nuances of its theme through its plot without feeling too forced. Like, for example, like Peter gets photographed in that compromising with his pants down with that woman. And it's a fact 
on in a photograph that that happened but the truth is not that he was making out with that girl or anything and the guy has that photo and he's using it against him to hook up with mj and he's kind of like saying peter's a bad person even though i i kind of think that that character knows that he caught him in a compromising position that wasn't quite what it seemed but he didn't care because he wanted to hook up with mj so he's being a little bit deceitful there but he's claiming to be on the side of truth and then you know peter gets the ridiculous god glasses <laughs> and he can see the uh you know everyone sending their texts to each other through their phones on the bus and he sees that uh uh the guy is about to send the image to mj i think over the phone and he he's i think he stops the process of delivering the message with the glasses and it's like should he have done that should he not have done that because he has this godlike power and it's like you could consider the idea of like he's abusing his power but no if it's in the service of a greater truth that he, like this guy is like going to um manipulate the facts in order in order to um hook up with mj and leave peter out of the picture like it's she, he's not giving mj a fair representation of what's actually going on and um what else happens in that movie um oh, obviously all this stuff with mysterio like oh, right, like right. i love the whole nightmare sequence him literally not knowing what's real and what's not real with the whole like like mysterio's deliberately trying to throw him off warping him back like showing him showing him what's like obviously fake but then putting him in what looks like the real world but it's still fake and then like psyching him out um anyway yes yeah, so that's that's like a, a recent example of a film that i feel is really held together like every almost every scene in that movie it's just like oh yeah i can see how this relates to its theme and you know it doesn't have to be anything new or profound or complex it's just like it's got this theme of truth i get it and this scene is about this aspect of it this scene is about that aspect of it and it all comes together really nicely. They set up the spider sense, which, of course, that's like the silver bullet for a character like Mysterio. Like that would be his downfall. Yeah. Um, so, OK, you guys can flame me alive now. <laughs> if uh, no, no, I don't no, know we, what think, your I opinion. I think we probably all agree stuff. here. It's the chat is going to be flaming you alive. Well, so, well, oh, I, see. It, I mean, because it seems like the general consensus we've arrived at far from home is that plot's pretty weak. Like plot is quite weak, but I still think that the character for Peter and, and like Mysterio is, is working. Uh, I um, the only thing I would have to add is that, um, on its own, I don't think truth is enough, um, to really constitute a strong theme. Well, what you need is you I'm, need I'm so, more, more so, um, exploration of that idea is what makes it valuable rather well, than the consistency with which it's just present in the so story, right? A good I would example agree with is Jay. Wonder Woman 1984. The theme of that film is that the truth is good. That is the theme of that the film. The truth is beautiful. But but Yay. it's awful. I don't think that. I don't see that as a bad Yay. thing, though, in its simplicity. Like, uh, I'm okay well, with no, that. No, no, well, no. No, no. The, the truth is, is beautiful. The is problem isn't that it's a simple theme. Truth. theme. Also, that's, that's not the, true. I don't the, agree the with reason, that. The reason why I use that one as an example is because that is clearly the point that the film wants to make, but like, my it is so poorly conveyed. Well, it, 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 the, like, the film it, makes me think, no, that's the opposite of what's true. Yes, like, I'm arguing film, against its the film's theme. problems makes me think, no, the truth is so often ugly, and you've got to accept that. Shut up. The truth is not always a thing of beauty. Fuck off. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. The problem <laughs> Sometimes it's very ugly. Is that, uh, at the end, everybody gets the power to have like wishes and stuff. And the film kind of almost posits that everybody is going to make incredibly selfish, vain, cynical wishes. And we just like ignore the wishes that people would make. I wish my kid didn't have leukemia or something. Yeah. And then like Wonder Woman gives a speech about how basically you should just like passively accept your shitty circumstances. Yeah, your leukemia because is beautiful. Because that's the truth and it's beautiful. And it's yeah, like, leukemia is the truth. Well, that's no, it's nice. even worse. No, it's even nice worse than you, leukemia is beautiful. Know? It's the fact that your son has leukemia is beautiful, <laughs> which is even worse. <laughs> You need to it's, rise it's, up against children with leukemia. Yeah, and, and that and, it's and beautiful <laughs> that you will choose to not help him. Yeah. Right, what, like it's it's one, the same. One eighty four is shit. It's, really, it's a bad. really really bad movie. One nineteen eighty four is like such a bad movie that basically like all normies who watched it didn't like it either. It, it's, well, yeah, it's awful. except high top <laughs> films. And so he's and the careful... director is going to make a Rogue Squadron film. So prepare well, that's not anuses. happening anymore. I don't think. Oh, is, is that canceled? That's on hold indefinitely. I what, think. What yeah. Rogue oh, Squadron. So, 
What is yeah. that? Is that a Star Wars? Patty thing? Jenkins is going to direct a million Star Wars projects. Who cares? Uh, yeah. So like the the interesting thing I think that we discover here as well is that we had a lot of praise for movies that do well with binding everything through theme, but ones that fuck themselves up through theme, like they seem to crash and burn as a result of that real hard. Like if they're trying to make an overall point and they seppuku themselves uh, on trying to make it, TLJ being another fantastic. Can you example. think of an example of? one of those movies where they they butcher their own theme but the film is otherwise really good oh well oh. i wasn't referencing that necessarily but i think that when we talk about tlj and wonder woman 84 and stuff a lot of people will gun for the theme first because it's such a like all-encompassing well, failure what's the idea that like <laughs> your film has kind of been destroyed by it's such strong adherence to a theme that doesn't appear to be like you need to tell a different story if you want to get to this theme, you know? Or or you need to make, like, significant no, changes to the... Honestly, you need to live in a different... With, well, at least in the case of uh, Winnie Winnie Thought 4, you need to live in a different reality if you want to get to this theme. Like, I don't accept um, this theme. Right. I, I guess it's the idea that Wonder Woman 1984, that was clearly, like, the theme they went for. But it's just, like... Oh, shit. It is. You can have films yeah. and stories that execute a theme well, but the theme could be... Well, like, someone in uh, chat has got a good example that you could probably talk about. Starship Troopers, right? Like, the intention of the of the story versus, like, what you actually pull from it. And yeah. uh, I guess in that, in, with that example, are you talking about how it's... Tr like, the attempt is to make the... like the attempt of the director was to convey a political message. However, that the actual material of the like world is material. really awesome. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, like a, it's like a satire of fascism, but like if you just look at the movie on the surface, it seems to be like supporting like yeah, but a it's fascist really... totalitarian state, but it's actually a satire. Well, it... It was supposed the, to the, be. It's supposed to be, but unironically, the system of Starship Troopers is great, and I would have no issue living under that political system because it's kind of amazing. Clip it. And there's a lot of really, really excellent... Yeah, that's you the thing. People think that... Yeah, things that, that's the thing that people don't get about Starship Troopers. People see people see long boots and trench coats, and they're like, oh, this is about how fascism's bad. But there's no fascism present in that movie at all. It's, like, extremely the opposite. I watched... Um, I think Sargon made his video in response... Like, he said it was spurred on by seeing Red Letter Media talk about it, and he was like, no. Because they... They... <laughs> Oof, I'm about to say something pretty harsh, but a lot of people uh -oh. will say the surface take is just a fun action movie, while the deep take is that it's anti-fascism. And then people will say, no, the surface take is that it's anti-fascism. The deep take is that it's actually pro, just like, it's just a story a about an interesting civilization that is <laughs> got a lot well, more going for it than sense. a lot of people would claim. In a sense, it is anti-fascism because it shows a very non-fascist -fasc system that works excellently and is awesome. So, in that sense, sure. Um, but yeah, friend, because I know it's just such an unusual take for a lot of people. Just watch Sargon's video on it; it's very interesting. It's very good. He goes through a lot of but I, I guess, misconceptions. I guess the reason why I brought that one up is the idea that the theme, the intended theme of the creator, seems to be dissonant with uh, how it actually pans out in the story. Well, yeah, yeah, something is, because, like, I, you know, because everyone's just so familiar with it, but, like, TLJ tells us, you as a person will improve through your failings. That's, like, one of the most important parts of learning is through, and it's like, oh, that, that's an interesting and important message, sure. Poe doesn't fail, and he gets chastised, and then by the end of the film, he makes the wrong decision, and he's rewarded, and the film is like, this is growth. It's like, that is not growth, that's regression. It's regression. It's yeah. Growth of a tumor. The so, tumor of bad storytelling. And, you know, this applies to... Oh my god. It applies to characters in all the different ways. Like, like Luke is just... We're just told he failed miserably. And it's just like... It's completely out of character. But simultaneously, he came through because he learned from his failure that learning from failures is important. I don't know. Like, point being that uh, the theme is so explicit and yet it's incongruent with, what, with the events taking place. And I suppose that could be applied to... Starship Troopers. I'd have to watch it again to see if there's any overt yeah, sort of, time. you know, like the equivalent of Yoda saying the line. Like one character says, fascism's bad, and that's what you guys are. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're whoa. Thing. Yeah. Um, I suppose I'm next. Oh boy, Going cool. Randomizer. You um, say so. I chose 
It's, it, it, arguably, it could be a little bit close to metals, but I chose continuity. And I chose it because it seems to me that whenever anyone talks about a movie's sort of, or rather, a story's um, uh, praiseworthy elements or critic worthy elements like this, it's going to be regarding some level of continuity. It's something, it's how things are connecting to other things. And um, I just think it's like the binding gel for basically every single component that could ever be in it. I don't, I don't know how to get more fundamental than that without breaking into like, like the atoms conversation we ended up in at one point. But <laughs> um, the way I see it is that every person that's ever complimented the way a story works, they're usually going to be referencing how at least one thing connects to another thing, but usually mm -hmm. lots of things put together. Um, so yeah. Wait, is it, anyone got any questions on that? Or... <laughs> I, mean, I, th I think that's. Right? I think yeah. it's more relevant now than ever. The idea of of continuity and it goes back into like respecting your lore and where you came from, not to use it well, as a you know, just I a think, stepping stone. Well, I think I think we'll go even more based than that. If a story is a sequence of events, then it makes sense that continuity is like basically yeah. the fundamental element, the, right? It, yeah. I think taking this back to law is um, is going to be the thing that um, a lot of people who want to misinterpret what you mean when you say continuity are going to immediately think of. Whereas like, oh, of course, the, the, the nerds, they, can't, they think continuity is the most important part of storytelling. Well, hey, guess what? It actually doesn't matter if Boba Fett uses the same kind of gun new he rocket. used a new hope or he wasn't well, even I mean, yeah to clarify right you know, it's like um, it's more base than the idea of, i'm definitely hey, not just talking about law yeah yeah it's, yeah, the idea it's, that, yeah, like, it's fundamentally more fundamental any, than that it's, yeah any appeal you yeah. make to something that you like in a story is going to rely on what it was in and how two pieces of information like connected together right it's, it's yeah. never going to be it's never going to be you know what bob it's going to like i liked the oh. bob you're not going to say that. You're going to say, I like yeah. that Bob did this, or I like that this happened to Bob, and this is how he reacted to it. It's it's always going to be an appeal to something that, yeah. Like, that, um, I, like, like the most fundamental stuff is like, oh, well, something, something really simple. I, I like that this character wore red in this scene. Well, it's like, oh, okay, that that's cool. Um, but it's probably going to be with some, in relation to most likely something else in the story, right? Um. If, if if the idea that a character wearing red is meaningful, there's probably something set up that makes that the case. Um, what red might mean to that character or the specific clothes that they're wearing and what they, they mean in the context of the world or something like that. Uh, well, because on its own, that's not going to be a meaningful event. Someone just asked, what's the difference between continuity and consistency? An example I was just thinking of in my head, this might not be the best way to put it, but... Um, if, you know, Anthony walks through into a room and there's supposed to be a painting and then, you know, seconds later there's no painting, you could call that inconsistent, but it's in continuity with what we understand to be his POV. Well, um, you can have, you can have um, well, consistent inconsistency, right? Where you have um, something that is established to not always work the same way, something that is established to be random or something that's established to be unreliable. Yeah, that's, yeah, and... Um, I wouldn't want to depreciate any of the other options that have been given today. It's just more so that I I assume that continuity uh, that that is like embedded in all of them. Um, yeah. To make like some people are saying like, well, I I think purpose is the most important. It's like, well, yeah, I I think purpose is really important too. But I would also put that without continuity, you can't do any of these things really. Yeah, I would I would definitely include continuity into consistency to some degree. Just when we have something like. Oh, this bomb is thirteen kilometers away, and they get there in like one minute, which is impossible for what we know. That's like, huh? Does that make sense? Yeah, and also character actions need to be connected to characters' other actions, right? Or else you don't have a character. Yeah, you know, if, if a character is established as being cowardly, you can have a catalyst, and and over time they can become brave. But if they're established as being cowardly, and then all of a sudden they're brave for no reason, it's kind of like, uh, bruh. Like, yeah. Yes, non-contradiction has a necessary temporal component to it. All right, then. Does that mean we only have one left for this first question? <laughs> Over two and a half hours? Only, only two and a half hours, yeah. Hey, one Duma, question. <laughs> what's the most important element of storytelling? So I, I think I have a pretty atypical answer. It's going to take me a minute to explain. Um, Bagels. But... 
<laughs> not bagels. Uh, my, my answer is suspense. So usually people think of suspense as being something that's only really discussed in like a thriller or a horror movie or like very specific contexts. Um, <clears throat> but if you're if you're thinking about uh, what should I be writing, right? What, what should I be actually doing in a story? Um, what you know, what matters for the audience? Usually, one of the most important things that, that people will say is, you know, what happens next? You, you need to be they need to be captivated, they need to be interested and invested in, in what's going to happen in the future. Um, and basically, I think all of the reasons that that happens are suspense. So my conception of suspense is basically that you have a question in the audience's mind that's being teased at. And what's really important is how much they care about that question and how well you're able to establish that there are multiple different possible outcomes, right? So a character wants a goal. Um, the more you care about that character, the more you will care about them being able to achieve their goal. And then the question becomes, are there good reasons that they might achieve it or fail, right? And, and, and the, the more you care about the question and the more you're able to tease apart those different possibilities, the more suspense you're going to have about that particular question. Is, is the character going to accomplish their goal? So an example to kind of illustrate this, I think, is one of the most common questions that a, a story will be teasing out is, is this character going to die in like an action film, for example? Um, if we just look at the MCU, uh, people are generally speaking going to care more about um, Iron Man or Spider-Man dying because people generally speaking like Iron Man and Spider-Man a lot relative to other characters. And then you could also look at problems with teasing the idea of certain characters dying. Or if you have a character like Thor or the Hulk that have like an absurdly high power level, most people aren't really going to think that they're going to die. So if you try and tease the idea, you know, is the Hulk going to die? I mean, the answer is probably no. Um, but, you know, Iron Man's just a dude in a suit. So it is perfectly conceivable that Iron Man could die, right? So you have really good reasons for or against the question, and they really care about the question. Um, and this is basically how I, when most people go in, and write a story, um, plot is usually sort of the centerpiece of everything. If someone asked someone, what are you writing? The first thing they would probably talk about is the plot. If you looked at their notes, it would probably be organized in terms of the plot. Um, I actually organize things in terms of suspense. So I try and figure out what questions I'm teasing at and try and make them as interesting as possible and try and make sure that there are multiple possible outcomes um, that I'm able to you know, tease the suspense, right? Um, it's, I, I think it's probably a pretty atypical answer. I don't th even think a lot of people think of suspense as being a part of a story, but I have, I have found this to be sort of the ultimate answer of why I find most films to be as compelling as they are relative to other films. So they're like incredibly suspenseful. These questions I really care about um, and it's actually conceivable to imagine multiple different outcomes. Yeah. I would say one good way to sort of put that into, I, I get one way to describe it would be good suspense is when you have an audience that is convinced and believes in the idea that whatever happens next is going to be reasonable and will make sense. They have the, yes. the audience has been given this confidence. <laughs> That yeah, but they, bullshit ain't just going to happen for no reason. Yeah, but they also need specific things to care about. Um, so like a, a character accomplishing their goal is something, right? Um, and it, I mean, in, in a general sense, if you have um, three characters in a story and only one of them has a goal, um, there is a sense in which it could be more interesting if another character had a goal. You have another thing to wonder about. Or uh, mysteries, for example. Um, mysteries have kind of been sullied recently in film because there's this really horrible um, habit box. of... Yeah, exactly. Writers will just come up with something that sounds interesting, but they don't know where it's going. And it, it's just terrible. So like that idea has kind of been sullied. But the idea of a mystery is, is just exactly the same thing. There's, there's this question, very often it's about the backstory of a character or about something about the world that hasn't quite been teased apart. There's like a, maybe a sense of dramatic irony or whatever. Um, and I mean, that can be a very, very powerful element of storytelling. It's just unfortunately not been done particularly well in the last 10 to 15 years on account of certain people. Um, yeah, I mean, when you think about like sort of the cognitive experience of watching a film, what, what actually is going on in your head? What, what is it that um, you find so compelling about watching certain movies? I, I think this is the most engaging aspect. I mean, for me anyway. Is sort of these these questions that get get brought up and and, and making people care about them and, and sort of teasing you in different directions. 
And like a, a good example of this um, is it, the reason that a lot of romance films are really bad is because they don't do this. You know, the outcome is sort of presupposed. You know, you know they're going to get together. You're just you're just sort of waiting for it to happen. Um, it's a, a very critical problem I think that the genre has is that there's no real suspense. Um, it, it, there's not really much to wonder about. There, there isn't any way that you're actively involved intellectually and in like trying to figure out where this is going. You just kind of already know. When, when romance films are actually able to establish that suspense, it, it, in my opinion, it's when they become really, 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 really good a lot of the time. So I have a question. How do we factor in the value of suspense in a film where you, after you've seen it, basically, when you come back to watch it for the second time and you know what's going to happen? Uh, I mean, I, I can... This is a bit different from other people, I think. I don't spoilers don't affect me that much. There's a sense in which I can watch a movie that I've already seen a hundred times, and I'm still kind of experiencing it for the first well, time. I, it, I, yeah, I, like I, I guess uh, it would be the idea of like if the value of suspense is the idea of like, ooh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What happens when you know already because you've seen it? Uh, I mean, or it, if you've been given spoilers, I, I guess the question would be: Do you think that there was something more fundamental? to analyzing how well it works that is beyond the audience reaction to that suspense uh yeah but i mean i i still experience this even when watching a film you know many 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 it's times it's you. not it's not sure i mean i can only speak well, for myself. I, I i guess what i'm i guess what i'm asking is do you think that there is like an identifiable craft to suspense that we can talk about in terms of how well it's done divorced from the audience reaction like the first time versus the second time or the third time uh i think that suspenseful films should maintain most of it uh, on repeat viewing or with spoilers like it, i i on the surface it seems like they shouldn't but in my experience they do um and i i think that's true at least of a lot of people i, I can't know for everyone right but if there wasn't a if there wasn't a compelling question it would I mean, I, I would sort of ask the, you know, it's like, why, why are you watching it again, right? If, if, well, so if, I guess, uh, usually, like when I rewatch a film, I do have a quite different experience the second time around. It's like first time around, you're like, you are asking the question, like, oh, where's this going to go? You're like pondering, you know, based on the clues, the all of the different directions it could go in. Usually, the second time around. When I'm watching a film, I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, and that, that ties into that at the end. Wow, that was clever. Like, that's really good. Man, this is so well structured in terms of, like, getting all of this information out in this way. It's like, I think my experience the second time around tends to be more analytical of, like, mm -hmm. I, I guess the craft of the writing. Because now that I know where everything's going, you can start to see how purposeful it is. You know, like, you start yeah. with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And because you, you start with the end yeah, in I... mind, you start building towards it in a way that's really cool. I guess I'm just asking, like... Yeah, I, I, so I, I agree with that almost completely. Like, So, like... Right. I mean, I, I would say that you're understanding how, why the film was able to be that suspenseful, right? Like, so... The, yeah. When, for, for, the, for the favorite movie question, I... My like spoiler alert. Well, the the reason that I'm choosing that I'm not not going to say it, but the the reason <laughs> I'm choosing the movie is because it is profoundly suspenseful, right? right. And I've seen the movie over a hundred times, and every time I watch it, I see another reason that it had that effect on me the first time that I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't gone back and rewatched it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so it's like e even if you don't have the same, it's like obviously I'm never going to be able to recreate the theater experience of going there opening night and, and seeing the movie, um, but I remember you know, how profound that experience was. And even rewatching it, I still have, I would say like 40 to 60% of the level of magnitude of that experience. But it's also like you said, there's an analytical element of understanding how was it able to evoke this much suspense? How, how was it able to be this uh, engrossing, right? Can a story be good without suspense? Uh, in this sense, I would guess not. But I mean, again, this is a this is probably a more broad definition. I mean, well, like I said, most people would only think of suspense in terms of like being like a thriller, right? So I mean, actually, no. Finish, finish what you were gonna say. Yeah, I was just gonna say like most people would only think of suspense as being something you would talk about in a thriller or a horror film. So like when I talk about suspense and romance films, people find that to be really weird until I go out and explain exactly what it is that I'm talking about, and then I guess hopefully it makes sense to people then. But I mean, in the sense that I'm using it, I don't know how you could even construct a story really. Um, well, hypothetical. Like this. Uh, the story is man is sitting at his computer, like just typing, browsing the web, and he does that for about thirty six minutes, and then he suddenly gets shot in the head, and then the following like sixty minutes is just him lying there as blood starts to pool on the floor. Could you say 
Like, could you say that it would just be suspense in that because as soon as he gets shot, you have no idea what's going to happen next. Okay, so because- this is this is, is going to seem like kind of a pedantic answer. Um, but <laughs> there are a lot of questions that are sort of implicit in any form of film. So like if in the opening of a movie, you're always wondering who are these people and what's going to happen. That, that's just sort of always omnipresent sort of regardless of what's happening so you would be wondering is he just going to keep typing right what is going to happen it it would it would very rapidly approach zero because you wouldn't care about this person um and with no development like this is like the i mean the level of suspense would would like literally approach zero i mean you'd probably turn it off um well because you wouldn't what if we change the parameters to uh we we can see what he's doing on the computer and and there's like a whole bunch of stuff that he's doing on the computer that can tell us stories about his life and his interests and his relationships with people but he doesn't really talk he only ever conveys through the computer and then some like so maybe he's sending a message to his girlfriend like yeah you know we could go out for dinner tonight and we can go and he gets shot in the head and then it's him lying on the keyboard and from that point on we see we see on the computer like it's maybe it's open on social media and like his girlfriend starts up you know it's like hmm it's weird he's not responding and then you, there's a phone call right like we just add these parameters but it's still a story in one room and the guy just sitting there. And all that happens oh. is that in terms of what happens to him is he's typing on his computer, he gets shot. And then like, oh, it sounds like, this sounds like a pretty cool, like art film. I actually yeah. really <laughs> like this idea as I'm saying it, this feels well, like it could be a really cool story. Well, so, I mean, yeah, there, so there is. So like when, when, as soon as you establish, okay, he has a girlfriend, you're you're wondering what's the nature of their relationship. And there's probably going to be mm-hmm. some element of their interaction. That's going to imply something. So like, one way that you can make romance films more interesting is to imply something that would traditionally be bad or traditionally be good and then later reveal that there is an element the opposite of what you were expecting. So you you get the expectation of, you know, what is the nature of their relationship? Oh, it's good because they said something that would seem on the surface to be good, right? But you could, sometimes it gets explored more later and you realize, oh, now actually there's um, a negative part of this relationship that wasn't uh, previously established and then you sort of have a conflict it's like okay we have reasons to think the relationship is good and reasons to think the relationship is bad um so we inherently have a conflict that needs to be explored and and potentially resolved right so i mean yeah there's like there's always going to be some level of question it's just going to be um i mean part of it part of it does seem kind of interesting right um but i I mean i think i think there kind of always has to be suspense in the way that i'm using the term it's just that a lot of the time um it's not going to be terribly and it's not going to be noteworthy <laughs> is the way to put it um no i i agree i don't consider it uh like uh atypical to 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 announce the importance of that like suspense suspense and tension in a film is is key like it hinges on juxtaposition and it transcends genre i know what you mean about like it commonly being attributed to like thriller and horror because like with like suspense, everyone brings up the the Hitchcock example of the bomb under the table, right? Which we, you would only see in like a th- thriller movie. I'm proud of but us it... for not mentioning it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and now I did. Um, but like the the juxtaposition can be anything, not just the presence of a bomb and people who are oblivious. You can juxtapose ideas, characters, scenes, sequences, um, entire acts. Um, you can juxtapose themes, ideas, like there needs to be like clashes going on and that keeps yeah, people so it's like, compelled on the edge of their seat. This, this is part of why Game of Thrones was so compelling for a while. I mean, it's a real shame it was canceled after four seasons, but you yeah. know, I guess we'll never right. know what was going to happen. Yeah. Right. But like the, one of the good things about that show was that you would have a lot of characters that are morally gray, meaning that they would do some things that are, that would seem good and some things that would seem bad. And sometimes their perception of what is good and bad is different than yours. Their perception of good and bad is different than the other characters in the story. And that gives you a lot of questions, right? It's like, well, well is it, I mean, you can't even necessarily figure out is this, you know, is Jamie Lannister a good or bad character? The answer to that question is going to change considerably over time, right? So it's like, like sort of my view is, first of all, most people find Jamie Lannister to be pretty compelling, right? Um, And then there's all these questions about um, how things are going to affect him, how we actually think about him, what's his relationship to the world. And these things get teased and changed over time. I mean, almost all of them. In the the beginning of the show, he is, you know, one of the most talented swordsmen, uh, you know, in in the world that is established. And then he gets his hand cut off and it's like, okay, well, his entire identity just got robbed of him. And you're wondering where exactly is that going to go? And it goes in a certain direction at once and then another direction later. 
Um, but the fact that we really care about it, and, and there's all these questions related to Jamie, right? And all the questions are are, are changing. They aren't they aren't static things. Um, there, there's a, a consistent development of his character, at least over the four seasons that we got, right? Um, it, it, the, the development of Jamie is pretty suspenseful in that way. I don't think most people would describe. And I, I'd say it's atypical because I've read like all the screenwriting books. It never gets talked about this way. So, I mean, it, it's at least atypical in that respect. But I, I think that it's a good explanation of why yeah. that character is so compelling. Um, so right. there's a couple of things, right? So you made me think about a lot of different things. Um, first off, one of the things you said when Fring was describing the example story of the gunshot guy was um, the, the, the suspense isn't quite there because we don't even know who he is. And at that point, does that not reveal that there's another component that's necessary beyond suspense? For example, like, you know, his, his name is Bob, that's all we know. And he's like, you're going to die between one and three days from now. And the film is just him on his computer, and then he gets shot. It's like, someone could be like, that was suspenseful as hell. I had no idea when that gunshot was coming. But then you're like, well, we don't even know who he is. And at that point, I would probably come in and be like, so you're saying that characterization is, or character is more important than the suspense then, right? Because it comes first. Or is it that you consider suspense to involve a lot more components than might be assumed from just like the emotional experience? Because the other thing I was going to ask, was like, what if just we had another person in this call right now who said, well, I think comedy is is key. I think that we always need a comedic element. We always need someone to be able to make light of the situation. We need that because emotionally it's something that, uh, I don't know, whatever reason they want to come up with. Or they did the same thing for th thrilling. Like, it needs to have a thrill element to it. Or horror. Chimp, chimp sidekick. Every movie needs one. Absolutely. That's so, true. Um, so I, I'm I, curious I why suspense gets to be the king in that regard. Okay, so the, the way the way that I interpreted the question is, what's the most important element of screen or like storytelling to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, it, I I can't really know what it is to other people. Now, it's the most important thing to me because, like I said, when I write, this literally replaces plot as the thing that I care about. The, like when I when I think about um, possible things, like possible plot events or character developments, um, I'm immediately going back to. The questions that it's evoking in the audience's mind and this is like the primary thing that i think about when i'm writing um it's more important basically than everything else um and I, I think that the absence of suspense is a good explanation of why a lot of things um that i perceive to be deficit are deficit is because they haven't built an adequate amount of suspense so like it it's the most important <coughs> to me because it's the thing that i personally think the most about it's the most crucial thing to my writing process right um, but in, in terms of other people, I mean, you know, I, I, well, I can't know. I, my, the idea isn't like this is the best way to write, right? It's just, you know, it's my way to write. We're, um, I assume all of us have been trying to avoid getting too circular, like ending with, I, I think this thing is the most important because I think it's the most important. We're, um, I'm curious what makes you choose suspense rather than any other option. And uh, do you encompass characterization within suspense? Oh, man. Uh, okay, I'm trying to avoid a... a it's a very long explanation for that. So <laughs> as you might have guessed from having a, a formalized definition of art, I actually have a lot of formalized ideas. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is pretty all encompassing. I'm going to try and boil it down so that we don't end up on a 30 to an hour minute tangent. Um, but I think that when I, when I analyze a story or when I think about writing, um, there's four primary things that I'm thinking about. And you could roughly say that they're means of communicating information and then effects of that communication, right? So plot is a way that you communicate something but the point isn't really the plot itself the point is well how does the plot allow you to express themes or how does the plot allow you to advance character how does the plot allow you to evoke emotion um, how does the plot allow you to build suspense in the audience's mind stuff like that the plot's a vessel through which other things happen um, and when you're talking about the effects that you have on the audience um, the main one people usually think about is uh, emotion and it's kind of hard to talk about because I mean art is hard to talk about right but everybody knows you know everyone has a sense really of when a film is particularly emotional right um there's sort of a, a number of things that i think are really important to try and achieve as goals when you're talking about effects uh, of a of a story you know it's like what what is the story ultimately trying to achieve what, what what do you want to happen in the audience's mind um affecting emotion is one of those things suspense is another one of those things um Basically, the reason that I chose suspense is because of all the different things that I think a story can accomplish. Um, I think that suspense is the one that is most useful to focus on 
uh, when you're writing, or at least most useful for me to focus on. Um, and I, I think that it it tends to drive everything else, right? So if you aren't invested in something, if you don't have a sense of suspense for what's going to happen, um, your emotional investment is going to be blunted. For example, if you if you Should are you, very would you say very that investment is more important then than suspense. Well, I mean, su suspense and investment are going to be almost identical in the way that I'm using the term. So, like, I, I, I'm, I'm using suspense to mean that the, the movie has put a question in your mind and is teasing at it. That's basically my conception of suspense. So, any form of investment is going to be suspense in the way that I'm using the term. Right. You can kind of consider that theme as well, though, right? If it's putting a question in your head. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> they're both cognitive experiences, so they're under the same category. But I, I would right. consider themes to be a, a bit different. Are there like, non-cognitive experiences? Uh, cognition is distinct from affectation. So yeah, it's what do you mean? I, I mean those are those are areas of psychology. So uh, approximately speaking, um, the emotional experience of a film is what it makes you feel. The cognitive experience is what it makes you think about. And you could, if you wanted to, say they're the same thing. But I think there's, you know, it, it, if a film makes you feel angry and a film makes you think about the nature of power and how it relates to society, I think those are dis meaningfully distinct, right? Yeah, so I, I don't think that the emotional the process that I have leads to like. The, the anger, right? Yeah, they're, they're all connected. Um, I, I'm just saying that you need, you need to be able to uh, break down parts of the experience to talk about it. Um, but, I mean, you know, obviously all these things are going to be connected. And, and these things are going to be caused by plot and character and all, all, all of that, right? Um, but you, you yeah. kind of need to separate, you, you need to assign things their own words to try and understand um, things, things that might be distinct in some way. So to me anyway, and this is... By the way, one of the things I've thought about less is is themes, but I typically take I typically think of themes as something like communicating something um, it, it, that you would sort of see in the form of an essay, where you're saying like um, maybe you're talking about revenge, right? And it's like, well, here's what the movie has to say about the nature of revenge or the nature of love, right? Or um, I I anything like that. When I think about the the themes in a film that I'm really connected to. Um, I can always sort of write an essay of what I think it's trying to get me to think about it related to that particular thing. Um, an emotion isn't like that. I can't like write emotion about like the anger that I feel when I watch Kill Bill and see, you know, um, the woman's uh, house get burned down, right? It's just a, vis a visceral feeling of, of anger. It it's not like necessarily about something, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it it like I said, this is, it it's, very complicated to try and uh, uh, establish all of this because it's like a, a whole thing. Um, but yeah, I, like I, I think of suspense as being sort of part of the cognitive experience of basically having anticipation for the resolution of a question that's been established, right? So, I mean, you could think of it as sort of the... Um, I think uh, broadly that could be applied to almost everything in storytelling though, right? Yes, yes, it, absolutely. It, 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 the way I use suspense it can be applied to themes or characters or plot or anything. That's sort of what I'm getting at. It's way more broad. Most people just use suspense in a very narrow sense. I use it in a very much more broad sense. Yeah, to, at first to, I to thought do, you were referring to just an experience, specific emotionally experience, so like events in films where, or stories where we're, we're uncertain of a particular thing, as opposed to... You know, it sounds like what you're saying is it, it, it can be a part of basically every single thing that happens. Yeah. So like if, uh, I mean, so themes usually aren't just established and static. There's an exploration there, right? So you could have the mm -hmm. beginning of the establishment of a theme and then you're wondering where the movie's going to go with it. That would be sort of the same thing. Um, you could have a character that has their backstory established, but there's a, a component missing um, that could drive you to wonder what, what, what exactly is the missing component, especially if attention has been drawn to it then reasonably speaking, most of the audience is going to be thinking, what's this thing that's purposefully been left out? It could be like a mystery, like in Lost, where they're like, oh, what's in the hatch, right? Um, I mean, it, it, it could just be about, like like I said, is Iron Man going to die? I mean, it, it, basically any question that you would have that that um, you would expect to be in the mind of the audience based on the um, elements of a story would be categorized as suspense in the way that I'm using the term. It's just like, what are you, basically like, what are what are you anticipating? Maybe anticipation is a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. hmm. I would have used anticipation just to get it out of the weeds of the word suspense and what people link that to generally. Sure, maybe maybe that's better. Because I guess anticipation anti and petition system since has yeah. it it's that seems like the kind of thing that can be super duper broad, 
because you can anticipate practically everything. But the yeah. idea that every like the, the idea of a really good, well-written episode of Peppa Pig is suspenseful is like, yeah, I guess in a way, but that's not really you kind of it's almost like you want to reserve that word for Certainly certain things colloquially described that way. Like, yeah. Yeah, but it's like, yeah. Ooh, I, mean, I can't wait to see what happens to, to old Peppa, you know? I mean, the, the word isn't, isn't really what's important. It's just that, like, mm -hmm. um, people you people could theoretically... That's conspicuous if you don't feel suspense watching Peppa Pig. I don't know that no, I No, I, I do. <laughs> All episodes of Peppa Pig are good. I should have just said, I didn't need to qualify yeah. the good ones, I guess, really. Is. Yeah, exactly. That's my point. Yeah, kind of, kind of what I'll, I'm getting at. I don't want any Peppa Pig bad mouthing in this house. Yeah, Kind of what I'm getting at is that when people are watching a movie, you could reasonably wonder about anything, but almost everyone is going to have pretty similar questions, right? Um, and and I, I think that the, that's a lot of what drives sort of the engagement, um, immersion, and suspension of disbelief, particularly, is uh, uh, sort of being fascinated by these questions and, and, and really invested in them, right? And if you weren't invested in, in the question like, you know, is Iron Man going to die, for example, um, could you really be all that invested in the story generally and it's like probably not you know your, your investment in these questions is almost perfectly correlated to your investment in the story mm -hmm. um is everyone comfortable with moving on to question two sure. <laughs> question Sorry, two yeah. the second question I nice <laughs> I have... anyone need to grab extra provisions for our journey into question number two Oh man, three hours on one question. <laughs> I was about to say, like, maybe we could speed this up. It's like, oh, fuck it. It'll take as long as it takes, and you are all welcome to leave whenever you want. I have <laughs> randomized once again. This is our order. Um, oh boy, I'm first up. Question two Fringy, what is your favorite story of all time and why? Um,. So I don't tend to settle on a favorite story because it usually seems to oscillate between um, different stories. Um, but I think the one that I've chosen to talk about, one of my favorite stories, is Hot Fuzz. Um, oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, look, you, you, you have a uh, you have both of you just go time. together. So it's okay because metal is locked, <laughs> so he's got plenty of time to he's figure out a different hours. answer. <laughs> you got three hours to think of a different one. Um, so one of the things that I find you could watch really, a new movie in that time, and it could, could be your favorite. Time, yeah. um, when I think about the stories that I really like, um, I often think about the the amount that you were achieving with the time that you have which we were talking about earlier um like how much you're achieving with the idea that you have are you like fully maximizing the potential of this concept with the time that you have and the characters you have and like the actors you have and, and everything like that hot fuzz is like one of the most tightly constructed like films stories pieces of writing just like ever it's it it, it is like unbelievably tight in terms of um <clears throat> how much we're achieving with how little time that we have uh, when you think about that film like the structure and and how like there are so many lines that are that are put in the film that are like reincorporated later on that have like a greater meaning or are recontextualized as a joke later on like the number of recurring lines that just keep popping up again and again and again um the uh the 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 stru like the actual story itself or, like the core plot how despite the fact that it's a really absurd like premise it's all supported with all of the little clues and hints and, and pieces of evidence and things that characters say uh, throughout the film. Like a film where plot and character are like super well interlinked in terms of developing our characters alongside the plot as it's happening. Like using the plot to propel that story, having the little tidbits of everybody's characters inform the plot. Like there are always little clues in the things that they say, the things that they omit, um, like glances, things like that, that are all informing the uh the underlying narrative um it's a film where you know it, it is a comedy and it is like an absurd premise but we are doing meaningful uh things in terms of exploration of character like nicholas angel we got a guy who's always on the job he can never like he, he can never take his mind off the job uh and then he moves to a town where it's all meant to be incredibly mundane but as it turns out it's not like, that's the thing that he's constantly sort of, like, getting nudged towards is, like, ease up, you can't switch off, you know, like, you need to try and relax and unwind. 
but then as it turns out, like his instinct is like really correct. But it's it's like the marriage of him and um I can't believe I'm blanking on Nick Frost's character, Danny. Um uh you know, that those two working together and it's like that fusion of that, you know, ultimately leads to resolving the conflict. Um it's really strong on character, especially with all of the side characters, they're all like super well characterized. Everybody feels so distinct. Everybody says exactly what you expect them to say. Like that's a film that has what? How many speaking characters? Like forty or fifty who like keep showing up all the time, and they're all like incredibly well realized and distinct from one another with their own little jokes. Um, and and I guess you know, like it's a funny movie. That movie's really funny, and if it was like one of the films that makes me think about. Uh, the marriage of comedy and drama and like how you can make it work because I believe that you can make it work and it's probably one of the strongest examples Uh, and then of course from a filmmaking standpoint it's awesome like the camera angles and the visual jokes and the sound design oh love that movie love hot fuzz and I like how it's all held together but by that basic idea of a greater good right because the you have this yeah the antagonist is Mm -hmm. this cult collectivist town who are are literally in robes yeah, exactly. And it's like, when when is it good to come in and have that third act where you basically shoot everybody in town? Yeah. <laughs> right. exactly. It's like, well, if the whole it's town worked. is full of brutal cult murderers, then I guess it's okay to have that bad boys style action third act, which is well, just the, spectacular, the mo- right? The movie is hyper subversive in that regard. How like for the because it's you know it's meant to be like a, a a parody, but also kind of a celebration of like dumb action movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's an incredibly intelligent action, dumb action movie. <laughs> like, really, right. Hot Fuzz is like so well written and and so deliberate. Like, everything is so deliberate. And I feel like that's a common thing that you see in really great stories is a sense of deliberateness. Like, Twelve Angry Men has a like strong. It's it's very deliberate. Like the decisions that are made in terms of like who's going to say what and when and how things relate to each other. Saving Private Ryan is super deliberate in terms of like its structure and what it's trying to go for uh, as a story and like who does what and the, the, and like the order that the scenes play out. I think that's just like a really good sign of, I don't know if I necessarily describe it. I guess you could like a confidence, a, a confidence in the story that you're trying to tell uh, yeah. that generally you achieve with like a lot of work. It seems like a lot of thought was put into it. Um, and you can see that in hot fuzz with all oh, the yeah. jokes, recurring jokes. It's, it's just that, that I'm pretty sure they spent a year and a half working on that script, and I can totally believe it. <laughs> based oh, yeah. On, uh, yeah, I can't like, remember really the length project. of time. I just know that Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg basically locked themselves in a cabin and just like worked the whole thing out on a like I not a whiteboard, do but like again and again, one of those again and again. giant pads okay, yeah. of paper on like an easel. They're just yeah. like, let's just build this brick for that, brick. That, that recent show that I feel like. Oh man, like I'm pretty sure Hot Fuzz has like several Chekhov's guns, but the one that immediately comes to mind is the swan. We set up the swan, but there is a swan on the loose in the town. <laughs> and then, in that first chase scene when he's chasing off dude stealing in this shot. Yeah, they see this he sees the swan. He chooses not to go for the swan to get the bad guy. And that swan saves the day in the car. It's really <laughs> good. And there's so many of those throughout the film. Like well, the, and, the the fascist hag joke, really f- fuck off, grasshopper. That's yeah, <laughs> on theme That's too. Um, the it balance between theme. work and play. This throughout yeah. that yeah. film, yes, absolutely represented yeah. him fully by Simon as a character, yeah, or Simon Pegg's character, but also um, yeah. Butterman's wife being the big motivation for him, and he leads like everybody that she put everything into her work. She failed, and so she killed herself. And so I think now both we're both those fail at that work. Yeah. Both those leads at either end of that theme, like you have Simon who takes his job way too seriously, and then the other guy doesn't take his job seriously but enough. They both and they learn kind from of, each other. They achieve a yeah. balance at the end, yeah. Danny learns about what it means to take seriously, and, and, and Angel learns like to let loose sometimes, and that's fully epitomized when he returns into town with the goddamn angel wings for the shotguns <laughs> <laughs> on his little horse. And, yeah, oh, and, and I mean, you know, we haven't talked about much, but like, it it needs to be said, like one of the funniest movies like ever. <laughs> it's it is one of the funniest <laughs> yeah, movies ever made. Do you have any criticisms yeah. of it, Frankie? I don't. I love that movie. 
Uh, I, I guess I wouldn't say that it's like perfect because there's probably like one thing that doesn't follow. But like, it's I, it's pretty airtight. It's like all set up and I mean. all payoff. Yeah, it's so tight. The best you could do is like, man, in this shootout, it's I guess it's lucky that nobody hit like the, the good guys. But I mean, that super trained. Wow, like <laughs> Angel is super trained professional cop, and it's set up at the beginning of the film that he's really good at this. Like even yeah. having to get into fights and confrontations with people, like. But again, I, I don't give a shit about that. Like that movie is so fucking good. I, have a bit I of love a that movie. Pet peeve in storytelling. It's not happened that many times, but Hot Fuzz does it. Uh, faking out someone being dead. Um, right. It annoys me. So like, D Danny getting shot was like incredibly moving to me. So I was like, how? What a fucking tragic ending. Yeah. Um. And then they're like at the graveyard with with Angel. And I was like, "Yep, there he is. He's gone. That fucking that, sucks." That over the shoulder shot where he's obstructing the first name, or yep, they I do th that too. And then they're like, mm -hmm. "No, just kidding. It was his mom." And you're like, "Oh, fuck off." <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like tongue in cheek, though. Like, I don't know. I'm sure it was. But like yeah. it's kind of cringe on purpose. Well, yeah, but people. Hey, go, look, that's what I'm saying. It's not. It's, it's a pet peeve. Cringe. It's a pet peeve. Yeah. Right. I mean, if that's all you could pull from well, a movie, you can't, you can't really, really say that. Well, so okay, perspective, can you? Right? Yes, I can. How the fuck did they forget about him? The guy with that gun. What? The... He was the the town. What? Uh, like the fake out death is bad for a. Yeah, because that's what a, that's uh... what's led. The, that's how. Oh well, not for the fake out specifically, but the that event wouldn't have happened had they not forgotten about. I forget his name. <laughs> Blunderbuss guy. Um. <laughs> But they actually account for him when they spray the cameras, so we can't see shit. Um, but they also forgot that he exists when they take everybody in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. Because they knew exactly who to go for uh, in the town. They knew yeah, they shouldn't have forgotten wanted. him, and by doing so, it leads to quite a dramatic moment, which, you know... Like... Yeah. But hey, if that's the worst that there is... Like, no, that's there. the thing. Hoffa's <laughs> is, I think... Yeah. Usually, it's in my top five. I don't know if it's higher than that. It's in my that. top five for sure. It's definitely in my top five. But I, like I said, I tend to oscillate between films in terms of figuring out what the best one is. How does it compare to the other uh, installments of the trilogy? I think it's considered it is the best slightly one. Slightly better than yeah than Shaun of the Dead. I think it's I think it's the best one. Hence why I picked. World's it. End is <laughs> still cool, everyone. <laughs> World's End it. is good. Underrated. I still only have seen it once, but I really. Well, like it's it. it's only underrated because everyone is comparing it to Hot Fuzz. Yeah, which is unfair. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> to pull up Hot Fuzz. Compare it to uh, compare it to most other films. You yeah, doing compared way to most better. Other films, right. Um. But yeah, those are my notes. Please write more, Edgar. Wright. <laughs> well, yeah. I haven't even seen. Well, last you know what? Solo, but... uh, I don't know if Rags. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but uh, Red Light Media did the like. Part one of movies they saw in the year that they didn't cover for a main video. I've not seen it yet. No. They mention, um, is it late night in Soho or last night in Soho? Last, last night. night in Soho. Right. Yeah. They mention that, and Jay and Mike like both agree and explicitly say got the same problem as Baby Driver, where uh, production wise, just top notch, nothing but appreciation, but story and characters. Not not fantastic, and then they both say like he needs to work with Simon Pegg more, and I was like, oh no, because I haven't <laughs> oh, seen it, man. but I was hoping it would be good. Yeah, I haven't heard great mm. things about it. It hit a Kinda lot of amazing. disappointment, but I've already seen from the trailers that like the the production is going to be impressive. It seems like the concept is carrying it for sure. All uh, right, okay, so that's my answer. I know basically nothing about it myself. I didn't so, mind the characters in Baby Peg Driver, Pegasus but they were kind of lacking substance. Sneakers. sneakers? What? I'm sorry, say, say that one more time, Jay. You can't work with Simon Pegg because Simon Pegg is busy working on Truth Seekers. Oh. Truth Seekers well, is no, poor Truth shit. Seekers got canceled, they got cancelled, so. we're fine. It did? Thank <laughs> yeah. God. Oh, thank God. I haven't seen it, so I can't... It's oh, no. horribly <laughs> bad. It is. It is <laughs> dog Why shit. Why did we end up watching that? Did we just like, go like, hey, Simon Pegg, Nick Cross could be cool. Yes, that's what our thought was. <laughs> what our thought was. However, we ended up watching it the whole way through, and it's like the worst show. <laughs> yeah, we watched well, the first I mean, season. Know, one of and the it's worst terrible. shows. Terrible. Malcolm McDowell was the New only season. thing we liked in it, I think. And even then, it wasn't full. Which show? It was so. Bad. I mean, like, I Truth mean, like, seekers. It even managed to impress me 
how much what it was that? wasting its premise. It's like, um, yeah, kind like of. we weren't invested in the um, in the numbers radio Anything. station that played random numbers, but the way they paid it off, we were like, man, you you wasted that. Like, we didn't yeah. realize we didn't realize <laughs> that there was potential for it to go to a cool place until it didn't, and we we're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the premise is like I think internet repairmen who double up as like sort of ghost hunters. That's a cool yeah. idea. Yeah, but um, it's shit. Anyway, yeah, when <laughs> um, we told isn't you that, isn't that the plot of Half in the Bag? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, but whatever, whatever you thought in your head when we told you that premise a second ago, it is better than what the show yeah. actually does. I promise you. Damn. Yeah. It is. It is hard to. Stay. Oh, by the way, it's supposed to be a comedy, but it's extremely. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is supposed to be a comedy. I can tell. Definitely supposed to be. It's a comedy. just very unfunny. Oh, that's there was shame. nothing funny about it. Nope. Alrighty, so it's full of lamp shading as well. I remember that. I figured when when Isn't someone clever, someone out an answer for this, that I was like, I'm gonna have to try and expand a little bit beyond just. Uh, picking a, a film or something because I was like, this might have very well might be picked by somebody else. So I was like, hmm, how, how will I go about this? And I just figure I'll get it out of the way. Um, Buffy and Angel put together. That's probably my favorite story. Um, which shouldn't surprise anybody. But we'll discount that because of the fact that I'll be explaining it in detail to Rags and Metal and Jay one day. I don't know when. <laughs> and that'll all be recorded and then sent to you guys. So you'll get all of that at that point. Um, for now, though, I'll just use some backups and talk about, like, why they they hit hard as it, stories, I guess. Because I feel like, why is it that Breaking Bad, like, works so well and is so beloved and high high regarded? And it's like, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably because it's an extensive, like, character study that's incredibly well detailed and takes you from X to Y with one person in a way that feels as though it could be representative of real life. Um, I find it, this especially works well with any character that you, at any point in the story, look back and go, oh shit, they probably wouldn't have done this if they were the person from season one or episode one or something like that. Um, but you don't feel like it was a jarring experience to get to where you are now. And so it's like, at that point, I think immersion won and you, 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 you've got nothing but impressive things to say and to look back, you try and figure out each of the notches that turned them from one thing to the next. Uh, obviously, with Walt... From, uh, I guess I try and be vague just in case because it's forever recommended to basically everybody buy everybody Breaking Bad seasons one through five. Just um, the premise is, a, is a, it's a oh well. I was gonna say I guess there's another seven seasons for you to watch if you want to do Better Call Saul. Um, All right, yeah. You don't need Which, to. We've and we've talked about oh, that, right? But I, I, I like it. it. I just don't know what the point is yet. <laughs> I guess I'll yeah. find out in the last season. Um, so yeah, like the you, the, the, what a premise too. Like a uh, mild mannered chemistry teacher who's like Ned Flanders, is going to die unless he can afford the money to pay for his cancer treatment, and he realizes that his knowledge and expertise could be used to create meth, and he creates a meth so pure that many people are after it. And it's just like wow, all right. And unlike Truth Seekers, this is one that you get told what the fuck it is, and you're like, wow, they come through on that premise pretty much 100%. I don't know what else they would have explored that what we would have, like, what did yeah. they miss, you know? Um, but yeah, I think the the fundamental, though, is just experiencing everything with Walt, him turning from one person to another. Um, it's often brought up in terms of how we can root for him for almost all of the seasons, despite the horrible things that he ends up doing. And it's just like a fascination to think about how protagonists work or what it takes for someone to root for a, a person. But I think core to it is understanding almost every decision he makes and understanding him as a person. And so uh, TV shows have this ability to be able to do that more so than a lot of movies do in terms of we have so much time with him. We see him make so many decisions that we can fully understand exactly what's going to happen when he goes into different circumstances or um, what may happen as a result of things happening to him. But it's probably worth mentioning that um, there's this lot... So, like, you know, I love a big, long character arc, but then it's like, well, there are other favorite stories that'll have elements that aren't even to do with that. And one I definitely wanted to bring up, that I've talked with, uh, I think, Fringy quite a few times, is um, stories that, like, 
run two stories at once, uh, they super fucking impress me. Examples include I Am Mother, Ex Machina, Sicario, and Shutter Island. I'm trying to think of more off the top of my head, but I think we'll just leave it there. That's good enough. Those are good um, examples. They're films that you watch them the first time, and you can take them in for exactly what they are, but then you watch them the second time, and you can see there's a whole other fucking movie playing. Um, and it's beyond impressive to me. I, uh, I always get a big ol' mental boner thinking about all the components that have to run simultaneously to mean X and Y, so that when you go through it, um, you can be oblivious to the second film, but then when you just switch filters when watching it, you can also see a whole other thing. I suppose, um, an example to go with... I'm trying to think of the one that I would want to... Has anyone, everyone seen Ex Machina here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so that... I think someone said they haven't. Oh, wait, who? That was, that was me. You I fucking lose <laughs> That's okay. You know what? Uh, we don't need to do that. I'll, I'll find a different way. So, just Get that, out. um... The, the drama <laughs> is built... Leave. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> the drama and the suspense is built in one particular direction, but then, like, someone on some fucking forum, or maybe something clicks in the end credit scene, or whatever else, and you go, wait, was that that the whole time? And then you watch it again, and you're like, oh, fuck, all of this slots completely differently, and all of the big payoffs actually mean these other things. These people won, not those people. Or this event has now happened, not the one that we thought. Um... And if it all lines up and maintains continuity with both interpretations, it's the kind of thing we were talking about earlier with achieving multiple things at once. That's the level of achieving something with your story that fucking super impresses me. Yeah. Um, the amount of fucking quality work that would have to go into it. And then, because my answer's getting too long, so I'm going to try and stop here, I also love deconstructions at their best. Too long? I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I Are you okay? stories that are super self-aware of the place they exist in and they simultaneously comment on that while also having just a normal story as well. That's almost like a um, running two filters at once again, but I guess the example I'll give is Unforgiven. Just one of the best stories ever made while also being yes. a big ol' commentary on the genre it belongs to. It's really fucking cool. Yeah, this, this, I that's... I still gotta watch that. A selection of my favorite stories and why, but there's still a shit ton more. I just figure that we'll get through a lot of them by talking to other people, which means who is next? Oh, Mr. Rags. Oh my goodness. Ooh. What so is your favorite most... story and why? This was the most difficult one for me, because like Fringy said, it's hard to pick a favorite story. It's kind of like what's your favorite yeah. song or what's your favorite, a lot of like food. A lot of the times that's just... Sort of, it's just going to change over time. It's going to be what you, in that moment, sort of feel is, you know, the best for whatever reason. So I'm yeah. going to go ahead and go with a pretty safe answer, but I think it's one that's um, certainly accurate to how I feel about it. But going to go with the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, I think there's something about the trilogy that I certainly love, and it definitely has a special place in my heart in terms of when I saw it, what age I was at, and the impact it kind of had on me. And it was one of the things that I, it, I think it was my go-to answer when we were asked on EFAP, if we could go back and experience something for the first time, what would it be? Um, like a piece of media. Mm -hmm. I think that was like my go-to answer was seeing that again. I still remember being in the theater and how much it just took me to another world. Uh, but it's a very broad movie in terms of the things that it tells you, the things that are contained in it. It isn't, and it, it both is and isn't a focus story, whereas there's a lot of stuff. It's it's like bundling up a whole bunch of things in your arms, kind of. It's bringing it all together. It's got great characters. It has incredible world building in the way that it presents this world to people. I think it's got a good structure, a slow one, you could say. Um, it, it definitely takes its time, but I think it's to its benefit. Um, the, the art direction and the music, uh, it, it all just comes together in this incredible, greater than the sum of its parts movie uh, that is only one of three. And I, I, it's my favorite of the three. I, th I, 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 I just love it. Um, the lessons that it teaches are very timeless. And it teaches a variety of messages. How you should treat other people. How you should even look at other people. The things that are more important in your life. Um, how you should be around others at the expense of yourself. 
um, you know, and your willingness to make sacrifices um, and what you should be willing to do to protect things that you love. Um, I, I really like this film's ability to portray a world as alive and organic in the sense that a lot of movies take place in a setting. A lot of the time it's science fiction and a lot of the time it's fantasy where you don't really feel like this world is real. You don't feel like it's a place where people could actually live. A lot of the times it just feels like, unfortunately, a bunch of movie sets and a bunch of empty landscapes, and you don't really believe this is a place you could go to. But yeah. in so much of the, be it the differences in architecture between the, the, the you know, in Hobbiton and the Shire and Moria and in the Rivendell and things like that it's all every place has its own not just a different look but there's something about their construction and the time it takes to get there and the events that take place there that make all of these the these locations seem so very distinct and different like they take place in different worlds um, you can believe that we start out in the shire and things are great and things are wonderful and we get this grounding of what is good, what should be protected, what should be fought for. And it gives us a sense of suspense, we should say, of what could be lost if we fail our quest. Uh, I, I don't think it's an it's accident or it's I don't think it's an accident. And I don't think it's bad pacing that P, the, you know, the aspect that we spend a lot of time in the Shire to set things up. It is grounding in your subconscious the idea that this is the world as it should be, and this is what we have to lose. And then you contrast that with places like Moria. Moria being almost like a dark, it's like a dark version of the Shire in a sense, where it's a different place architecturally. The bounties of this place are different than the bounties of the Shire, right? Where the Shire is a lot more, I guess, understandable in its simplicity and its, its folkiness. You know, the, the minds of Moria have a, have a more focus on like a bit more industrial. It's dark. It's a different world. But you see the halls, you see the, the bones of the dwarves that live there. And you could imagine for yourself that, oh, this could be like the Shire if those bad things happened. Right. This is mm -hmm. a place that was once great. And it, you know, it descended into chaos and death. And it's dark, it looks totally different, and it, it does a good job at establishing, you know, the evils that can exist within this world. Um, you see the beauty and the, the, the I'm going to say use the right word, the naturalist. I don't want to say naturist, because the elves are not naturists. They're naturalists. Very important distinction for everyone to remember in your life, never go to a naturist place. Um, but this... The, the the world of elves, men, dwarves, hobbits, they're all distinct. You feel like you go on a journey. We don't just get to new places and we're told to accept, oh yeah, th this is in this world. It's just a, it's just a different place. You know, we're, we're just here now. You never feel like, oh, I guess we're just in a different spot now. There, there is a good focus. It, it gets mocked a lot for you just, oh, we're just walking around. It's a lot of walking. But I think the walking pays a lot of service to the richness of the world and establishes how far you've gone and how far you have to go. And... I mean, I'm, I'm waxing on and on. We'll get to characters later because there's a character in this who's the answer to another one of my uh, questions, as you might have guessed. I agree. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, do you mean to say like the points you're making don't apply as much to the other two movies? Like, are you singling out Fellowship of the Ring in particular here? No, like I'm they it's tough to pick which one is my favorite. Well, I guess it's easy because I already know the answer. But you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. The Fellowship of the Ring is my favorite of them. Um, but it's really a matter of taste. They're all easily contenders. And I think they all execute this very well. Um, I, 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 just, I guess I just think that the Fellowship of the Ring has a special place in my heart. And I, haven't, I didn't go through the trouble of really trying to examine it too deeply to see which one really is the best or which one executes these ideas the best. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel safe to say that everything that I've said is certainly accurate of Fellowship of the Ring, and it can certainly also be applied to the other two. Um, mm -hmm. Fellowship is I, cozy. It is. Yeah. Yes, it is a cozy film. Uh, even even with the Balrog and Moria and Almond Head, it is a very cozy. There, there's a meme that I saw not too long ago 
of of Jim from the office and he's got the board right and the, the, the little whiteboard and it says that when we were young we all wanted to be Legolas because he was super cool and he was a capable fighter and he's amazing and then as we got older we realized we wanted to just be one of the hobbits where we're left alone to live our happy peaceful lives and that that meme is is certainly very true of a lot of us Fuck certainly that. as we get older Oh my god. I'm gonna fly around on fire, go blow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. But it, it is, yes, it's very cozy. I want to live as, you know, I, I it'd be great to be a hobbit, to live that life where you don't have to worry about, you know, just all the pain and suffering and all that awfulness and you your your concerns are very I don't want to say not materialistic, but they're very um they're it's it's very family oriented and simple in a way mm -hmm. you don't have you know stock markets and social media of that sense you you have it's 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 simple and it's it it's do you know who cincinnatus is no mm. no cincinnatus was a is an old roman guy and he was a, a great military commander right and he, he lived a very simple life and he did his farming and all that sort of thing. And then when Rome needed him to, to fight battles and win wars, he accepted his duty to go out and fight and win battles for Rome. And then after the battles, they said, oh, my gosh, Cincinnati, you're so great. You should keep leading and you should keep doing all this political stuff. You're so great. You're so wonderful. Bona, bona. And he said, no, 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 no. I want to go back to my simple life and things that matter to me and my family and all that stuff. And that is um that's that's kind of the feeling i get with a lot of this you know the shire stuff it's very very appealing to me which is odd considering how different it is from my own life with how connected i am to the world and the internet and not social media but sort of you know and the, the youtube stuff and doing the podcast it seems well i don't know i feel like we could have a show in a, in a, in a shire tavern where we talk about stories and things like that i feel like oh, we yeah. could do it in an alternate universe mm. we're all just a bunch of you know, fat, happy hobbits, you know, hanging around, drinking with our bare feet and our pipe weed and things are just nice and simple. But uh, I, I'll stop talking. A few people is... wanted to highlight, though, like, didn't you take any issue with when Gimli wanted to kill Sam and Frodo? Oh, uh, well, well that's that, yeah. that's in the Return of the King, and we won't discuss that. We're just trying to focus on the good things in life <laughs> without right, fair enough, Gimli's yeah. horrific hobbit hate. God, when when does he try to kill him? I forget. <laughs> Oh, that, that's that's, <laughs> that a, a that's a reference to the greatest EFAP. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, you should watch EFAP ninety three. Yes. Okay. It is amazing. Is that the cinematic Venom one? That is. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Alrighty. Oh, no. According to the randomizer, the next person to answer the question of. What is your favorite story of all time? If that was that even it? What's your fuck it? Duma. <laughs> <laughs> so w when I started thinking about this, I thought it was going to be hard, and then I just immediately had an answer, and <laughs> I I'm sticking with it. So my answer is Inglorious Bastards. Um, right. As as I was uh, alluding to earlier, I think it is like without even anything else coming close, the most suspenseful film I've ever seen. Like particularly the farmhouse sequence, the sequence in the bar, and the climax are just like they are spectacularly suspenseful. It's pretty cool um, that film has two of the most cited suspense scenes in like the history of film at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I so I, I started working on a video about specifically suspense and inglorious bastards, and I put it off because I realized it, it would need to be like two hours long to really do it any justice. And I didn't have time to do it at the time. Oh, dude, um, it, I don't know if you're the same. It's but incredible. Like, crippling like removal of making projects when you feel like you can't do them justice if you love them that much you know <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's it, it's kind of like that like i i just wanted it to be a short thing uh, sort of laying out more concisely what i said earlier and then it, applying it to like the farmhouse scene in glorious bastards but i realized it's just it's just not doing it any justice like the film is so spectacularly suspenseful and it, here's the thing is that those are the three sequences people always talk about but as I watch the film more, I, I even appreciate sort of the suspenseful elements in like the Shoshana and Zoller plotline. Right. Um, I mean, it really just is. I mean, I've seen a lot of movies. It is without question the most suspenseful film I've ever seen. Um, the characters are more of a mixed bag. Um, I think Londa mm -hmm. is like easily one of the best villains ever. 
like maybe the best. I, I, I think it's a, it would be a reasonable argument to say he's like the best villain ever if someone made that argument. I don't know if I would say that, but he's he's a better villain than he's, Hitler. I <laughs> in that movie, yeah. Oh my god! Everyone um, who was waiting for the rags, Hitler bingo. There you go. <laughs> oh my god! I wasn't go. even thinking about it. Bingo. Oh no! You were supporting fascism earlier. So. Oh no! Oh, yeah, it's so, all coming mm-hmm. together. Yeah, one of the one of the um, interesting things about the film is that, like I said, I don't think that the bastards actually have much individual character. Um, I think they behave more as a unit, and like you can say things about them individually, um, but most of what I would say comes from supplementary material. Like I know about deleted scenes and stuff from the script and, and shit like that that sort of fleshes them out. But in the actual film, there's not. They mostly sort of behave as, as a cohesive unit, which is sort of an interesting thing. Um, but the the part of the, the the like character side of the film that I find really fascinating that I never see anyone talk about is Shoshana and Zoller. Um, and there's just so, like so I saw I saw it opening night and it was like the best theater experience I've ever had. It's one of the reasons I like it so much. Um, but even on my first watch, I was really fixated on like the bastards and like the plot to kill Hitler and the stuff with uh, Shoshana and Zoller. I was just kind of like, why is this even in the movie? Or it, it's just not nearly as interesting as the other stuff. And that has really changed over time as I watch it more and, and, and think about it more. Um, there's elements of the plot of that plot line that are even more fascinating than the other stuff, because in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a dark romantic comedy. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's like uh, she was a Jew whose family was killed by Nazis. He's a Nazi war hero. And the entire plot line is basically like an inverted romantic comedy um, of him trying to seduce her and her just, you know, trying to basically not get killed um which is really fascinating but there's a lot of other shit going on like in a way aside from being a nazi war hero zoller is kind of like very very attractive in a lot of ways and and he's very polite um you know he has a very high like social status a lot of the ways he carries himself if he wasn't this asshole nazi guy he would be very appealing and something that might be controversial that i think is very well supported by the text is that I think she does have feelings for him. That that's why at the end she goes over and and turns him over and ends up getting shot herself. It's like sort of a Romeo and Juliet thing, um, and it, it's just a profoundly um, um, fucked up and dark and interesting plot line that I hadn't even really thought about when I first watched the film. But it's you know it's just it's just all sitting right there. Um, yeah, I, I really I couldn't say enough good things about it. Um, usually I don't. Usually I'm not willing to say that my favorite things are the best things, but I'm pretty close to saying it's <laughs> the best screenplay I've ever seen. It's just amazing. Like the script is incredible. Um, yeah. What do you know. think I, about I, the revisionist aspect of it, taking like a, that period of history and kind of turning it on its head? Like everybody knew Hitler, the way, the way Hitler died, but this was kind of a fantasy rendition. So of like a, what a, if a lot of people... A lot of people don't like it. So I, I saw it with my buddy Travis, and we had this huge argument about this going back years. Um, he's really he's a big uh, military history buff, and he really hates the revisionist aspect of the film. And mm-hmm. I get that. Um, but to me, it's just amazing, right? Because mm-hmm. the world never got to see the end they wanted, which is for Hitler to have his fucking head exploded by you know some Jewish guy <laughs> blowing him apart with a machine gun, which is like basically what everyone wanted to see. Instead, he just sort of slunk off and shot himself in a bunker or some shit, right? It's yeah. very anticlimactic. So like the fact, I, I think that in a way, the ending gives you a catharsis that, that people wanted, right? It's like you, you right. get to see the, the, you know, the fucking bad guy pay for his crimes at the hands of the person who, you know, would be most in a position to dole out justice, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I can't. Again, it, it's like people have different experiences. I understand it's, a, it's a more of a contentious film than the other ones you guys are probably going to mention. There's people that don't like it, and that's perfectly fine with me. But like, I can't tell you how fucking hyped I was when they started shooting Hitler. Like, I, again, seeing it because like I, I, I just, I can't fucking tell you how fucking hyped I was. And like, I, I had gotten a copy of the script Great beforehand. Sense, dude. And I started reading it and I remember like, it was kind of funny because like the first thing in the script is you see feet on grass and I'm like, okay, Tarantino. But like, as I started reading the first lines, I was like, I can't read it. This is, I I don't, spoilers aren't a big deal for me, but I didn't want to spoil it. And I'm so fucking glad I didn't spoil it because like seeing them actually fucking blow apart Hitler. I I really, it's, it's the best theater experience ever. It's not even vaguely close. It was so fucking hype. So people don't like it fair enough, but I fucking love it.
Because I, I've, Inglourious I've known, is one of the best films I've known a decent amount of people who don't like it because of the historical inaccuracy stuff. Uh, they draw that it's disrespectful to what happened back then, and the people they don't want involved. to take Hitler's accomplishment away from him. Not quite. Uh, <laughs> the, the arguments I've heard are included, but not limited to the film. Like demonizes all of Nazis when it was a lot more complicated than that, and that um, oh, no. the amount of you know, I I think there's a conversation to be had there. But do you mean um, do you mean all of Nazi conscripts? Because I feel like there's a difference to be drawn between all of Nazis and all of Nazi. Well, I'm conscripts. definitely not. They're not referring to like all of the high command. They're talking about just the average soldiers and stuff. I was like, well, I don't know, maybe maybe oh, maybe that's a difference in um like well, how I... understanding of the word has changed over time, right? Because to me, that just means like all the people who believed in Nazism were painted to be bad. That's that's just the sentence that I heard there. Well, I, I, I really want to respond to that because I've heard that criticism a lot and I think it's an absolute dog shit criticism. So there's like three major Nazis aside from Hitler that really get sort of fleshed out character, well, aside from Wanda. But I guess, I mean, e e that even reinforces it more, right? So we have, in the scene where they interrogate um, the Nazis, there's one who's like really cowardly and just wants to go back to his mom. It's pretty clearly not like super signed up for this whole nazi nazi shit right doesn't seem super committed to the whole thing just basically wants to be fucking left alone and is happy to like enthusiastically happy to betray them for his own interests then you've got the uh nazi commander who basically stands up to the bastards and gives up his life for the nazis right and it, this is a very similar thing to um what bill maher got kicked off of politically incorrect for it's like, look, you can say a lot of things about this dude, but he's fucking brave, right? And like Bill Maher, for people who don't know, he had a show, uh, like a, a political talk show, and someone called the people who drew the drove the planes into the towers on 9-11 cowards. And he said, listen, you can say a lot of things about them, but they're not cowards. Um, and it's sort of the same thing. Mm. You can say a lot of things about that dude, but he's not a fucking coward. Like he, he puts down his fucking life, right? So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's part of why the movie is interesting is because that is a virtue and it's coming from someone who's, like not just a Nazi, but like a, a a card carrying, completely bought into the ideology piece of shit, right? And then you have mm -hmm. um, uh, Zoller is the person who is probably responsible for the most death, personally on his own hands, and he doesn't even like it. He doesn't like being reminded of it. He doesn't like that he did it. Um, it it's not it, like his backstory isn't completely spelled out, but it's certainly not the case that like it, all of the Nazis are just being completely demonized. I mean, each of them have their own very sort of fragmented experiences of what exactly it would mean to be a Nazi, right? And then you have Landa, who is perhaps the most pernicious of all of these people, the person who is most knowingfully going out into the world to do evil, and he doesn't buy into it at all. He's, he's completely, like, he, he's literally willing to take a bomb, put it under Hitler, and blow them all up, but that's what's going to, you know, empower him the most. So, like, the idea that the Nazis are just this block of evil, it's just wrong. It's just not supported by the text in my opinion. Well, so That's not only <laughs> not only do I think that it's true that the film offers way more than Germans evil, Germans are all Nazis, whatever, than that period. I also don't know that if the film is going to be majority POV from you know, not the Germans, I don't know that that's a, necessarily a problem for the story they're telling. Um if it were true, which I don't think it is. Like, if it were that we only ever see Germans gunned down in, in scenes and that all the Americans hate them and stuff, I'd just be like, yeah, but this is the story of these characters moving through this land at this time. They probably do feel that way. Um, oh, and, and, and there's and there's the Stieglitz, the fucking German who defected and murdered a bunch of Nazi officers, got rescued and is now going to kill them. Like, yeah, yeah I, it's just not supported by the text. Well, but uh, I know that, yeah, the, um, but then there are people who just like literally because it's not how it went in history that it's sort of taking away from the actual people who were involved in what they did and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that's definitely looking way further into it. Like, and, and plus it shuts off so many potentially interesting stories that you can tell about things that are, you know, based well, in... It kind of goes into our. History. We've talked about historical acts quite a bit on, on EFAM sometimes, so very controversial degrees. But the problem I often take with it in many different ways, but one of them is like, how many people know how accurate Braveheart is? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I don't see them I raising mean, this problem with that film, but then I think most people would be like, well, yeah, because Braveheart, wait, is it not accurate? And you're like, hmm. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh -huh. In no, no way, basically. There was a planet Earth. But <laughs> it was like, a Scotland. I would see it I would see it as being So I, I personally would see it as being more of a problem if the movie was presenting itself as historically accurate, but I think it's like really obvious that it's yes. not. For, like it's almost cartoony. 
in, in a yeah. way. Yeah, it's um, clearly so, not oh, to absolutely. Be a like, yeah. I just it's genre. It's alt history to me. Like, and and you might be like, well, what makes yeah. something alt history versus is Saving Private Ryan all history? Because it wouldn't have happened exactly the way that it doesn't. It's like, well, I get. I mean, maybe only that's not in a technicality, <laughs> but not in the way that people mean. Yeah, it, it, if you, if you, it's not quite the way that we would. Because like, Inglorious Bastards literally happen. is extreme. If, re revisionism bothers me when it's like subtle with the intention of being deceptive. Um, with with in the case of Inglorious Bastards, it's like it's having fun and it's building off the knowledge that you know what happened. Now here's this fun movie where we take a sharp left turn. Here's here's what it would look <laughs> like if this happened, yeah. and it's so pulpy and ridiculous, and it's a lot of fun. I agree. Like the revisionism thing in that movie doesn't bother me at all. And the thing well, is, yeah. if someone if that's going to ruin the film for someone, I guess fair enough. Like yeah. like my my ex fiance's mother just wouldn't enjoy violent films. Period. And I'm not really going to argue with her. But I don't think it's a fair to say, well, the movie's violent, therefore it's bad, right? Or say to watch Hostel and say enjoy it at every single scene. Shout at her. Enjoy it. No. Once well, Upon a Time in Hollywood did the exact same thing. It did. Much, with the Manson murders. And I saw people saying, once again, that's disrespectful to the reality of the situation. It's like, well, no, but the no. idea is to pay respect to the people who were... What happened to them, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's an ong that'll be a conversation till the end of time, I imagine. But uh, shall we move to the next in the randomization, Eliza? Or what is your favorite story? The randomization that of Tron. Like an amazing idea. That would be Jay. Hello. Uh, Which so episode of Doctor Who is it, Jay? <laughs> Death I'm comes to time. You silly! Shut up. <laughs> no, I mean, is it Chibnall? There are, well, yeah, it is. It's it's Chibnall. Chibnall. It's the episode that's called Chibnall. It's not out yet. <laughs> Chibnall. It's like it's like Solo, one. but Chibnall. <laughs> Chibnall, a Doctor Who story. A Doctor Who story. Mm -hmm. The 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 um the nude scene really was daring. That's my my favorite part. No, I mean, um, whenever like, of course, uh, I think this has come up already. That like, whenever anyone has asked a question like this, there's always a matter of. Man, there are just so many, you know, um, that choosing one would feel like you're doing a disservice to all the others. So, of course, like I had to, um, I, you know, I, I've just gone with a story that I like a lot. Um, that, that I guess um, to say it would be this story has reached maximum tier for me. That uh, There are stories that I enjoy the same amount, but there aren't any stories that I think I appreciate or, or like more. Um, and there are a load of stories like that for me, but the one I've just decided to bring with me for show and tell is Chronicle, which, um, well, I watched with a metal recently. Yeah, he showed you that film recently, fun. didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Metal, you showed me that film, didn't you? <laughs> that was a good thing yeah. for metal to do. Yeah. I'm glad you did I that. Totally you introduced me to one of my favorite stories of that I've liked since I came out in 2012. <laughs> I just want to highlight, as Jay was answering, someone said, Jay thought Spaceballs was boring and hasn't finished Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> like, you gotta know that before Jay gives the answer. <laughs> Metal created the movie just for you. Yeah, that's true. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we were talking about examples like Hot Fuzz, um, Chronicle isn't, you know, it, 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 it's not um, got... S Hot Fuzz does the thing... Um, oh, what were we talking about? What were we calling it? Where... Um, there's more elements to a story to get right, and there, thereby it's more impressive that that it doesn't have as many mistakes. You know, the juggler who juggles two balls successfully versus the juggler who juggles ten thousand balls successfully but drops three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Chronicle isn't as isn't as complex. It doesn't have as much going on as as something like Hot Fuzz, uh, but everything it does have going on, save for a few exceptions, um, like a few very small exceptions, right? Uh, it nails uh, out of the park, right? Nails it out of the park. I'm making some <laughs> metaphors. Uh, so, um, for me, the thing that I find most impressive in the film is the characterization of the three main characters who are all very well realized within what is in, a, in reality a very short movie. Um, and, you know, there are scenes... 
there they, there are a very limited number of scenes with just these three characters. Uh, but by the end of them, they are more fully formed people than other characters that I think, you know, I've spent a full series of television with. Some some even good series of television. I think I might have uh, seen a character who was less well formed as a person than these three guys who all have very clear motivations, understandings of the world, moral compasses, um, all those kinds of things formed by the end of this story that you uh, and, and you can see all of that in all of them. Uh, you can see how their understanding of the world forms and how that informs all of their decisions. And you can see how they interact with other people and all of these important things to understanding them as a person. Um, and more meaningfully than that as well, I think you get um, a huge understanding of, because you have such a, a, an understanding of who, who these people are as characters, you have an understanding of what it is that makes them change. Uh, and you have an understanding of how, while they may value each other as people, they become, um, towards the end of the story, um, to, at the high point, right before stuff starts going to shit, um, they are basically some of the worst possible people to be friends with each other, not because their relationship isn't uh, a positive one, but just because they have a limited understanding of each other and don't know how to support each other when stuff actually starts going wrong. And ultimately, you have a scene where one character um, has something go wrong for him, that for him is the... Um, that this this thing going wrong is one of the worst things that could have happened to him from his perspective. His life, he feels like in that moment that his life couldn't be going worse. Um, and you have another character who doesn't really understand the perspectives of other people. And for him, this is something that would just, you know, happen to him casually. This is the kind of thing that he's used to and, and he tries this kind of thing a lot, so he fails at this kind of thing a lot. For him, it's no big deal. And he goes to this other character who is in a very mentally fragile position seeing this thing that's caused him this mental, mental fragility, um, seeing it as something trivial that happens to him all the time, and sees laughing at him as a, an appropriate response, uh, and this, other, this character who is being laughed at by one of the only people he considers to be his friends is, is developing an insecurity already that these people aren't really his friends, um, is one of the most earned downfalls of a character from something so small as you were laughing at me at a time that that hurt my feelings mm -hmm. um as well i find the themes of the story to be incredibly valuable to me um which chronicle is all about um and i think it's no coincidence that it's told about high school students who are just ready um, getting ready to enter the world as functional or maybe you know not functional adults um chronicle is all about how these characters these people who have who are like 17 18 years old and don't have fully formed worldviews yet they haven't really had an opportunity to get out in the world and full form a fully formed moral compass um suddenly having power over other people thrust upon them um i think that's it's incredibly valuable to explore what that kind of thing does to other people because you know that's something that happens um and it's it especially you know i've seen this happen to a lot of people where they suddenly find themselves in a situation where moral questions are no longer something that is simply a neat little hypothetical to ask yourself about moral questions are hey i have power over this other person now because i'm an adult with money and a job and who knows you know and, uh, or whatever situation I found myself in that I can have the ability to, and I may not even be considering it, but I do have my, the ability to enact my will over another person. Um, that a story that explores, um, the downfalls that other people have in handling that power. Maybe they don't handle it well. Maybe they do fuck up and other people are the ones who pay the price for their, um, not fully formed moral compass is an incredibly valuable thing, I think, to see explored. And it, it speaks to me personally as something that I take immensely valuable lessons from. I think I've done my little piece on that there. <laughs> I yeah, like I like it. Chronicle too. Um, <laughs> hey, I like that. That's just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like Chronicle <laughs> too. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's nothing to do with the themes, but I, I always just thought it was funny how... I, I, it's a shame that that movie kind of backs itself into a corner with its storytelling method because everything is told through like 
diegetic cameras, if I'm recalling correctly. If you're criticizing the part of the film that I think you are, I totally agree. Uh, like for most <laughs> well, of the don't film, think... the cameras are done like brilliantly, and then there's those few scenes, right? Yeah, I don't. It's not the plot. It's just the, the there's no like God's eye in that movie. It's all through <laughs> like security cameras and like the the well the the plot is contrived sometimes in this in the way that it forces a diegetic camera into the situation in order yeah, to well, like capture really, what's really happening. It's not really plot that's forced there. It's more it's the framing device is forced um, because. You know, in terms of plot, it actually makes no difference that what, like, um, that vlogger lady films really absurdly random stuff. Because, and I do want to, I do want to make it clear, like, as for a found footage film, um, most of the stuff, um, most of the points where a camera is taken out, it makes perfect sense, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, that character would have a camera there. Or, oh, it's interesting that the camera, this character chose to take the camera out at this point, and it informs what we know about them as a person. But then there are these just random ass scenes, particularly involving a subplot with a particular character, where the character, where the camera just appears. It's it's like literally it's it's my main gripe with the yeah. film. Yeah. Um, Aside from that, though, I I really liked the um like kids having powers and then like a mature exploration of that. Like, yeah. oh yeah, it's the awesome. personality. What would they do? I thought that was really. I'd never really seen that done. In For that an way immature version, watch Brightburn, everyone. Oh yeah, it's really. I, I haven't seen that. I yet. thought you were going to say Man of Steel. Same thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Brightburn and Man of Steel. Same, same, same thing. Um, if there was, if it was a crystallized singular element, is it the character work or the themes? Which one do you prefer, Jay? Or do you consider them inextricably linked? Ooh, I don't know. Well, I mean, they are pretty linked, but um. I think that it's the character work that I care about more. Mm -hmm. um, at least at this point, like at least right now, I think they're both quite valuable to me. I think if you did take the, um, I don't know, I don't think you could ever tell the same story and completely separate the themes from it. But if you really worked hard, you know, you made it. It's not about high school students who are just about to uh, get their first taste. You know, it's about I don't know old people now, and you know, you could still have the same characters be all, but you know, you could do loads of stuff to transcribe the themes from it, and I still think it would be an incredibly valuable story to me. But, you know, I do like um, them themes. Someone said you guys must not read much manga, watch much anime, if that was something you've never seen before. I think they're more so commenting on it being done well, not... <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you guys yeah, might Yeah, get fucked, virgin. Because... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things to do kids with powers. I, 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 you know, some of them aren't so great, that's all. Yeah, yeah like The Incredibles. I fucking love that. That's one of the great ones. Hey, that was, that's like, that was like totally a candidate for my other, like for a story that I could have <laughs> so, brought as my favorite. Totally fair choice. choice is the favorite yeah, one. Yeah, that's a... Uh, we already talked about rats in kitchens. Now we're doing kids with superpowers. Might genuinely mm -hmm. be the story that I've seen the most times. Kids with superpowers? Mm -hmm. um, well, Incredibles. Oh. I mean, specifically, I think it might be oh, my that most movie. rewatched movie. Great movie. Yeah. For me, it's The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh at him. Um, <laughs> it's Anal Cock Sluts 3. <laughs> Speaking of Cock Sluts, uh, John, it's your turn. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh... Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Um, so... Uh, when we're talking about the, I was thinking like, what, what does it mean for like a s story to be like the best story? Does it mean that it, it has to have like brevity while having the maximum amount of depth? Like the bib biblical stories would be an example, like something like Cain and Abel or the Tower of Babel, where it, it, it has something really important to say and it doesn't take that long to say it. And it's very fundamental to like existence. You know, but like if we're Whoa. talking about like the best um, movies, uh, I I had Lord of the Rings at the top of my list as well. My um, friends, it's <laughs> copying it's just, rags, huh? Wow. It's Yo, just what's up? Let's yeah, talk about Lord of the Rings. It's just got everything. It's like yeah. dinosaurs. I mean, yeah, you. Tell I, I won't spend a lot of time on it because Rags already no do out outline most. Do. Of it. <laughs> it doesn't have astronauts. It's, it's got spectacle. It's got great <laughs> characters. It's got a hell of a climax. It's <clears throat> like the it's the middle part with the the Helm's Deep fight, the the mm -hmm. a great setup in the Fellowship of the Ring. 
Um, just He's like mentioned the music. All... Yes, of course, the music. You've got your great setup with Hobbiton and then, you know, the call to adventure and leaving and going on the journey and the thick of battle and things. Frodo gets really put through the ringer and he has, you know, Sam there to help him, who's like arguably the real hero at the at the heart of it, because he kind of has the will to help Frodo along when Frodo eventually loses it near the the mountain and just just the the themes of um friendship and adventure and power corrupting absolutely and you've like these terrific visual effects and uh dragons and explosions and big monsters it's just got the whole it's just got this huge palette of like everything you know costumes just colors it's a feast it for the senses and it's just got, it hits all the storytelling beats that you would want. Um, so that's, that's as much as I'll say about Lord of the Rings. I'll, but I'll, to just cover something else, the next one I had on my list was the Fox and the Hound for me oh, personally. Similar to the Rings. Rings. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> not a lot as a kid. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. It's, when Todd is battling the bear, it's like uh, the Balrog on the bridge of Khazad Dum. <laughs> uh, Gandalf, yeah, you shall not pass, and then the log breaks, and they both fall into the water below. Yeah, it, it's yeah. shockingly similar, actually. I think it's a ripoff, actually. <laughs> yeah, mm. and Todd does it, of course, to you know the, to protect his loved ones. It's it's really it's actually it, it's basically the same thing. Hmm. Well, uh, Fox and the Hound is one of the most hardest hitting movies for me. I, it's themes of like, uh being forced to grow up a little quicker than you're prepared to being thrust into like unforgiving nature where everything's trying to kill you. And, uh, and just, um, the, obviously the, the, the theme of friendship and how you have the copper and Todd who are bonded by childhood friendship and they are raised into, different camps where the camps are at war and it's like you are taught you are a dog you hunt foxes that's your job and they kind of fall into their roles but they they know it's kind of wrong but they're doing it anyway but in the end friendship ends up winning over and there's something really moving about that i love that yeah you know todd saves copper and his owner from the bear attack i really do and then, like the guy's about to shoot Hello? Todd, and the copper comes in and oh. and stops him from. <clears throat> Hello, because like at the last Hello. second, he's Hello? decided like, no, this he's my friend. I don't really have any reason to hey, hate him. To the, the hate that I'm supposed to feel for this other person is baseless. Hello? It's a lie. The truth is that we are friends. I can't. And I can't should, hear anybody else. Love right one now. another. Oh, there we go. We're back. Hey, Rags. Um, Hi. Wait, can I hear you? What? What? I, I can hear everyone now. Rags who was cutting I've, out there. I've been hearing every. I've been able to hear everyone this yeah. whole time. Yeah. I yeah. I get, it was localized, but I couldn't hear anyone for a moment. But it seems like everyone's back. So no, well, it was that, you. You were uh, you. No, I I also glitched you. out. Everybody was here. Yeah, like, Fringy. Really. No, I okay. no, I couldn't now, hear it anyone. Still, it still applies. It seems like the majority of us could hear everything fine. The goalpost is getting I heard That's right. John was still <laughs> talking about the film. Oh, okay. Do I, yeah, I was well, just, I was every, everything came through on my end, so the audience heard what uh, John. Yeah. Go back okay, thirty so seconds. Just, uh, discussion of a film with hello, hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello. Yeah. He hello. just cut out, and I, I was, I was like, oh no, go on, don't stop, and then no one said anything, but chat was still scrolling by. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is odd. Okay, well, just to summarize quickly, the themes of uh, chi uh, childhood friendship, bonding through as children, and then two people being raised into separate camps that are at war, and you're supposed to fill it, fall into your role of like, you're the dog, you hunt foxes, you're the fox, you you avoid the, the, the hunting dogs, you are born enemies, but they, they're not really, it's a lie, and that's that they realize that's a lie at the very end and their friendship comes through. And um, I think the most, the most important valuable thing that I drew from the film personally is just like a kid who's forced to grow up quicker than he's prepared 
too, which I think is something that everybody can relate to. You know, as a kid, there's Mm -hmm. some moment in your life, I think for everyone where shit got a little too real and you realized what the real world world actually is (laughs) and, you know, what life might be like as an adult and just that moment of terror washes, washes over you. But like, and Fox and the Hound deals with it in a realistic way, but in the end it's okay. Like he finds a partner and it's like really bittersweet, but it is a, an ultimately a positive ending, I think. And so, yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's hard to ask, asking a film buff what their favorite movie is. It's, it's a that is a tough one yeah. it's like asking a writer like where do you get your ideas from it's like, I, I don't fucking know well, dude like <laughs> i managed to avoid answering the question technically <laughs> so, like... <laughs> yeah but f- for for that for those reasons fox and the hound i would say 2001 for a different reason a space odyssey because of its scope uh, i just I, it has the largest scope out of any movie i can think of where mm-hmm. like it goes literally from the dawn of man to the uh, the the pursuit of the infinite and whatever lies beyond that, and um, doing it in this way that preserves the mis- the mystery of what the infinite is like. It doesn't spell everything out for you with like exposition and like. <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw this. There's a sequel to 2001 called 2010: The Year We Made, Year Contact, we made Contact with John Lithgow, and it's like it does it goes to Hollywood with it, where it starts like. T- uh, telling you too much information and like forcing a bunch of drama um, where the first movie it preserved this kind of mystique of of like you know space and what's what's out there and uh, it, it worked in its benefit that it didn't tell you everything that was happening it had this layer of like this really thick layer of like what the hell is going on especially at the end um so I'll, yeah, I'm rambling too much. I'll stop there. Those are, those are my favorite stories. A couple of them. Sweet. Um, awesome possum sauce. That leaves Mr. Metal Commander lost, yeah. but certainly I mean, least. Uh, hey. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to go bad. with Hot Fuzz, but Free yeah. said everything about it, so I, was, I just did a little thinky think while everyone else was talking. So there's two there's two other stories and games that I really like, but I don't really want to talk about them because if you don't know the stories, you're getting heavily spoiled, and there would be Soma and Outer Wilds. Oh uh, yeah, I would. I don't want to hear about Outer Wilds because I intend yeah. to play it. And so Soma, Wilds, we got to protect Paul Fringy. We have to protect yeah. Yeah. Soma and Outer Wilds need to be protected. Fringy's playing too much Halo Infinite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I love those stories. They're really good. Outer Wilds is on the Game Pass now as well, so... Game Pass is uh, amazing. Game Pass is amazing. I started uh, playing Sea of Thieves the other day with some oh, pals, because it was on... Fun. It's actually... We had a great time, uh, and it's on the Game Pass, and so... Yoink! Got it. Rags, what's the yeah. game you mentioned the other day about being a dwarf in a hole or whatever? <laughs> Deep Rock Galactic. Deep Rock Galactic. <laughs> That's the one. That <laughs> game is the shit. Now. Y'all should play it, all of us. I don't want to be a dwarf in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my You're, dwarf You're a actually hole. a dwarf in space in a hole. That's like a big yeah. hole. It has everything. Space yeah. is a. It is a big hole. It's, it's an like inverted hole. It's just empty even space. Drinks beer. Hey, how do you know that? How do you know that all of space isn't a hole in something much bigger? Now my mind is like a hole because I'm all. Oh, I'm just losing it right now. Oh my goodness. Metal cont- Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, what, what can I talk about then? And then I was thinking, I really like the whole story of Kratos so far, of God of War. Just where we are right now. Just the first three games were like, m- just more fighting and gory. And I don't think the story was like that great, I think. It was just a, just a combination of what happened to him and us getting to play him and just fuck up all those gods in brutally violent ways is just super fun and i really really like that and then we get the god of war 2018 and we suddenly get like a proper story with kratos and i was like oh shit that's 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 good shit and which is also really (laughs) topical because yesterday the pc release came out uh 
for God of War 2018. So I'm going to check that out at some point, I guess. Yeah, uh, same. I really I, like least... what the latest game did with that character, but I do have to say I really enjoy the pulpy anger of like the character in the first three games. Absolutely. Like he beats people to a pulp. <laughs> he literally does. That's, yeah. I, literally. <laughs> There's some, some <laughs> gruesome scenes in there. Like God of War 3. No. <laughs> Well, yeah, awesome. you know, Rags, you wanted Chris Santon, apparently that's his name, the Wookiee, to, like, do all kinds of fucking rough stuff. Or oh, to, to non-sexual, to, uh, to good old Boba in their fights and stuff. God of War, yeah. let's just say they, 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 they do... I, I didn't say they couldn't if they wanted to. That's, that was never the point, Jay. My goodness. Sexual liberation is what EFAP's all about, but... Oh, bro. Um, that's the main point of EFAP, that's the thing. Yes. But like yeah, you mentioned, you know, like fucking gouge his eyes out. Kratos does that to Poseidon. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Little <laughs> clown boy. Yeah. Yeah. We did. Yeah. S we saw that for the little clown boy stuff. I don't know. Stream is down. No, it's um, not. Apparently, it just buffered for two seconds. <laughs> and it's back. Oh, it's back. Pe oh, people are people are fucking drama queens. It's not. No, oh, okay. Well, I'm I'm good this time. Refresh so. you fools. <laughs> Refresh you fools. Refresh yeah. you fools. <laughs> <laughs> um, Refresh me, yeah, no, yeah. It, I agree with you because as, as, especially with 2018, so much more contemplative and somber, but has the yeah. history of the first three games that are more of an exposed nerve of a story, just like. And I, I just love that. Like, God of War 2018 <clears throat> is really accessible for newcomers because mm -hmm. you don't need to play any of the other games really. But if you did, you get like the best piece of fan service you've ever seen, <laughs> for me at least. Oh yeah, like that's some of the best handled fan service. Yeah, it was wonderful. They were so restrained compared to what they could have been. I, when I first played it, I didn't expect us to get the chaos blades back, like ever. It was like, what? We have we have a weapon now. I think like what the game did and the story was to try and earn your trust as its own thing, mm -hmm. and then it was like, all right. Now do you trust okay. us to actually bind it to the previous games? And you're like, all right. That's how you do fucking fan service: is to earn your respect with your own thing first. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like, I, I don't give. Really... It's like, I don't give a shit that your new characters are meeting my old favorite characters. I don't know these new characters yet. Oh, you mean? Isn't it yeah, cool they nailed that. Luke like... Skywalker meets Glumbo. <laughs> you I mean Ray? Glumbo is. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, he means Ray. Ray. <laughs> Ray is Glumbo. 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 Imagine that's the ending of Rise of Skywalker. Is, um, he said, it's like, Stranger, who are you? She says, Ray. No. No. That doesn't feel right. Not anymore. I'm Glumbo. I would have. Ray Glumbo. I would have bought a second Ray ticket who? just to see that scene again. Ray Schleimbly. I, 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 I really hey, enjoy that. Can I introduce you to Crime, Mauler? Crime? Crime. Crime. I'm aware of this thing you speak. Phenomenon. Good. I've only heard of it, though. I've never... I would it. never in indulge in such criminal. I would never crime. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would take a bite out of it. <laughs> hey, nice. Uh, I was about to say, right, uh, we, we, when we get to the 2018 one, like, Kratos and, and the Norse... Saga, I guess you could tell you could t uh, call it. I was like, uh, I'm finally done with all these god killings. I just want to chill with my family and my son. And then the Norse gods come. I was like, nah, we want to fuck you up. I was like, oh man, we just want to honor the dead mom. And I was like, no, nah, we're gonna fight a lot. I was like, really well. I, I, really, I really like this because it's like almost like a uh one one shot movie almost the way they did it in the in the game it was like really neat yeah i they, love um... the opening scene like you you know what it is about mm -hmm. right away with them incinerating the mother it's like the the death of the anima or the feminine mm -hmm. and now you have like the Boy. this boy's only influence is this outrageously violent <laughs> yeah. monster basically and it's like, where's there's no yin to the yang? Like, how is this kid going to turn out? Yeah, and he keeps yeah. the the kid at a distance, and uh, we yeah. we can understand. That's what I think is so works about it because you're sitting there as a player of the other games. Like, is it because mm. is it because of all the other stuff? 
and, <laughs> and the kid is just has no idea about any of it. And the little references they have at first, where like I think Kratos spots some of like a uh, Greek sort of architecture, or is it like items in that place? And he's just staring yeah, at them yeah, for a little yeah. bit, and you get to watch him staring at them, and you're just like, is he gonna? What is it? What is it? Because it, it is a depiction <laughs> of himself. <laughs> yeah. A depiction of him. I was like, Dad, what what do you see? And he just frozen a ground break. It's like, no, nothing. We need to move along. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. But yeah, it's uh, I really like it. Please don't fuck it up in the next one, please. Well, I'll be prob- very sad. They probably will. Come on. No, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, bring it out on Steam immediately. I found it quite difficult. That game kicked my ass. The combat. Oh, I can see that. I I started first play for. I started it on hard, and I and that changed was hard back. For me. To point the no, I point. guess normal is this, this is just the normal one. Mm-hmm. Because man, I was like, this is tough. I don't know how this game works yet. I'm gonna go down one difficulty. But then later on, when you get the groove, uh, I felt like it was a bit too easy as soon as you figured out everything and started to level your shit. Yeah, it's like Dark Souls, where if you die, it's, you don't really feel cheated. It's just like, oh, I fucked up there. But it's like you, it's so. You got to be like so attentive all the time. It's very easy for my mind to kind of drift. And my God, I love Dark Souls, but I fucking suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I barely progressed in it at all. It's just like, God, I really want to enjoy this game, but like I'm too yeah, bad. Yeah, I, I, I replayed it last year actually, so I'm in no hurry to buy it on PC just now. But mm-hmm. I, I did the Valkyrie fights, all of them this time. And man, this last Valkyrie. I raged a lot on my streams when I was doing that fights. <laughs> that last Valkyrie fight is a piece of shit. I'm still not sure how fair it is, really, because sometimes the com- combinations of attacks you get is like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. But you, can, it is doable. It's doable. I think it's just on the on the edge of being unfair. I think. I cheese the fuck out of Demon Souls and Dark Souls where like I'll encounter an enemy one at a time, right? And then you yeah. back up, back up, back up until you find the barrier, the perimeter of that uh enemy's AI zone. You know what I mean? Where like yeah, yeah, yeah. there's like a line that they all won't cross and it like they'll just like as soon as you cross that line, they'll ignore you. You kind of abuse that. You just like go in for an attack, stab them and then cross the line again. You just keep doing that till they're dead. Okay, are you talking really? about Resident Evil Village? I'm going to chat. Is uh, video games considered a story, though? Yes. Yeah. Of yes. What? Of course. What? 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 <laughs> so, like, you know how when you talk about a video Get game, out. you can talk about the story? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't mean to derail it. <laughs> uh, no, we're, we're talking about stories here. <laughs> um, shall we move on to question three, since we've we're now allotted. There's two hours per question, yeah, obviously. Cool. Yeah, sure. sure. All right. Wait, we well, three on the first one. Let me randomize. Oh, oh my! my. Noise. This is oh our. Oh my god! Order. You, I bet you guys are super excited to see what the order is. Da, 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 I am da, excited da. to see what the order I'm, is. I'm in suspense. Oh. <laughs> yeah, metal's got number one this time. So, metal. Oh boy. Double metal Who gets the is double. Your favorite well, I guess character. I get to... Of all time. Talk about Kratos a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is he your favorite what? character of all time? I, I had a really hard time with that one. Because there's no character to me that sprung out immediately. Because I, 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 I cannot think of a character where, like, this is... I, I like this super duper crazy a lot. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why this one was so hard for me to figure out. Well, I guess went... everyone's answers today don't actually have to be definitive. It's just whatever you come up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just. What's the point of the stream? Hey, <laughs> leave metal alone. No, I'm gonna slap him. No, no, not again. Ow, my ass. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just decided for now. I really like Kratos a lot because, well, basically of the things I already said, like the whole everything he went through, and then has to. Uh, get along with it. I guess get along with his son is almost a proper way to say it because it almost feels like he doesn't really want to, to uh, do anything with him. But then he has he goes along. It's like no, you want, I actually really like my son because it's like little hints of him trying to show affection. It's like ah oh, no, doesn't really like it. 
Yeah, I think you um, get a lot of whenever the sun gets into any level of danger, Kratos is like he'll switch into very furiously protecting him, even though he's very distant. Yeah, absolutely. And there's like a couple of scenes where he's almost going to pat him on the on the shoulder or whatever, yeah. and it's like no, mm -hmm. he's like very uh, hesitant in, in that way. Um, yeah, just just him having to change his ways and actually confronting his past and sharing it with uh, with uh, Atreus, even though he never wanted to, but then he realized, yeah, I kind of have to because I put him in danger with my mere existence. It's a really interesting position to put that character in the mm. new game where, like, there's no mother... He's raising this kid. He has this responsibility. He can't be the fucking psycho that he was in the other games because he's yeah. just going to turn his kid into a, somebody maybe even worse. That's right. A crazy psycho dad can really have a bad influence on their children. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. But yeah, well, is it, this is not like my definitive so, answer because there's there's a lot of characters I like. Like the, there's a bunch of characters and like the haunting series that are really good that i really like i really like that he's f suddenly forced to temper himself like um in f the lack of a mother figure he's got to kind of serve struggling with the mm -hmm. idea of serving both roles yeah and how like the game is just consistently dragging him back to the original trilogy and he just doesn't want to <laughs> yeah. yeah all the references like the repercussions and then just overt like items and conversations where it's like yeah, yeah. and he's so gotta I'd... rage the fuck out to win at certain portions i don't want to be insane roid rage man anymore <laughs> i have a beard now i I'm just wiser. want a grill <laughs> he did he wanted a grill he grilled his wife yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's oh dead my already. God. That's fine. Oh, that, I guess that is more morally acceptable, yeah. Well, so someone chat just said, I love that he's so slow to uh, to anger in this one. Yeah, he's like, just when, uh, not Odin, uh, uh, who's the first boss you fight? I forgot his Barman? name. No, wait. But begins with a B. Boba. 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 When Boba Fett <laughs> arrives at Kratos' house, Boulder, I, that's it. I clapped. Yeah. Boulder. <laughs> we we very much insist him to just leave, and he doesn't want to fight anymore. It's just like you don't want to have this fight, and yeah, it takes it takes a bit before he actually goes into action. I think the first time we realize that he wants to protect his son most of the time is when we have to fight actual humans. Because he doesn't want him to kill a human, because that's like a horrible thing mm -hmm. to experience, apparently. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, he he went around to killing so many people, even innocent ones. Like I remember very well in God of War one, two, three, it was just civilians running around. I was like, oh, I need help! I'm just gonna rip those people apart. <laughs> yeah, and we got Thor uh, coming to Ragnarok soon enough. Yeah, please be on Steam. Please. Or Ragnarok. Um. Ragonka. I guess I'm I'm next. Oh my. Um. Yeah. Well, go I can't tell it. you about my three favorite characters. They're all <laughs> off limits. So I'm gonna have to go with a different one. Um. Fucking pussy. I know, right? You'll find out oh, all about it. Well, eventually. they're gonna be Simon, Buffy, and who was the third? Who the fuck is Simon? <laughs> yeah. <I don't> know. <laughs> Simon, Simon. Buffy and Franklin. Fuck Simon, I hate him. It's funny because my Whoa. character is called Simon. <laughs> Although I was obviously lying, my favorite character is Flatreen. Do you mean we've gone over the characters already, or they're super secret? We can't. We don't. We no, can't no. Know. I mean, I'm. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Three fine. of mine, I'm disqualifying. I'll find others, but there's so many to choose from anyway. I am gonna pick good old Tywin Lannister. Because mm. he's a fucking legend. Now, let's go over why why he's such a legend. There's gonna be a combination of knowledge from the books, like other <laughs> lore stuff, and then the show, and the entire time picturing all of these events being done by Charles Dance specifically. He's uh he's just a glorious representation of the character. Now, it all begins, or at least I'm gonna give a very crappy sort of summary of a lot of these events. People in chat will get triggered, but you'll follow along for why exactly I like him. 
He was a part of um, what we're a rich house and successful house, but it started to go to shit because his dad basically like did a lot of whoring and chilled out and gave didn't uh, follow up debts people had to the Lannisters and it all started to fall apart. And no one gave a shit. Um, I think his dad died. Uh, oh no, this 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 uh, his dad was out for a walk one day. I think and he came across two lions. Uh, in the sort of area of land, and he was like almost oh. killed by them, but he was uh, he was actually rescued by House Clegane with two dogs or three dogs, I think I can't remember. But the point is, it was one of the most embarrassing things ever because the leader of House Lannister was like terrified of being killed by the symbol of their house. You know, just optics didn't look great, which is the the lion. And so I think uh, it b became a point where um, Tywin. His whole goal was to just raise Lannis the Lannisters back to power. Um, and his whole, like, existence is all about his family. It's the core value. Everything is, is below family. But his major flaw is that he's never actually taken consideration of his family on, like, an emotional level. He's never understood them as people, and he's never cared. It's much more about what they represent. Um... His successes in the, that regard, though, he, like, took over and he made... He was incredibly intelligent and uh, assertive about basically every decision he makes, and then just, just pushes Lannisters further higher and higher. He um, made specific marriages for bloodlines to get stronger. He was the Hand of the King, and people liked him more than the King. Meaning, like, King's helper sort of thing but of, of Westeros, and uh, he ended up... I think he was actually fired because he became more popular because he was running everything so effectively. That's a good optical decision. I know, it, it didn't make them good friends, but Tywin was fucking ruthless, and uh, he would always aim to pick the winning side, unless, of course, the war is being waged against the Lannisters specifically. And uh, that king uh, caused like a major civil war that Lan uh, Tywin ended up asking to come into his gates to help defend him against the incoming war and then just slaughtered all of his people and uh, ended up killing him and then took the sort of glory if you will of being like we defeated the king we're good guys and he managed to get his daughter to then marry the king that would take over and he just you know went away to good old uh castle rock just chilling out and probably living out the rest of his days because his daughter was going to be of a decent power, the bloodline of Lannister is going to sink into the... But that, that's where, that's around where Game of Thrones begins as a show. And um, he's never given a shit about any of these relations. He even talks vaguely about how much he doesn't like basically anybody. He just hangs out with... he doesn't And he doesn't talk to his family that much either, but he's very much aware of the politics of everything. And um, I think, and a lot of people agree, that the intelligence of the show dies with him as a character. Like, it's a it's more of a meta thing, but it's just kind of funny to think about. Um, he, like, as a lot of people know, Sean Bean, he's in season one, and he kind of, uh, kind of dies. It's one of the famous events of season one, because it's a really subversive sort of moment, but it's actually, like, perfectly set up. Um, when we first meet Tywin, he, like, one of the first things he said is how fucking stupid it was that they killed him. And he was a great, like, hostage, and he meant a lot, but now he just pissed everybody off. And it's such a great little intro, because... It's like he's not even thinking about it from a, a honor perspective or um, even a, like a remotely emotional one. Just pragmatically thinking about the chess pieces on the board. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, he's telling his sons exactly where to go, what to do, and how to use their armies as their best while he's gutting. Um, I was going to say, a, what is, uh, I think it's a stag, uh, which is the symbol for House Baratheon, which is the king that's just died. Like, it, he's just, he's doing it for his own reasons in narrative, but it's just wonderful sim symbolism as well, talking about uh, whether or not, like, the leaders of these houses are all dead, and he's just talking about how to make use of all of it. Um, to fast forward then, he starts fighting one of the, like, newer, younger members of the Stark family, and he actually gets subverted by him and loses significantly, loses his son. Um, and he gets, like incredibly fucking frustrated. This is, there's this scene where he's like uh, talking to his commanders and they're all figuring out what the next best move is and he just repeats while shouting at them his son's been kidnapped because without Jamie Lannister Tywin's fucked because the only other son he has is Tyrion who he doesn't he sees as like a dead end and then he has a daughter that doesn't provide heirs so 
everything he's worked for will fall apart if Jamie dies. Um, and so then he like does a, another subversive movie, heads back to his own uh, bloodlines kingdom as opposed to trying to continue fighting that war. And then he starts fighting the war explicitly from writing letters. He's just in King's Landing for like, I think two seasons, he's just writing letters and talking to people. And he ends up fully winning the war, basically. He manages to convince and push different people in different directions. Uh, all through cunning. Every scene he has with every other character of significant power or intelligence, he just outmaneuvers them. Um, and of course, the Red Wedding is the famous example of just, he basically wipes out the Starks with a stroke of a pen because he convinced someone to do something several different ways and uh, bartered with the power of marrying into the, the king's uh, bloodlines as well. And he even has, like, a perspective on it, like, uh, Tyrion tries to rip into him for the idea of how fucked up it is to backstab people when they're expected to just have dinner at a place, and then he's just, like, it's better than thousands of men dying for no reason on a battlefield. And you just, like, he'll make you pause with a lot of his logic. And then there's just his presence. He is this, like, 80-plus-year-old dude, but wherever he goes and whoever he talks to, they shut the fuck up, because he's so intimidating with all the experience he's had. And then... Mm -hmm. You might think that as a result of knowing all of this about this person, you'd be frustrated by his demise, but it's not. It's one of the most satisfying ways he could have gone, which is that he tries to get rid of Tyrion because of different mistakes and things that have happened along the way, and um, because he fails to understand most of the dynamics in his own family, and he considers the Lannisters so above everyone else while referring to basically anybody of lower-born to be, be like worthless peasants or whores. Um, and I'm going with the book now, people. Fuck the show on this one. The, uh, he, he like refers to an old person that uh, his son was in love with, as he refers to her as a whore, which would be inaccurate considering the events. And him doing that so naturally, because he would always refer to them as lower than himself, it, it's not something he's even necessarily thinking about, but like it pisses off his son so much that he fucking shoots him with a crossbow. Uh, while he's on the toilet, like because he's come at him at night for for very very specific reasons, but um, he's like that's the way he goes out. Uh, and I think in the book he even describes it as his bowels let loose, like because he's dead. There's nothing like the guy who's all about pride, glory, gold, and red. Who's uh, <laughs> his family is everything. He dies shitting himself on the toilet. Like it, you, you just, it's it's perfect. Um, and yeah. it's specifically because of his weak spot, which was never ever actually understanding the people in his family, only trying to push them up to the the best of where they can be. That's a quick summary without me having rewatched the show or reread the books in a while. I fucking adore that character because of how intelligent and cunning it all is behind very specific motivations, but also flaws that intertangle with all of the things that pushed him in the first place. I love the fact that he has reasoning behind a lot of it, but he also at the same time is hypocritical in a lot of smaller ways that make him dynamic. Um, he's, he's really fucking cool. And Charles Dance made him perfect, basically. That was like the best casting you can get. And just look at clips of Tywin talking to people on YouTube if you've never seen Game of Thrones. You'll be entertained. I guarantee it. Um, yeah, and I just quickly, he dies at the end of season four, which is the last good season of Game of Thrones. Agreed. Yeah, I, I made a list of ten to try and choose from, and Tywin was also on my list, but that's not the one I was So fucking about. good. Yeah, well, it's a very, very good character. Um, but yeah, and I was thinking, I, I don't want to take much longer, just to say that, like, I th think my favorite characters are always going to have to be people that I can take a while to explain like more complex I think simplistic characters there's nothing wrong with them necessarily but you know like Emperor Palpatine he's just never going to be my favorite mm -hmm. I'll say the, the performance though. he looks cool <laughs> yeah and I like the performance but um you know what that means Jay is next Jay I have to follow that well I mean <laughs> just, I was just saying I like a character you can do that Hey, 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 I don't feel that... I mean, I, I don't know if I could talk that long about any character, like, without scripting it beforehand. And I'll tell you something now, I haven't written a fucking script. I didn't write a script either, I just like Tywin. <laughs> I know, I know. Maybe we have different skills, Mumbleheim. Wow, oh, that's I, probably I, insensitive to some cultures. Oh, is there drama? I, I'm sorry, someone, I got a knock on the door, and I had to step out for a moment.
that was um i really enjoyed listening to you talk about tywin he's a fucking legend yeah, yeah i um i i because i remember when i remember when season eight came out and i was your emotional support animal <laughs> and you started showing me the episode and all the clips and stuff with tywin and you're like rags look at how amazing this show used to be look at how incredible these characters were look at how cool this motherfucker is oh my god rags can you see this that these are the words he said, and I said, "Yeah, this looks real like a really awesome show." I'm I'm so sorry about what they did to your your beautiful baby, and I was like, "Damn!" Now I like Tywin a whole bunch because these clips he's showing me. He's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I have the same experience. He, he's uh, safe though. He dies right before the show goes to shit, so that there's no. And they didn't do any like Tony Stark shit where they said like, "Turns out Ty Tywin raped babies." Just like what? No, no, like no. The, the, they'd leave him alone. <laughs> Which is nice. Yeah, is, is there a single episode or a single season of television more disappointing than season eight of Game of Thrones? I don't think there is. I I would argue it's like the probably the letdown. worst. Fuck, like like it's the worst because uh, In terms I think of was, legacy. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe Doctor Who's one of those seasons might be able to compare, but like season eight Game of Thrones, it fucking assassinated everyone and destroyed the whole thematic through line of the show. It's just like that's some significant damage. Consider yeah, this. Consider that for almost a decade, Game of Thrones had it was one of the most culturally significant uh, TV shows that existed in media. Everyone knew about it, even if you watched it or not. It had it had invaded popular culture, and the next episode, and the fear of spoilers, and the excitement that people had for every episode was incredible for almost a decade. And then we get to the end of season eight and now nobody talks about it. And if they do, it is almost always horrifically negative about how the whole show was ruined by the end. And it takes some serious work to destroy that lengthy and powerful of a legacy mm. in such a way. Do you know that Peter Dinklage recently said people were mad because the white people didn't get to walk off? Hand in hand. Yes. Like, what the uh, <laughs> that's why we were upset. Damn. Yes. Peter. That's, yeah. I, it's, it, no I can't believe it's so fucking short sighted of him to say that. Wow. <laughs> nice. Well, nice. yeah, I think it's, it would have. The other thing he said, just quickly, because I, I think he was like, who cares anyway? It's not real. There's fucking dragons in it. And it was just like, what? oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to be dragging my balls across your face if you say that again. Yeah. It's so uh, yeah, it, it would have been a strong contender for my favorite show of all time, and I I can't watch it. I tried to watch it again, like last year, and I, I just Hello? I couldn't get through it. And then oh, I remember I watched God, one of again, Baller's videos it? about season eight, and I was just fucking <laughs> oh, no. like furious. It's like oh, like no, tweeting so about how goodness. fucking mad I was. Don't say anything important, please. <laughs> it's, the, it's it's the worst thing that ever. I'll happened let you know when I'm back so in the bad. land of. I'm trying to listen it's like to both of you at the same time. That have gone to the land of the ring wraiths. Rags, just shut the fuck up until it fixes. That's and what you, you can't do. see me. And I can't hear you. Oh, I heard metal. <laughs> oh, God, did it happen again? Hello? I like Hi. Oh, your first Hello. instinct, Rags, whenever you can't hear anyone, is just talk incessantly. Just talk. <laughs> Instead of stopping. Nope. Nope, because if I... Because here's the thing. If I talk incessantly and I interrupt everything you say, that means you can't say all that stuff without me because I want to hear what this is from a place of love because I want to hear what you have to say. Very well. slap you in the balls oh. out of love. You Ooh. can't because I'm dragging him across someone's face in chat. So you're going to slap his yeah. head too. And you don't want That's that. Fine. You can't... I, I do that. I think no, right? Jay is adept enough to slap your balls without hitting the guy's face. Yeah. He is that dexterous. Yes. I mean, Wait, how many people were talking about that? Apparently, me and Rags both were. Well, uh, I guess is it is it Jay's turn, right? Right? To talk about oh God, not yeah. again! Favorite, you gotta be fucking with me. Did it happen again? Jay Sorry. didn't even have the turn yet. Oh what do you mean? no! No! Wait, I think his I think his audio oh, is gone no. again. Oh, I'm gonna go to Singapore. You can't hear us. <laughs> Rex, you can't hear us, <sighs> can you? Uh, this okay. is Singapore. No, we're back. Singapore. We're in Singapore now. Okay. Singapore. Okay. All right. Okay, Jake, go. Do it. All right. I'm going to take my turn. Again, you know, um, I've taken this question as just, you know, not favorite character of all time. Because I guess, 
I guess if I were to do that, it would probably do be it would probably would be the doctor, but that's not really fair um, because we've got why not? Well, we've got essentially there. We've got um, the, the, that's essentially having several interpretations of the same character, but because they're all in the same continuity, you get to include them all as one, I suppose. I would Unless have we, thought you'd pick you'll... a particular one rather than the entity as a whole, but I, you know, either way. I don't, I don't think I would pick a particular one. I think I would particularly, even so you, though there's a 13th include... of it that I, I absolutely <laughs> despise. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't even count. That's just a, a bleak she misunderstanding. Count. <laughs> she doesn't she doesn't count. God um, damn. But um the character that I wanted to bring along was uh Simon from Misfits, who I don't know who here is even familiar with Misfits. I know who is, I just don't know who isn't. Not me. I have not, not seen it. I am but familiar. you told me to watch it multiple times. So I've been doing a rewatch of Misfits recently with Fringy and man, the strength of that show is its character writing. Um more yeah. so than anything else, I think. But um, the standout character in all of them is Simon, um, who is this. <clears throat> so we have the setup of a um, group of young offenders. I think that's. I think that's the most important part. Is that they're like we don't even need to talk about like the sci-fi stuff that happens in that show, just to appreciate who they are as people, and that they are um, a group of young offenders who are essentially forced to work together by circumstance. They are put in the same like community service service rotation that's how they know each other um and then shit happens to their group and they are forced to collaborate even though as people they almost certainly are i think well they're a bunch of misfits they, they almost the show. none of them would really be friends nice. um outside of the show outside of the circumstances i i sincerely doubt that anyone would talk to any of the others uh and you have nathan who is a um, a fan favorite character. He is often presented as the protagonist, even though it's quite a flat team structure. Um, and you know he's a. I mean, he's a masterclass in in comic relief without making it annoying. Um, and he has a he has a rich character and a, a, a and his own values and strengths and weaknesses and and you know exactly the kind of thing he's likely to say in any kind of situation. But uh, it's Simon who has, I think, more nuances and complexities than any other character in the show. He is a... Um, you, when, when we meet him, he is incredibly socially distant from everyone else. He is awkward and nervous. He doesn't understand um, most social cues or the difference between... Uh, the subtle differences that most people do understand... That is the difference between coming across as awkward and un or, and coming across as palatable to most people. Um, I think the perfect example of that is uh, a scene where he is asking a girl out. He asks, "Do you like food? If you do, we can go for some pizza and garlic dough balls." In a very like matter of fact, um, and also very clearly nervous demeanor. Um, and there are all of these social nuances that he doesn't understand, but he clearly, he clearly does have um, his own moral compass and, and heart in there. Um, and as he grows, it's really rewarding to see this guy um, get his first proper people that he considers to be his friends um, and to see the things that are significant to him and to see... Um, how his sort of um how his how his life um being socially distant from other people has informed his morals and his and the kind of decisions he's likely to make and his understanding of the world um he's a very satisfying character to see grow other than one arc that Fringy and I are very are going to controversially mm -hmm. get angry about yeah it's like one for it's one of the most popular arcs in the show. I don't know why. They assassinate him. In like an episode. It's, it's yeah, really crazy. But it's it's really easy to separate it from the rest of the show, so Right. Fring it's one of the most popular arcs in the show. <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it's Fringy's fault. <laughs> I don't like it. it Fringy, why did you make that arc so popular? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, also, um, I don't know, I don't know, um, cause we're talking about writing. I don't know really how much, how fair it is to bring acting into it, but holy fuck. Um, Iwan Rion, who plays him, He's honestly one of my fucking like standout performances. Like I can't Game think of, of many performances I like better uh, yeah. than him as Simon. He conveys so much nuance and emotion. Um, he has to play the character getting possessed and is able to do full switches of demeanor like he's like you're like oh there's a different brain in that body now um he is fucking insane um scenes where he is um th there is a scene where um let's say without spoiling it um some of the people that he has grown to consider his only friends over the course of the previous season he is now being found out in a way if they found out information about him that as far as he is concerned risks their entire friendship with him collapsing and his performance in that scene is fucking amazing um bringing do you know the one i'm referring to based on that uh i think so i think i do yeah um yeah i don't i don't i, I can't um appreciate the the the, the melding of writing and performance that come together to form this character enough, like he is through and through one of my favorites. Um, and yeah, as, as I, well, I don't think I can pick a favorite character of all time, but he is one that I, I can't think of any, you know, it's the same rule as while I don't think I can pick a favorite of all time. There are certainly characters who reach a level where they can't reach a higher level for me, and these are just all the characters that I like as much as I'm capable of liking a character. Writing and acting definitely go hand in hand. Oh yeah. Um, like you, a, a good actor can take bad writing sometimes and salvage something out of it. Usually, it's not very yeah. good. Like, but uh, when both are good. When you have a terrific actor with like top-notch material, it creates this positive feedback loop where you end up with something really special. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And as well, the same way as you could the other end, you can have a, um, some serviceable or even good material totally ruined by it just being delivered with an actor who doesn't really seem to give a shit about the material they're working. With. Yes. Well, yeah. If you had like exactly. really great material, Gal Gadot was delivering, there would still be like characterization and things to complement. We would just be like, man. Sucks that she's the one delivering those lines. Honestly, like, um, it can make dialogue feel so much na less natural. It can really rob dialogue of the implications that it would have being read by a more talented actor. True, with the way that mm -hmm. words are said, intonation and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right then. It looks like next up Magical. is Mr. Frong. Who is your Bring favorite character of all time and why? The caveats to start with would be that I'm pretty sure that I have a character who is among the favorites, if not potentially my favorite, um, but I don't want to talk about him quite yet because he's, he's from a series that I'm sure we'll get around to talking about in depth eventually. Um, and also, it, it, it can be hard to hone in on a single one. And uh, something else I was thinking about in relation to this question is how do I factor in like characters from comedies who are really static, but who I really enjoy seeing? So uh, when I think about that, I think about like Homer Simpson, Basil Fawlty, like Eric Cartman, Sterling Archer, a lot of a lot of comedy characters who I really enjoy watching, um, who I guess would be would be up there with my favorite characters. But I guess I feel like I have less to. I feel like that conversation would be a lot harder to have um, at the moment. So I've decided not to talk about those ones uh, and some other ones I was thinking about too. Um, but for this conversation, one of my favorite characters is Daredevil. And part of the reason why I like Daredevil so much is because I struggle to think of uh, other characters that are so ripe uh, for the exploration of theme than Daredevil. There, there are so many things that I don't even know that they were on purpose when the character was created um, that just line up so well. Uh, it, it's kind of unreal. So when we think about 
who is Daredevil? Who is this character? So he's one of the few superheroes who is defined by a disability. He's defined by what he can't do as opposed to what he can. That's mm. so cool. That's such a cool, yeah. unique thing to have for a superhero who is defined by what they cannot do. Um, and then you think about so many of these things. Again, I, I, I'm I, not sure that um, that Stan Lee knew what he had created when he did this, but a blind lawyer, a blind Catholic lawyer who dresses up like a demon and goes out into the night to beat up criminals. Now, you say that, it's like, that's that's a concept but it's like okay so we have a, a man who has decided that he wants to become part of a legal system uh, you know part of the legal system uh and you know adhere to the tenets of the legal system in terms of like the rule of law specifically the rule of law is probably the important one um yet clearly he doesn't believe in this system or at least he thinks that the system is flawed in ways that he can remedy by going out into the street at night and exacting vigilante justice to uh, create the world that he wants. There is so much that you can explore that has been explored in stories about him, about that, the fact that he would make that decision. Uh, and then we think about the moral implications of the things that he's doing, because Daredevil generally adheres to like a no-kill rule. Um, and usually when we talk about it, it's like Batman, a lot of the time his concern with the no kill rule is, uh, fear of like what he will become if he breaches that rule, that he'll go down a really dark path. And, um, and, uh, basically become unhinged. Like a lot of the time with Spider-Man, the reason why he doesn't want to kill the bad guys is because he is kind of like a, he, he is pretty wholesome. Um, and also the idea of like redemption and salvation and stuff. And, um... But with with uh, with Matt, he's a Catholic, so he believes that if he crosses certain lines, that it will be basically condemning his soul, and that's like a factor that he has to grapple with, as well as the standard things. Right? Of can I rob somebody of the chance of redemption? Is it okay? Um, is it okay to to cross this line to create the world that I want? Um, I think when you think about that, it's like, there are plenty of stories, both in the comics and in the TV show, that are, that that explore these concepts. But I, I think it is, the thing that I find so interesting and appealing about Daredevil is just how potent all of these sort of fundamental elements of his character are for, like, so many different types of stories you can explore about, like, the nature of being a superhero or a vigilante or, like, your concepts of justice or, like, morality, redemption. Um... And you get that in, like, Born Again, The Man Without Fear, uh, Dead of a Yellow. Um, uh, I haven't read out, but I've heard that that has a lot of that stuff in there, too. And then the TV show as well. Um, and I mean, and this is all putting to one side that Dead of has a real cool factor to him. The costume is awesome. The concept is really cool of, like, a yeah, again, a, a, a blind man who has, like, heightened senses, so he relies on hearing and smell and then he can leverage those uh in his professional career as well like as a lawyer there's certain advantages he gets from being able to do that um yeah dead daredevil is awesome um he is he is really really cool great character and a really strong example of like theme married hardcore with 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 a character it's 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 difficult to think of like stories that you would that you could tell where you would not be able to pull something just from these fundamental ideas about justice and uh morality, redemption. Yeah. I uh I really like Daredevil. That's uh that's one of fucking marry him then. Did yeah. you like him in <laughs> Spider-Man No Way Home? I really liked him in in No Way Home, but again, it's like a minute of time, but I definitely was happy to see him. And I mean, when we talk about performances, like Charlie Cox is perfect. Like I don't want to see him played by anybody else. He's he's going to play uh Daredevil. Um I I do get worried about what they're going to do, especially mm. based on what I heard. Why would you be worried about what Marvel in. would do with with yeah. a character that you love in Phase 4. Why would you worry about yeah. that? Oh, and by the way, for anybody who isn't super familiar with comics, who is interested in reading comics, uh, Dead of a Born Again is, um... That, that is a really fantastic, uh, like, entry point, um, for, for learning about Dead of a... It's, it's pretty much like the quintessential story. It's, it's definitely worth reading. 
amazing art. I think that was uh, Mazzuccelli. He did uh, Batman Year One, which was also him and Frank Miller, which is another great comic too. Oh, man, those two <laughs> made a lot of good comics. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's about it. All right. Cool. Another dynamic character. So many layers and thematic relevance. Mm -hmm. um, I, you. I believe it is now your turn once again. Oh, Mr. sorry, John. sorry. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, okay. One last thing I wanted to mention as well about Dead yep, because I Someone reminded me in chat. Um, that, like, a constant question that's raised about Daredevil throughout all of his stories is, like, his intentions. Like, you, are you actually interested in helping people, or do you just want to hurt people? Like, do you like, do you like, uh, being able to go out, because this character sustained a lot of trauma in his life, and it's like, do you just use this as an excuse to go out to beat the shit out of people? Uh, yeah, I think it's easy to become resentful when you've lost your eyesight. Uh, well, it's a, it's a lot of things, right? Is because uh, his sure. dad was a boxer who uh, who ended up getting killed uh, oh, because he was a to th because he didn't throw a fight. Um, that is definitely like a huge part of his history. Um, mm. And it's just it, it, again, it's like God damn, you really did not like <laughs> like in every sort of core aspect of who this guy is, you've leveraged something that's interesting. And and I mean, you know, when you talk about villains, Kingpin is a really cool villain. Um, Bullseye is a cool villain. Elektra is a cool character. Um, he's got a lot of cool villains. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, sorry. So that's 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 my piece. Yeah, no worries. Very well. Um, I'm going to go with Breaking Bad's Walter White. Good choice. Um, it's uh. I was talking earlier about like how I think I consider characters as vehicles for themes. And in the case of Walter White, I would say it's pride. And I think any, anybody who's um, <clears throat> looking for like brainstorming advice for stories, like writing stories, uh, starting off with the seven sins is a pretty good jumping off point because any kind of interesting human behavior or motivation is basically it comes down to one of those and um walter white is a portrait of pride i think and what it can do to a person and it's a for all its spectacle and you know t t almost comic book level tension and explosions <laughs> not that they're that frequent or anything uh it does get a little a bit pulpy and comic booky in rare instances but uh Overall, it's a realistic study of somebody just very milk toast, limp dicked um, at the start. I mean, who's overqualified. Uh, he knows he he's very good at what he does. He's very talented. He feels cheated with the whole thing with uh, Elliot Schwartz. Gray matter. Losing the gray matter. Yeah. Losing the partnership. Uh, just deeply resentful and he's kind of stewing in this resentment but he doesn't show it at all he's just very suppressed and um and then he has this cancer diagnosis and all of a sudden he's got a clock on his lifespan and he's questioning what he's done for his family and what he's going to leave them with and he just decides fuck it and <laughs> sees uh, a news report of how much money can be made um, making and dealing drugs and justifies going through with it by saying that well the money that I make I'm going to leave it to my family and they don't have to know how I make this money but I'm going to make this money I'm going to give it to them I'm going to die and what I did won't matter all that matters is that my family is well off and sort of like it's you the idea that you can that all the terrible shit you can justify in the name of like doing good by your ch your children your family making sure that they're in an okay place and um i love what the show does across the entire show uh his morality just swings from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I like how it's a debate as to where exactly he became evil. 
and maybe there's an argument to be made that maybe he was evil all along and the circumstances just brought that out in him but i don't know about that personally i think i think what you do has a lot to do with your character and I, he never really did evil things until he went down this path of um the drug trade and um but he it's not like he went from good to bad and that's it i like that at the end of the show like he reaches rock bottom he's withering away and you see that there's still some good in him and he reaches this revelation in the last couple episodes that he wants to leave something positive behind yeah like he kind of he he did the drug thing he uh he, he went all the way to the top he rose and fell it was the archetypal story and then he's just at the bedrock now where he's about to die and it's like is this what i want to leave behind I think, uh, like my family my family hates me i've introduced all this poison i produced all this poison for people and like what what can i do that's like good well i can get well actually no like i was gonna say he kind of saves jesse but he doesn't intend on saving jesse when he when he goes for that final confrontation, but he sees the predicament that he's in. He like, he thinks Jesse's working with the Nazis, but that's not the case. And, uh, but he, he does something good in the end. And, um, you can, it's arguable whether or not he got what he deserved in the end. Um, I, I think it's a satisfying ending. Maybe, I mean, I like season five, the last season, but it's definitely the most flawed season out of all of them. And um, they did a really, they made a really ballsy move with introducing the, the gun in uh, the, the opening scene of season five. And cause they didn't, they did that and not, not really knowing where they were going to go with it. And I was, I read a lot about the writing yeah. process, about how there was a lot of like, like tough days in the writer's room we're just like oh my fucking god how are we gonna pay this off like what what can he do with this gun and uh that i think they they kind of wrote themselves into a corner there a little bit maybe they should have taken a more organic approach by not like introducing a flash forward and then having to service like pay off that flash forward yeah i think but it, it I did the exact it, kind of damage you'd expect something like that could do which is that it locked yeah. them into a payoff that they weren't actually 100% on board with. Yeah, that perhaps wasn't truly organic to yeah. that story if you were to just follow, just like take a, not a completely or, well, I guess I suppose like if you just follow Walter White organically, what he would do beat for beat rather than just like figuring out these intense tent pole moments and then like building your way up to them in this kind of artificial paint by numbers way. But I thought overall the breaking bad struck a good balance between an organic and a schematic approach to yeah. compelling storytelling. And I like, I like the, the, the breadth of morality that that character encompasses. Like it's like going, going from like, I, don't, I guess he was, I, you could consider him a good person in the beginning. And then he just, turns into this terrible monster but then you see that there's some redemption in him at the very end i think you and have just, to stack a lot of what he decides to do in all the circumstances he ends up with when i think when he's like profiting hardcore and he's in a comfortable position of people knowing it's him earning the money like with a car wash i think he's willing mm -hmm. to go back to being 100 percent altruistic but the second like jesse or hank start to threaten the empire he will threaten to kill them sort of thing Yes, he's very driven by uh, ego, narcissist, hates like, charity, doesn't want anything given to him anymore. I think you see like, when Hank is uh, at his end sort of thing, the Waltz, everything he says and does in that scene, it just tells you it's like, yeah, he values uh, Hank's life more than he does all of the money he has. Yeah. And uh, that's got to mean something. Was, right. I was thinking of other characters like Tony Soprano. I love that character, but he mm -hmm. doesn't really have much of an arc. Like he stays pretty consistent throughout the whole thing, you know? And so I prefer Walter White in, in like his transformation back and forth. 
and it, it does it in a, a realistic way. It's a very believable character. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of people would cite, I think Jane's death would be the, uh, the moment where you go from probably being like, I can kind of understand all this, to being like, wow, I think you're yes. a bad person now. Yeah, yeah, polarizing for sure. Mm -hmm. I'd agree, though, that if most people would gravitate towards that as the moment where it's like, okay, this character's like irredeemable now, I think. It's rough, that yeah, scene. That's really that's good, my though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, I don't think anybody would... <laughs> like, that's one of them standard, uh, well-known pop culture characters that is known for an extensive arc that uh, takes place over five years. Really well yeah. done and really well be performed. Oh um, yeah, he was like, a fantastic Brian Cranston. Yeah. yeah, and I just love that he comes from a comedy background. And the thing <laughs> yeah. with the uh, comedians, comics, like that you put them in a dramatic role and they can just do it. Like a lot of the time. Like there's just something that they get about like the human experience. Well, it's like Jim Carrey in the Truman Show, right? That is yeah. a comedic role, but it is also mm -hmm. dramatic. Right. Same with Bob Odenkirk. Sketch yeah. comedy background. Uh, same you with, uh, put him in a dramatic uh, role and he's just excellent. Is it Je Bob Jeff Odenkirk, Daniels, famous right? rocker. From uh, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, what's, is that his name? It's Jeff Daniels, right? Jeff Daniels, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's really good in, um, in, in a lot of dramatic roles. He was great in Steve Jobs. Robin Williams. Yeah. Is he in Newsroom? Robin yeah. Williams. Yeah, Good Will Hunting. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, I was trying to think of another one. I'm sure they'll come. Eventually. Excellent choice. And now fine. we move to the Doom portion of the discussion. Yeah, so of the four questions, most of them I pre got an answer pretty quickly. Um, this was like excruciating, <laughs> trying to figure <laughs> out uh, which character I was going to choose. So I guess kind of similar to some other people. I don't have like a necessarily definitive answer, but one one that comes closest, right? Um, now, unfortunately, this is from a film called Akira that I'm pretty sure people haven't seen for the most part. So I'm going to quickly summarize some of the some of the back plot. My, my character is the Colonel. His, his actual name is Colonel Shikishima, but he's never called that. He's just called the Colonel in the film. But the The basic background of the film is that uh, also it's uh, animated, by the way, which explains some of some of the things that happen. Um, but it takes place in Japan. Basically, in 19, oh, and there are people with uh, psychic powers called espers. And in 1988, there was an event, sort of like the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that uh, destroyed Tokyo, where one of these uh, basically people with psychic powers exploded. It's not really fully clarified. Basically, they destroyed the city of Tokyo. And then the actual the story we see takes place in the distant future of 2019, um, after Tokyo has been rebuilt, and uh, the main, yeah, <laughs> and mm -hmm. the main, uh, the main plot revolves around um, another wave of people gaining psychic powers and the other people who have psychic powers, and the military's attempt to like basically keep them under control, uh, and it also deals with some political stuff. Uh, it's it, it's it's an epic story in the sense that it has a lot of characters and a lot of plot, um, but I'm only really going to talk about uh, the colonel character. So the colonel is in charge of the military, right? Um, and I first saw this film when I was very young, uh, and I just like hated him, um, sort of instinctively. It's like the military is bad. Why would we hurt people? Anybody who uses violence is a dick, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a point in the film where the colonel instigates a military coup. So like obviously, fuck this guy, right? Um, you know, why would you do that? You know, you're, not only are you using violence, you're taking over the government. It's undemocratic. You're a piece of shit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've realized that the colonel is the only character in the entire film that's an actual adult. He's just doing the things that are that are required um, to do what is in the best interest of everyone. And like in, in the case of the uh, military coup, he does that because there's like a, another basically there's another pressing threat where Tokyo could be destroyed again. And the only way to do that um, is to take power from the people who are stopping him and go over and, and try and stop Tetsuo and basically try and save everyone's life. Um, and it, it's just really interesting how 
the sort of thing that you would expect to be horrendous. You know, what could be much worse than uh, a military commander taking over control of the government? Um, two military commanders taking control oh, of no. two governments. <laughs> yeah, it's twice the, but uh, yeah. yeah, but it's it's actually just the responsible and adult thing to do. And basically, everyone who surrounds him is uh, like uh, greedy and selfish and stupid and and short sighted. And he's like one of the very few characters who's able to actually be an adult. Um, it's really fascinating. He has a he has a line. Uh, he's talking to a scientist, and the scientist is very. Um, romantic and thinking about like what what they could possibly do what they could possibly explore you know what what could we possibly get by studying basically these these psychic people and he asks the colonel uh what do you believe colonel and he responds i'll tell you my job isn't to believe or disbelieve it's to act or not act and it's just such a good encapsulization of what must be the thought process of being in command of the military you know as I, i'm generally somewhat averse to themes but a lot of the reason the colonel is very interesting is that he's basically um an embodiment of, of of the theme of like responsible military leadership which isn't something i would usually be interested in but that's part of what makes him fascinating is that i would i have a natural aversion to him and, and in spite of that his character is just uh wildly fascinating um there's another scene where he literally shoots the messenger someone someone that that's where he instigates the military coup they bring him the message that uh, he's being stripped of his command and he literally tells them to shoot the messenger and it's probably the right thing to do it's just it's it's fascinating how um he's doing all of these things that on the surface seem uh horrendous and and and, and monstrous really but it's just what ap it's what has to happen um to save people's lives and the, the characters are very fascinating it's unfortunate that people probably haven't seen the film but maybe you should go watch it akira so uh, i've heard it's really it's good very, very i've good. seen I've seen clips and I've the animation's it gorgeous. I've watched the, it, but it's been a long yeah, time, so I don't remember it very well. <laughs> yeah, the the, ani the animation is usually regarded as like one of the most beautiful films ever made. That's pretty unquestionable, but it gets a lot less respect for its like story, which I think is quite good. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Akira stan, so go what, check it out. Um, with him being what you ended up choosing as your favorite character, what do you think it says about your preferences for seeing what like what things you see in characters what you like to see in characters so that that's kind of what's fast that's why it was so excruciating to choose because I, I i thought up all the different things that i would abstractly imagine to be really important and i realized that there wasn't any character that embodies all of them so like something that's really important to me are character relationships and um basically how character relationships change over time but that doesn't really happen in features all that much it, it's and TV shows have the time to pull that off, but you don't get super complex exploration of that in, in films all that much, right? Um, I mean, the the reason, I, I guess the reason to choose him is sort of, if there was a character that I would want to see more of, more than anyone else, and just to sort of explore like the mind of this character and to see what else he was up to, it would probably be him. Um, but yeah, like I, I, it, it's kind of fascinating that different characters are, are accomplishing wildly different things and i couldn't really think i i would i would be at my wit's end trying to come up with like a, a a handbook of what makes a good character because these people are so different like on my list you've got mulan you've got larry david from curb your enthusiasm right C tywin lannister kaden kotar from synecdoche new york like celine from before sunrise there's just nothing in common with these characters at all um they're wildly distinct and what makes them interesting and their place in the story and the kind of stories they're in. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just kind of the people that I, I guess I connect the most with and really would like to see more of um, on screen. Well, I guess not in Mulan. Never mind. Just don't. No more Mulan. <laughs> <laughs> Enough Mulan. Enough Mulan. 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 Well, all right. Um, all righty. We only have one left, Mister. Oh my Mr. Raggleton. Here at the end. <gasps> Who is Rounded your favorite out. character and why? Bringing up the proverbial rear. So I, I thought of a couple because there's a lot of characters I like. I was really close to maybe doing one that's unexpected. I almost chose Boris Sherbina from uh, Chernobyl. Uh, mm. hmm. Skarsgård's character. I really like him a whole bunch. Um, but we got to bring it back to Middle Earth. And in a not so surprising mm. pick. Yep. 
I'm going to go with Boromir. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I often put Boromir with Faramir because the two of them have a very close and intertwined relationship as far as it relates to the things they say and do. And of course, with their father, Denethor, um, it, it's a very interesting pairing slash triangle, depending on how much you want to zoom out of it. But uh, Boromir is uh, who I'm going to be picking for this uh uh, for this little EFAP episode. So, uh, Bormir is, I guess if you're super casual and you watch the fellowship of the ring, um, and you don't really pay too much attention and you're not, if you're dumb, you will hate Bormir. You will think that he's just a standoffish jerk who is standing as an antagonist and is getting in the way of our, our, our plucky Hobbit heroes and our man, Aragorn, and he's just being a jerk, and he just wants to do things for himself. But Boromir is a fantastically put-together character because he's one of the... I almost want to... So uh, let's just take you through the timeline here. And we're going to be using the definitive edition uh, movies for this, as we always should, the extendeds, right? Mm -hmm. So we first meet Boromir at the Council of Elrond, and he really wants to protect Gondor because from his perspective, and as is legitimately accurate, Gondor has kind of been standing between Mordor, its assaults, and the rest of Middle-earth, particularly at the key point of Osgiliath, the city at the river. And he's been fighting and fighting, and Gondor has been fighting and fighting, and men are dying. And this has made him understandably a little, a little upset. It's made him a little upset that his countrymen die and his people suffer and so much resource uh, resources of Gondor have been going towards protecting everyone else. And he thinks it's it's a little thankless, you know, that, that they're putting so much effort into stopping Mordor uh, from advancing. And so he shows up at the Council of Elrond with this perspective that he understandably has, and he wants to use the ring's power in order to defeat Sauron. Uh, not really coming to grasp fully with the idea of its corrupting influence, right? But at the council, it's decided that this fellowship of the ring, this jewelry brigade, if you will, is going to band together and they're going to deliver the ring to Mordor so it can be destroyed. And Boromir agrees. He, he even says after everyone gets together, you have my bow, my sword, my axe. Oh, aren't we great? Boromir comes in and says, if, that the, the fate of all of us rests in you, little one, talking to Frodo. So he understands that it is pragmatically within his best interest and everyone's interest, If even though it's not the ideal scenario that he wants and that Denethor wants, as we'll get to later, as we'll discover in the Two Towers, um, it, it is best that he cooperate. He's like the embodiment of a D&D &D group where every where you've got that one guy who doesn't really get his way, his his he, either the player or their character, it's it's really not ideal what the party wants to do. But he's like, you know what? It's still best for us if I help the party and we do what we need to do. And our success is far more important than my personal feelings on the matter anyway. So he goes along with um, the will of the council and he goes with the fellowship. And throughout the fellowship of the ring we see that Boromir, even though he can be a bit rough and a little bit standoffish, though for good reasons, he has an immense amount of care and practical concern that goes into the well-being of his companions, particularly to the ones who need it most. There is a scene where he is shown specifically training Merry and Pippin in swordsmanship and instructing them how to parry and block blows and that sort of thing, which is very, very important. Remember, excuse me, <clears throat> it was, I think when we were watching our Lord of the Rings breakthroughs, or breakthroughs, our <laughs> watch togethers or whatever, it was, this was before uh, the Rise of Skywalker came out. And we were joking that thanks to Boromir, officially, Merry and Pippin had more combat training than Rey Skywalker did. Because Boromir cares about the safety of the people in his party who are the least capable of defending themselves. He doesn't worry about Legolas. He doesn't worry about Aragorn and all the stuff that they can do. He's concerned about the hobbits, right? 
when they are escaping Moria, when they're leaving, right? You have that scene where they're walking down that that uh, definitely not OSHA approved staircase and part of it crumbles and it falls away and crashes into the chasm below. All of our heroes have to jump that chasm. They have to jump across. Well, I think Gandalf goes first and behind him is Boromir and in each arm he has Merry and Pippin. He is jumping across with these two hobbits because he knows they probably can't make the jump and he has to help them. What a Chad. Now, fast forwards a little bit to um, when, spoiler alert, uh, the Balrog takes out, you know, Gandalf and they fall into the pit. Uh, it is Boromir who runs back and grabs Frodo, who is a little dumbstruck by watching, you know, his friend fall into the chasm. It's Boromir who comes back. Uh, at least I think so. I might be remembering it, misremembering it, but I think it's Boromir who does that. He's very... he. He's very, I guess, goal oriented. You know, he takes action when he needs to. So we get to Rivendell after that. And not sorry, not to Rivendell. We get to the forest where Sarah Bourne and all of them are at. I'm having a blank on the name of it uh, now that I'm kind of put on the spot a little bit. But he has a conversation in the extended edition, the proper edition of these movies. He has a conversation with Aragorn about what he feels he has to do for you know, Gondor and how Gondor's suffering and how he, he it explains a great deal his relationship with Aragorn and understanding Aragorn's perspective, trying to get Aragorn to do what he needs to slash why are you behaving this way? We learn a lot about him. He's not a selfish guy. Gondor really is his top priority. He's seen enough suffering and he wants it to end, right? So we fast forward further and further and we get to Amon Hen. And at Amon Hen... Boromir, of course, he this is a, the scene where he's uh, he finally comes across Frodo in the forest and he tries to take the ring from Frodo. It, it's corrupted him enough. Being around it has corrupted him enough, even though previously he thought that it wouldn't do it. It turns out that uh, uh, men are easily corrupted, as, it, as we've been told before. So he tries to get the ring from Frodo. Frodo escapes and then Boromir realizes what he's done and he is he's He's he feels awful about it. He's he he basically weeps. He feels terrible that he's had this weakness and that he gave into it. And now the person that he needs to protect is running away from him for fear of their own safety. And after this, he, of course, fights and dies to defend uh, Marion Pippin in particular. Um, and he kind of he, and it's a really big deal in this world that Boromir dies and as Boromir is dying you know he he says you know if I was if, if I could live I'd follow you to the end Aragorn you're what's best for Gondor and Gondor is the most important thing um you, you know you're my king and things could have been great uh you know go get him for me and then he dies ah very sad um I think that when we were in episode 93 when we were talking about Boromir as a character in the Lord of the Rings it came up that the significance of Boromir's death is more vast than a lot of people might realize because of the familial, uh, I guess the, the family situation, the family drama with Denethor, Boromir and Faramir. But we don't really learn this until later. Uh, imagine if you will, if Boromir had survived Amon Hen, either he didn't get shot or he survived his wounds. Um, I thoroughly believe that he would have gone with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli to go and rescue Merry and Pippin because he legitimately cares about their safety. Uh, he's a good guy. He's very, he is very heroic and chivalrous in that aspect. Um, he would have been present at Helm's Deep, which politically is significant because he is acting as a representative of Gondor. So if he is risking his life to defend Rohan from uh the white wizard and is present at uh helm's deep that means a great deal between the movies as to gondor's uh relationship with rohan and rohan's uh their willingness to help gondor eventually they do but this would have definitely made that less of an issue because their direct representative essentially a, a quasi royal character uh, the son of the steward himself is there helping at helm's deep 
Now, even though it's not the most plot important uh, extended scene, that of course belonging to the death of Saruman. Oh yeah. Uh, I think my favorite extended scene is the scene between. Now, this is a. It, it takes place in the two towers. That's where the scene is in the film. But the event occurs before the event of the Fellowship of the Ring. It's at Osgiliath, and this is ap uh, after Osgiliath is recaptured from the orcs. Because it's sort of a tug, and war, uh, tug of war kind of uh, battle at Osgiliath between the orcs and between the men of Gondor. So Osgiliath is retaken by the men of Gondor from the orcs, and everyone's having a great time. It's a celebration. This is legitimately good. This is excellent. And Boromir's there and Faramir's there. And Denethor enters. He comes in to meet his sons. And it's a big, important celebration that they won this battle. And Denethor puts down Faramir. And he doesn't give him any respect. He says, if it wasn't for you, Faramir, Osgiliath would have never fallen and Faramir says, well, we, we were outnumbered. We didn't have enough men. If we had enough men, we could have held it. And Denethor was like, oh, you're just making excuses. You're not good for anything. And Boromir, he comes to bat for his brother. He says, father, this is a day of celebration. It, like all this praise, it belongs to Faramir just as much as me because we both retook the city. And he, he loves you. He wants to do everything he can for you. He fights and fights and fights for you. And... It shows how much Boromir is ready to stand up to his father, essentially, and advocate for his brother, who is legitimately a very talented and excellent human being as well. The both of these brothers are, and he's just not given what he needs to succeed, essentially, on multiple occasions by Denethor, as if Denethor is setting up Faramir to fail. As well, Denethor says that, Faramir, your failure, your failure reflects poorly on me. And because of the state of Denethor's mind, it makes you wonder, is, is Denethor trying to make Faramir fail so that it does look bad on him, so he can be mad at Faramir to justify his dismissal of him? It's not exactly clear, but I, I think you could make a pretty good argument for it. But in Osgiliath, after they recapture it, Boromir is the one who is sent to go get the ring. Boromir, he was, I mean, Faramir would have been a great choice, of course, because Faramir is a boss. But Denethor sends Boromir. He says, your brother would fuck it up. I want you to make sure it's done. I want you to get, you know, there's whispers that, you know, they have the one ring and, you know, that's a big deal. And you need to go get it for Gondor and things will be great. And we'll win this and we can stop all this bloodshed. At least in his mind, that's what's going to happen. Though it's also like, oh, are, are you just saying that because you're a bit corrupted by the, you know, yourself and you want the ring for you? And it's not super clear. But again, I, I think you can make an argument for it. So retroactively, which is probably why they cut this extended scene, retroactively we learn about Bar Boromir as a character and how much he cares for his brother. He sees the earnestness of, you know, Faramir and how much he tries and how it's not pleasing his father and his father's just shutting him down, putting him down. He sees in the same way how Merry and Pippin in particular, they don't really belong here, but they're, they're trying. They are putting themselves in danger on this quest. And so he respects that and he teaches them stuff and he watches after them. Hell, even before they get to Moria, when uh, the, the spell is being cast by Saruman on the, on the mountains to make them fall and kill the Fellowship, it's Boromir who says, we need to go because the little ones are going to perish, essentially. Those are, those are constantly his primary concern. And I think all of these together make Boromir a guy who is, it, it's a tragic story of an incredible guy who is understandably really kind of pushed to be corrupted in a way, not just by his human nature, but because of his experiences in his life concerning Gondor and the blood that he's spilled with his countrymen to defend the world, essentially. And I, it's tragic that a character like this had to meet that fate. It's a, it is a heroic death, but it is tragic all the same. And I'm super curious... What would have happened if Boromir would have lived? What impact did his death have on Denethor into driving him even further into madness? And what influences politically and militarily would that have had? Um, it probably would have had a lot of big consequences, but we can only speculate. But I've waxed long enough about my boy Boromir 
and uh, that that's my that's my choice. I I'm, think uh, in really E593, it was said by a certain armored skeptic that nobody would pick Boromir as a favorite character. That'd be lame. He, he changed when... his mind. He would, we showed <laughs> him the light. I think it's become clear that light. Boromir is the correct decision. He's a Boromir is fucking correct. legend. Um, I was I I I rewatched a scene or two just to sort of because he was on my mind. Um, to just sort of watch the things he says and his attitude. And of course, Sean Bean does an insanely good job of portraying this character. Um, it is, it, it's great to see how this movie, because this ties into why I picked it as my favorite story, or at least my favorite, I guess favorite movie in my mind was what I was sort of going with here for whatever reason. But they do so much with uh, a character like Boromir. And the more you look into him, the better he gets. And I, you know, he's one of those. You, he, a lot of the times in fiction, you have these characters that you enjoy seeing, and you really look up to them, and you see that you know they had a tragic end, and you just wish that it didn't happen. You wish they could have kept going on, and you wish they could have continued to be awesome into the future. But that's Boromir, my boy. I'm not sure Hooray. if you, I couldn't I know, catch you mentioned it. Just the the first thing he says to Aragorn after Lutz is dead. Not, the not the clear, little ones are they yeah, safe? Yeah. Well, he says yeah. they took the little <laughs> ones. Oh yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's so much material to sift through. That's the thing. Well, it's, it's just um, it's just indicative again of characters. Like it's not about can you even save me? It's they've got him. They got him. You got to go save him. They got him. They got him. I tried to stop him, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, I really respect the role that his death played in emphasizing just how dangerous the ring is. And then Frodo yes. all of a sudden realized, okay, I have to destroy this thing. And I need like to do it can on do my that own to Boromir. because of what it's yeah. doing and to my impact, friends. Yeah, the political that, impact of it. Uh, that awesome scene when Boromir loses his shit and tries to steal the ring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that scene. So yeah. good. Because yeah, he tries great. to justify it to himself. Yeah, he, you he know? says, like, my countrymen life. are, yeah, it, they're you know, dying. It could have been mine, it should be mine. Um, yeah. Uh, and then and the, the mouth, moment he snaps out of it, yeah, he's practically he weeping. Out, exactly. Can't believe I've done this. He it, he, he's so, he's well, so yeah, uh, done this. people had come away at so a certain point thinking he, he was kind of the dick, and it's just like, man, you watch the movie. <laughs> like, how do you how do you come away with that perspective when you see what happens the second that he realizes his mistake? Um, it's, I mean, I, I it, it would it was really easy for me to maybe pair this with Faramir because they are intertwined, and Faramir is another character I really really like, and I think it gets an unfair shake. Um, even more than Boromir does because he's sort of set up to fail by Denethor on multiple occasions, I feel. And he's been up to so much and he's so active in what he's doing in the, at least in the world, he's constantly working and fighting and he's very good at both of those things and he's doing his best and how he lets Frodo go. And I mean, he, he gets a great wife. I, you know, that's good, but uh, Faramir's great, Boromir's great, and I, I was, like I said, I was going to choose Boris Sherbina, or potentially, I, I'd mold it in my mind, I, I almost chose Rip, uh, who was, of course, the talking, magical, wisecracking skateboard, voiced by Dom DeLuise, who starred in the feature film The Skateboard Kid from 1993. I um, knew you were going to pick that, Yes, yeah. of course. But... I, I, gave it, I gave it a bit of thought. Uh, bit of a generic I choice. You know? more. Yeah, I, I, it would have been too obvious, but... Uh, and I think a case could have been made, but Boromir, see, we're going to go with. But I've think, been talking too much, so we can. I think Theoden as well. If we need. But then again, could have started naming great. all, They're all the great. characters in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that I, I like that. Yeah, I guess just everyone is amazing. And you I mean, have about same. storytelling. It's like, how much has Lord of the Rings come up? It's like, yeah, it's not a surprise, is it? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we'll never get another. I've just I've come to terms with the fact that we're never going to get hey, another look, the good show's movie. coming out this year. No. Yeah, I. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm going to watch it before I watch the trailer. We'll give it. We'll give it the Boba <laughs> Fett a, coverage. I'm sure. What's the uh, What's the word on the street about the Amazon show? Is it supposed to be like good or yeah, terrible or big poop, poop. Oh wow! Well, apparently, it's got like an enormous budget, something like four hundred sixty million dollars. Also, it must be good. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It's definitely, definitely expensive. Budget equals oh, no. good. 
Well, I mean, that's at least promising. I mean, maybe they could match like the technical elements of filmmaking, if, even if they can't match the storytelling. Uh, well, I mean, like, <laughs> at that point, it's just frustrating to see it go to waste, isn't it? I mean, it's sure. I, like, I'm trying to be optimistic, okay? I, I'm trying to be Okay, I Duma. So rarely Why don't Duma be optimistic? <laughs> yeah. Um, what, for the, I guess for those who don't know the deep EFAP lore, when I got absolutely schlammered on Metal Stream, I was just drinking, <laughs> like, straight uh that uh that honey bourbon that wild turkey man i was just whiskey (laughs) oh yeah it was i i was a horrific mistake and i remember afterwards in in stupor and in in an alcohol fueled days afterward (laughs) i had just walked away from the computer uh just i guess i was lost I, I, I distinctly remember laying in bed as tears streamed down my eyes crying for <laughs> boromir's death like i was it's like an actual person had died and it was a tragedy and i was so so sad it, it just because it, it, it's it felt it was so real it just felt so real that was, that was like by far my most watched vod on youtube by the way <laughs> well, oh when you God. when you type Metal Commander into YouTube, the top suggestion is drunk rags. Oh no! <laughs> oh, my alcohol is a pathway to your fame, Metal. Just... There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, if you remember, um, a redditor once attributed your like rags, your highest notable uh, successes to knowing me, and this is when I had like far <laughs> far fewer subscribers than you. That this was written this is the most notable thing you've ever done is know me. Well, so they they must think very highly of you. Matt is only famous met. via you, who's only famous via me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a complicated social networking web. Yeah. Um, my 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 next birthday is coming up. Prepare the bourbon. <laughs> oh my god! Once a year is enough. Once a year. <laughs> I have hit the randomizer because we are our final question. Oogly boogly boogly. I actually had four prepared as a backup. We will not need them. Um, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so that is apparently the order. So, John. What's the last question? What oh, is your favorite game. medium for storytelling and why? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'm not much of a book reader, but I think books are the superior form. Like, because you can go into an unlimited amount of detail, you can make it as long as you want. And uh, uh, you can explore everybody's mindset and uh, you can leave however much you want to the imagination. I mean, you, these same things apply to film, but with film, you have to be conscious of the fact that people's butts get sore, you know, um, in the seat. And uh, you, you got to wrap things up and like, three hours max i would say but you know you can take your time with a novel and really elaborate and uh i mean that's not to say the other um forms are substantially lesser i mean there's masterpieces in all in all the different mediums but uh, i mean i would say books are the the most uh efficient one at at telling like if you were to tell it like a masterpiece story you could probably do it most effectively in a book. Um, that's just when my you say take efficiently. On it. What do you mean? Um, well, just that you can the relatively enormous amount of detail that you can go into, I suppose. And you, you, uh, f- with film and television, you're kind of relying on the you know picture say a thousand words sort of thing, where you're what you're trying to convey to the audience might not entirely translate with the book it's like there's no you can leave no room for confusion you know it's just like this is what i'm trying to tell you um the what but between film and television uh as much as i respect film and i think more masterpieces have been made in film than television i think television is actually has the potential at least to be more superior than film because of the length of time that you can stick with one character and you can really explore a character across a number of seasons and uh you you just you simply can't do that with film you gotta you gotta really boil things down for like a for a movie experience 
And uh, yeah, I don't really have too much to say on it beyond that. That's that's uh, yeah, that's fair. That's what I think. Yeah. Which puts Duma number two. Yeah. So um, my answer is easily I I prefer film over every story over every other storytelling medium. Um, I think that film is able to take like the best parts of every other medium and combine them. Um, like the potential, like music on its own is like incredible, right? But music can also serve like music plus film accompaniment has so much more potential than just hearing a song. And like uh, a screenplay can take a lot of the elements oh, of I a like novel, it. not not all of them. Um, there's things a book can do that are are very difficult at, le at the very least to do in film and, and and like john said books can take their time um and books can uh you can interact with them you can interact with the story in much greater detail um but i think that the experience of watching a film is way more uh intense um in, in particular i think that film exceeds at suspension of disbelief and immersion um some a problem a huge problem i have reading books is i can always hear the author's voice and i have a very difficult time like actually suspending disbelief and immersing myself in the world, I always feel like someone is telling the story to me, and it kind of kills it. Um, like I, I can probably count on one hand the number of fiction books I've read in the last ten years. It's just very difficult for me to really get into. Whereas films, the, like the suspension of disbelief is immediate unless they fuck something up, right? Um, it's much easier, at least for me, to kind of immerse myself. Um, and something I definitely do agree with is that I think television has the potential to vastly outperform features. I just don't think it's happened yet. Um, I mean, probably for like budgetary and practical reasons. Um, there's also the idea that uh, television shows tend to go on a while, and most of them kind of go on until they kill themselves. <laughs> Seems to be um, the trend. You know, there there are. I could make a list probably of twenty, thirty, or forty television shows where. They have a particular season that's like a masterpiece. But how many shows can I point to that are a masterpiece in their totality? I don't know if there's 10. I mean, there's, maybe if I saw all of them, right, I, I could point out 10. But I, I could easily identify, you know, 100 films that I think are of the absolute top level of craft. Do but, it. Yeah, that's <laughs> happening with films as well, isn't it? That film series carry on until they kill themselves. That, yes, that, that, is, that is absolutely true. Um, I mean, I I personally would argue that just overall the quality of films has gone down substantially, unfortunately, in the last like decade. Um, it's really depressing to me to compare like the output of the last decade to like the '70s or the '90s or something like that. But that's a whole other. Conversation. That's when the Skateboard Kid came out. Hey, they, they're good decades. <laughs> There's a, a lot of banger stuff going on back then. Um, but yeah, television has an amazing potential. I just think that usually because of production reasons and, and practical limitations, there isn't enough time to fully map everything out. And, and when something becomes profitable, there's an incentive to keep it around until it goes sour, which is sort of my problem with it. Um, sometimes it doesn't happen and, it, and it's fantastic. But yeah, I, I, think, I think film is, I mean, film is easily my favorite storytelling medium. Nothing else really remotely comes close. But I do think that it has some advantages. I mean, the only... The only major competition I see is is literature. Um, I, I actually looked a good deal into storytelling in songs, and it's just not. I don't think it really competes with literature or film. Um, there are really good things about lyrics and music, but I don't think that it really gets close to the storytelling potential of these other mediums. Um, I haven't really explored poetry all that much, and like video games have the potential to tell great stories, but I, I mean, I think. They don't even need to the vast majority of the time. You know, if I listed my 30 favorite video games of all time, I couldn't even tell you the story of probably three fourths of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, there we are. Um, that puts Jay in the driver's seat for this answered question I mean, next. Can I just be a little cuck and say that they all have their merits and their own their own little things they're good for? Ooh. No, I, mean, Ooh. I wanted to do. <laughs> I find um, I find pick on one mediums and you hate all the other ones. Yes, to be particularly <laughs> interesting uh, on, on screen mediums to be particularly interesting because um, they seem to be um, one of the only mediums where the 
assumed format is baked into the medium itself. So people say film, you hear film, and people assume, oh, one installment story. And then, you know, if there are more things in the same universe, they're separate installments. Whereas TV, it's like, oh, this is um, something episodic that comes out in seasons. Whereas when you have, um, when people just say, uh, you know, prose, that doesn't really come with that assumption. You know, you get, you get novels, but a novel can still contain, like, a huge number of different formats. I, the, the, I feel it's less assumed what you're going to be doing with it in that case. Um, which I find to be quite interesting. So I, I'm not sure whether to include, I suppose, on-screen formats as their own uh, separate medium or to talk about TV and film separately and, you know, made for streaming productions. Um, but I suppose, I think, I, I, I guess they all do have their, um, their unique benefits. Um, I find that Video games are one of my personal least favorite for at least conveying a story. You know, I love games a lot, but, um, and I think this might be biased by the fact that I just haven't found many games that contain the s stories that would make me, you know, love the medium just for the story. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe Soma will be that for me when I finally play it. I don't know. But, um, yeah, Fringy. Yeah, I'm yeah. free now. But um, yeah, I, I find that I find just the the stories of video games generally less involving. Um, but I'm happy to accept this might be. Uh, I, I think that the reason for this often is the fact that um, a I mean certainly in a poor video game story you often see the story as an obstruction from the gameplay. Uh, I find a game to be one of these a medium that more often than not falls into the trap of there are two separate reasons you're there rather than every reason you're there for it comes together to form a cohesive whole. It's like um, the story of a game often is something that you appreciate on a separate level to the gameplay rather than the gameplay informing your understanding of the story, which um, creates an experience that I find to be, um, I mean, detrimental to the actual story itself, right? You know, when when there's something that's distracting you from, from the story that you're there to absorb. Um, and I the think for that reason, it's a lot... of dissonance kind of thing. Yeah, Sorry yeah, yeah. Well, don't, don't worry about it. If anyone else wants to... Shut up, Jay. Floor. I'm, I'm, I'm all, hey, not that one. Oh. Shut up. <laughs> um, it's the only medium that I think really has this this issue, but I also think it's a matter of, um, I think a perfect game would combine gameplay and story much more effectively than I think most games do, and that you would see a beautiful meld of. Um, the gameplay is actually in, informing your understanding of the the characters and the and the world and and the plot and the story. Um, I think maybe maybe game technology isn't there yet, but maybe one day we will even have a game where you can make decisions in the heat of gameplay and characters will react as those characters would react in real time. Something like that could be, you know, make video games the ultimate medium for storytelling. But we're not there yet, as, or at least I've not seen anything that delivers that yet. Have uh, um, you played Disco Elysium? I am not. You might, might, you might be interested in checking it out. I want to have a look at. I hear Disco nothing Elysium. but glowing things about Disco Elysium. Yeah, it's. Um, I I don't want to say too much about it because it is it is probably the only game that I've played where I don't want to spoil the story, and so I don't really want to talk about it that much. But like that makes sense. It, it, when when I when I start playing it, I feel like I'm immersed in a story that is doing something that couldn't be accomplished through film or literature. It's the only video game where I've ever felt that way. That it's really exactly like what you said. It's making a uh, unique advantage of, of the. Yeah, it's it's taking unique <laughs> advantage of the medium of being a video game and doing something that you would have to be a video game to tell a story in this way. Um, and it's it's very funny and yeah I I I couldn't recommend Disco Elysium enough. I but it, that this. is rare. I just I bought it as you were talking. Based. <laughs> it's not um, a sweet game pass. I just pecked for you. <laughs> so reminds me of a uh, Spec Ops: The Line. 
like doing something really unique with the fact that it's a video mm. game. Yeah. You, you can't really replicate that in film or any other medium. Yeah, and this is... What um you... this. Is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead first. I was going to go on a long tangent. My, yeah. my, my okay, so... Long... So I, I was just going to say, that there's a really unique quote, or a really unique idea I heard from uh, Alan Moore. There's a very strange documentary called The Mindscape of Alan Moore, which is pretty weird. Um, if you watch it, be prepared. It's pretty weird. But he he's the guy who wrote Watchmen. And he's talking about a lot of his thoughts about um, the, the film industry and the, and the industry of, of comic books and stuff like that. And he said, um, they wrote Watchmen to maximize the medium of a graphic novel or a comic book or whatever. They wanted to do things that could only be done in a comic book. And so he said that it was like fundamentally unadaptable because so many of the things that make that an endearing piece of literature um, couldn't exist in other formats. They were specifically trying to do things that maximized um, the format of, of a comic book or graphic novel. And I heard exactly the same things from Tarantino when he was talking about um, his, uh, the things he prioritizes in filmmaking. He, he specifically wants to do things that maximize the medium of film. Um, and this is, uh, he, he's often given this response to people be like, why are your movies so violent? And part of his response is because violence looks so good on film. You know, film does violence better than any other medium can, partially because mm -hmm. of the suspension of disbelief and the immediacy um, of the experience. So I, I think in general, that's that's a really good goal to aspire for as an artist in, in whatever it is that you're doing, is you, you really want to do something uh, intrinsic and unique to the, to the the medium you're working with. And yeah, and video games, there's a the potential there, but yeah, Disco Elysium is the only example I've seen. It's a great point, yeah. Hmm. Uh, rags? Ha, ha, I'm hi. Not, not done. I think Jay said, Jay said they're here. done, they so said, I guess you'll too. Jay said they're done. <laughs> Always do a little, little piece about TV and books and film, wow, that's cuck. okay. I guess that's it's like alright. That's like three things. You need to choose one. Yeah, you can't well, just have three. I want to say, because uh, I feel like video games are a unique medium in what they are able to offer, and everything else is just sort of a matter of choosing the right medium for your story in terms of um, there are things that it is much more natural to convey as information in a in prose and uh, than it is in, in a visual medium and vice versa, where you have, you know... Um, if you're if you're showing some something on film, then you're always conveying, um, well, almost you're com you're always conveying the the emotions, the expressions of any character whose face is in frame. You're always conveying, or almost always conveying, the environment that they're in and the distances from characters for each other. And like, like there's, um, make, you know, it's it's a much more natural medium to exact for example, convey the logistics of a fight scene very effectively. Um, where in, whereas in a, um, a, 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 in the medium of prose, basically you're just going to have a fight scene described to you. And in many ways, you're just going to have to accept that that's the way it went because you can't actually see physically, you know, where the characters were standing when this began and, and, and their size compared to each other. You could, or you only have the information that the author has chosen to give you. Whereas visually you can see basically everything. And I think um it's it's really interesting to see um what well, it's a matter of choosing a, a medium for a particular story or knowing the strengths of your medium rather and not trying to do things that would be more suited to a different medium because i don't know maybe that's the medium you, you truly want to be working in or whatever that was my answer i think that's a good point Based. jay congratulations thank you jay. rags because think of all those, all those, uh, like trying to use a, I think fighting and fight scenes are an excellent way to sort of have that. It, it's a really good example because trying to describe the nitty gritty little, little things about a, a sword fight, right. In text form is, I mean, it, it would be, that would, that would probably suck. Yeah, whereas uh, you know, if, you're on, if you're on screen, right? Yeah, and you want to just, just you want to convey it. a characters in a monologue that might seem really unnatural. Um, <clears throat> you want to convey like a character's deep inner thoughts. You're either going to have to do that in voiceover, or find or have them maybe, or, or just find a way to imply it through their dialogue. And you may not be able to find a, 
a way that is um, just as natural as, as it would be to be able to just tell your um, your your readers that by just putting it in the prose. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, my <laughs> pick for best medium to convey a story uh, is I have a feeling that Fringy's gonna agree with me, but I'm gonna say okay. games. Wow, Jay just mm -hmm. said games kind of suck compared to the rest of them. I, I hey, dude, don't you know that games yeah. suck? Wow. Rats? I shan't confirm or deny whether or not. Games bad. Games do suck. Uh, I'm however, pretty sure that Lego Star Wars the video game is not as good of a story experience as the Star Wars films. Um, Which films? Because it might be better. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Get correct. So... I'm going to say games, but I'm not going to specify video games <gasps> because the umbrella of games as a medium, I That's think cheating. for this, uh, for the purposes of this question is best served if I give my top tier answer, Whoa. which is game. Sure. But specifically tabletop role playing games. I knew it. No, so a <laughs> Pathfinder, d, &D Vampire the Masquerade, whatever it may be, right? Is very unique. So games are unique automatically because they have a an, an, an interactive component. They require you to do things. Uh, you're not just a passive observer. You need you need you as a player. In some cases, if we're going to get meta, some games, Stanley Parable, for instance, uh, require you to do things. And but most games are the player playing as a character in that universe either role-playing as whoever they want to be or as kind of a character that already exists in that world. But tabletop role-playing games, on top of the necessarily interactive component that a game has, is that it is, it's live, and you have a person, a game master, a dungeon master, a GM, or a DM, I'll probably alternate uh, between you know using as we go here, but essentially, you have a DM who is the storyteller and the guide, uh, if you will. They're the one who puts together worlds and stories. They do the work of being the NPCs, describing events as they happen. And there are other players who play generally as a character that they create to exist within whatever world that the GM is essentially setting out for a campaign or for a more sandboxy kind of adventure or whatever they want to do. And what this does is it gives a unique scenario where you essentially have a live curator or a live storytelling master who can on the fly in response to something that a player does have the world change in specific ways. So we already have um, the interaction of a game, the impacts that that has on the world but it allows for players and their in, uh, in their consequences, the things that they do, to transcend something that is already built for you. Most games don't really have a wide scope of things that you could do that's meaningful in terms of a narrative. Generally, games that do, they mark this as a big selling feature. Uh, even things like Fallout and uh, be it an Elder Scrolls game or a Witcher game, or anything like that, where there are multiple pathways to get through the game, they're still very limited in the things that you can do and the things that you're allowed to do. It's all pre-coded and kind of pre-approved in a sense. Whereas this is opened up to a much, much, much larger degree if you have someone, a, a, a human mind there, um, especially if they're talented and dedicated, who can give you... The, the feedback for the things that the characters do. And I love books. I, I've fallen out of reading them mostly because of the time investment that it takes. And I've loved many, many books. Um, I of course love movies. It would be difficult to be a member of this podcast without liking movies. Mm -hmm. I like TV shows. I enjoy smoke signals and pictographs. They're all great, but I've always been a, I think I'm a gamer at heart. I enjoy the doing of things. I enjoy the challenge of progressing through these things. And I don't feel like there's any reason why a, a game, specifically a tabletop role-playing game, um, has to suffer because of its uh, because of the medium that it is. 
A book, for instance, is not going to have a visual component to it, for better or worse. But it is it is a it is a hindrance on what they can provide. And maybe that's kind of a good thing that people might enjoy about them, but it simply isn't a part of them. Uh, and they're also not interactive. Um, you the only interaction you have with the book is maybe the conjuring up the aesthetics of it. Choose your own adventure. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's true. You have a choose your own adventure. But in a sense, I suppose that's a game. Uh, but even then, they're, they're so very limited. Uh, though I guess that's not necessarily a constraint of the medium. It's a constraint of how many pathways do you want to design. But I, ha I hadn't considered choose your own adventure books. I had a cool Indiana Jones one when I was growing up. Best um, medium of all time is choose your own adventure books. Oh my goodness. Um, and of course, movies, you have the visuals. We are visual creatures primarily. It helps us immensely to be able to see things. Um, the, the, you know, being able to show something and all that it means, uh, I, I think that could be very, very efficient, um, especially when you have limited time. But I think that if you have a really good GM who is talented and who is smart and who is good on their feet, that you can potentially provide the greatest storytelling experiences because you can put players into the roles of characters to do things and to make decisions and to have all those things be things that the participants are doing themselves. And I, I think that's the best way to, I think it's certainly my favorite way to tell a story, right? When I feel like I'm a part of the world, when I'm part of something. Um, and I have to really think about, you know, how do I differentiate between myself and this character that I want to play? What would my character do in this situation? And I have to think about the logic of what they might think in the scenario that they're in. What am I willing to sacrifice both in a meta sense, because it's a game, you have often skills and abilities and things like that, but your character also has motivations. They have personalities, they have goals and they have principles and they have limits to what they're willing to do to get the things that they want. Um, and that offers such a unique experience that I think that's the think that's the best way to tell a story is to stress your participants to become involved and to see what they do and to present to them a world and a setting where they can do those things so that's what i'll say a beautiful I, answer I didn't, yeah I, I think it's i think it's all right i'm glad we got D, &D representation i think a lot of people are very happy about that yeah i i, I really have again. become quite interested in tabletop role-playing games and what they can provide. I would be very interested to see us do one sometimes, especially with all that we talk about in terms of stories and characters and what they do to be able to sort of craft these things for ourselves and to come up with characters and ideas that we curate and that we guide based on the references that we have and our thought process when it comes to consistency and, you know, our, our big storytelling, you know, the facets of that that are important. I think it'd be interesting. Bringy, what about you? What do you think? So, I think when it comes to the, uh, the idea of, like, what is the best medium for storytelling, I suppose there's, like, the three factors. One, what is your favorite? Two, which one do you think has the highest number of, like, the best stories ever? And then three, which one do you think, like, at peak provides the best storytelling experience? Um, I'm not sure what I would say in terms of my favorite one, because I do like a whole bunch of them. Um, real like films, video games, uh, books, um, TV shows, of course. That's basically all of them. Um, in terms of the one that I think has the highest quantity of, like, top tier uh, content, I'd probably say it's film feels like we get a lot of there are a lot of great films to latch onto i think doom mentioned it before seemingly just by virtue of the way that fil uh, television shows tend to be produced it's hard to find a tv show that is consistently great from beginning to end usually it goes on for too long and then deteriorates at the finish line or at least that seems to be common um which is unfortunate uh because in a lot of ways if you were to compare like film and television it seems like having as little as, you know, like, three episodes, but as much as a hundred episodes, or even more than that, um, 
that that just by having that, if we had like comparable budgets, comparable time to produce them, then TV shows would have like more potential than film. But I think that the medium that has the most potential for like the widest breadth of really great experiences with storytelling would be games. Uh, I think th that just makes sense to me um, because a lot of games can do what film television do. Um, but then there's also things that f uh, video games are very uniquely poised to do that uh, no other medium can, which is the interactive element. Um, and then you think about the varieties in terms of interactivity. You can go as straightforward as like Mass Effect, where it's like, you know, you make choices that influence the how the story progresses. And you can get into stuff like environmental storytelling. How does a video game, Im uh, how does a film present to you an environment that you can explore and read tidbits about and overhear conversations like you can in a stealth game or uh, give you the branching choices with as much depth as you can get in like uh, a video game like Deus Ex. Um, and, um, you, you know, like exploring an environment like in Metroid or um, video games give you the capacity to go at your own pace, which can both benefit and detriment the experience. And of course, video games can have the problem of ludonarrative dissonance where uh, the story that's being presented is uh, very much mismatched with the gameplay. But that feels to me more like an error in the in the process of like the decisions that you're making in terms of the game. I think Matthew Matos has talked about it in like Bioshock Infinite. You didn't have to make it a first person shooter, but you did. And because you did, there were some serious compromises to the story, whereas... Mm -hmm. Abe's Odyssey, which was the comparison, had chosen to tell its story. It chosen to be a certain type of game that uh, blended with the story that they were trying to tell, and then you can achieve a similar effect, um, a similar story more effectively. Uh, I think, I think the problem is when I think about a lot of my favorite stories, a lot of them aren't video games. Uh, there are a lot of video games I think have cool stories and cool worlds. Um, uh. You know, you think about, like, the world of Halo is really cool, the world of Thief, um, Splinter Cell, you know, like, Deus Ex, uh, like, Zelda, the, you know, there's a lot of cool worlds in video games, it seems like. Um, but I, you know, I don't... Th yeah, I, when, when I think about, like, my favorite stories, generally I'm going to be leaning to, you know, towards, like, uh, TV shows, films, books, and stuff. But then there there are some in video games that I really like. Um, plenty of games I have that have really cool stories. I but I I think it's a matter of video games have like the most potential to provide some really fucking cool and uh, very diverse set of storytelling experiences. Um, but I I don't know what, that we're there yet. Um, but hey, who knows? Maybe maybe soon. Yeah, it's sort of similar to my experience. There's a lot of games where I feel super immersed in the world and. And things mm -hmm. feel lived in and, and real but that's i mean that's not storytelling to me completely you know you need uh something going on right when you start looking at the the pieces of like character and plot and whatever um well, yeah it just hasn't risen to the level of film yet for me i think a big limitation uh the video games have which is entirely self-imposed is that a lot of video games revolve around killing things and when you, you know, when you think about the number of stories that revolve around, like, killing things as a very central element of the plot, it's pretty small. Like, even think about Die Hard, it's like there are plenty of scenes where there's no action. There's just a lot of downtime where characters are talking um, and getting development. Whereas, like, when you think about video games, there is an expectation, I think it's a fair expectation, that the majority of the content is going to be gameplay. Uh, and if you do, like, an Uncharted thing where the majority of the gameplay is shooting people, um i think that that limits the number of stories that you're going to be able to tell and it is a limitation that is not necessary right because you got a lot of like adventure point and click adventure games that are very very much focused on story like monkey island and stuff like that where um and then you see like the benefits of that right where you can focus a lot on a on the writing and i guess there might even be an element now of like with so much of the emphasis on multiplayer games it seems like um you lose a bit in terms of the amount of uh, teams that are like exploring the variety of different ways that you can do uh, storytelling. But then, but then there's a lot of indie developers who are exploring that a bit more. So maybe it balances out. I think it's really tricky with video games because as soon as you bring in the interactivity element, you 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 introduce like 
like the player is going to do the exact opposite of like what the game wants you to do. Like you, cause a lot of gamers will take the least obvious path to pick up all the, you know, secrets or you just do all the side quests first or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's very hard when you think about an open mm-hmm. world game, how do you keep the story chugging along? How do you, how do you deal with pacing when once you go into gameplay, the player in a lot of ways sets the pace um yeah i think you got two options one well you got more than two options but the 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 common options is one you railroad them hardcore and you make it so they can't like max pain 3 is a really cool story i like that game a lot but you you can't venture off the beaten path there is a very clear way that you need to go and the game will stop constantly to be like all right story time like full-on cutscene story time slow walking time um, and then you end up with a pretty cool story, but like, if you want to actually have some freedom with it, then you're out of luck. And then on the other side, I guess you have something like Red Dead Redemption 2, another Rockstar game where you can just decide to spend like 10 hours going out fishing and playing poker. How do you maintain the urgency of the story when, uh, when you're allowed to do these things and, and do as much mm. as you want, um, off the beaten track? Right. It's, it's really hard to, um... Wait, sorry. Someone in chat said Heavy Rain is a great example of excellent storytelling through gaming. I disagree. Um, I actually think that the Quantic Dream games are a pretty bad example. I, Quantic Dream games feel to me like um, the very limited mindset of, can we make games more like films? Um, is this David Cage shit? Huh? Is this, da- is this the David Cage shit? Yeah, Quantic Dream is the David Cage stuff where it feels like we are missing the... Uh, Jason. The... The it, right where, where we're trying to make it more like films, Jason. and I mean it's kind of like you can get some really cool. Like The Last of Us is a really cool uh, game, and I I like the story in The Last of Us a lot, and it's definitely more leaning towards being cinematic. That's an experience that you can offer, but uh, you do sometimes wonder if it feels like that is a not really fully taking advantage of the medium in the same way that you see with a uh, less conventional. I haven't played uh, the game. What's it called? Stanley Parable? Mm-hmm. Like, isn't that a game Very that, good. that has a really cool story, but that it's really a story that would only work as a video game? Mm-hmm. I, I think it can only work as a video game. Right. And so that that feels to me like uh, the stuff that I find really interesting is what can we do? It's one of the reasons why I like stealth games so much, because when you think about environmental storytelling, stealth games are really good at that. It's like, here's a place... We're going to put a bunch of information in this place that you can piece together to tell a story. And if you listen to over here, conversations, read stuff on the computers and notes and things like that, and just generally observe the way that even like if you're playing a game where there's a target, how they navigate the environment, there's a lot that you can pull as a story that you don't really get in a film or a TV show. I've got to um, say, I, I completely agree with like the whole environmental storytelling being awesome, particularly in stealth games, but... My least favorite form of that is like reading notes and computers and stuff. Uh, I think it, just... I think it's hard. It depends on how well written all that stuff yeah, it's is. Gonna be dependent. It's super interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, always, I always feel like uh, Thief is a really... I will never b- stop being impressed by this decision, but in the old Thief games, uh, you'd get a map for the place that you're going to go to, but the maps are diegetic. They're like written in... They're, they're handwritten piece of paper like that just is this is a map and at the beginning of the game you get super detailed maps and the explanation is well this person you know they worked on the manor that there was a a maid or something there and they gave me this really detailed map uh but then as the game progresses the maps start becoming more obtuse because there's information that's just missing where it's like he managed to get this far but he couldn't get any further this is the best that i could come up with as a map it's like how fucking cool is that that it's like the map is telling a story of how uh, of like the history of this place because of the lack of information um that is available for that location what a cool idea and that's something you could do in films and and television and books and stuff as well but like when you think about it in a video game and the fact that it means that you as the player have no choice but to experience this situation in the way that i think that's the the cool thing is it, it aligns you more with the with with garrett uh the like the player character because you don't have extra information. Like, you have as much information as he has. And I guess that's the interesting thing when you think about storytelling, uh, is that when it comes to video games, do you want to put a wedge between the player and the character, or do you want to make it non-existent? And what are the benefits of that? Like, when you think about Halo, 
it's an explicitly stated goal is that they made Master Chief as like as much of a blank slate as possible because it means that you are Master Chief and like you're in a certain sense you're a passive observer in the cutscenes but an active participant in gameplay. Uh, conversely, you know, when you have a game, I, I guess like The Last of Us 2 is probably a good example, right? Abby is a, is a character. She is a person with defined goals. Um, and, 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 but, but the problem is like, if you, if you can't associate with that character, and in fact, if you actively dislike her, it's going to be really hard for you to continue playing that game. Um, and so it's that awkward part of like, how do you balance that? Do you, do you put that in the, the gameplay? Do you have a character who's super well realized? Uh, in cutscenes, but then they never say anything in the gameplay, um, and it's always entirely in your control. Um, and and you know, I, I mean, it seems like erring on the side of caution tends to work. Where you think about like the old Ratchet and Clank games, where they had a lot of dialogue and a lot of characters talking to each other, having fun banter and good conversation. But when it was gameplay, it was gameplay, and nobody talks. Versus in the the remake, where everybody's constantly fucking talking, and then you hear the same lines over and over again as well in some games and it really takes you out of it. It's like, it is, it's yeah. difficult. It's difficult there is in the wind. If yeah. to give credence to the tabletop role playing game aspect is when you have, well, these are often cooperative games essentially. And you could have an NPC and a character. I mean, technically it's a PC because the GM is a player of a kind, but you could have a player in a world or a character in a world and all of the different players could be interacting with this character and you could be running based on their relationship with them and the things that they do and say to that character. You can have that same character almost simultaneously having two or three or four different stories. Whereas if you have like a movie, uh, there's only kind of one way that you see them behave in the events or as in something that's more interactive and on the fly, uh, providing, of course, you have a good storyteller, but there's always a storyteller in a story. Um, you can see how this kind of character can be fully realized by putting them into multiple different scenarios within the same story. To me, playing the Quantic Dream games is a bit like Netflix asking you if you're still watching. <laughs> to press x to continue <laughs> or it's it's it goes too far on the side of being a movie where it, it just makes the interactive component feel meaningless like it just gets yeah, no, played it's like, this might have well just be a movie yeah exactly that's the way you arrive at it's like why would i not just watch a film like at this yeah. point but I it is hilarious game we played not too long ago that kind of almost made like it had a bad story with a bunch oh, of asshole hope. loser characters little hope and it yeah, little hope, and it was uh, barely a game. So it like took the took aspects of both story and game, and they were both terrible. It's like the worst the possible scenario. way to. Yeah, it really was. It's a nightmare scenario. It's the worst of both. Yeah, that's the thing. What do you do at that point? Like, if, if it, it is the conversation, right? Like, you can have a great game with a bad story, but you can't have a great game with bad gameplay. That just seems to be like a general rule of thumb. Um, and if so, then, you know, how much, how much should you be prioritizing, uh, story versus gameplay? When you it, consider it is... that a, like a film or a book, they have to have stories because that's what they are. A, a game, game doesn't, have, to have, a doesn't have to have a story. A story is optional. So they, they don't necessarily need to put their resources and effort and talent into, making one of those if they just want to make something that's like purely gameplay. Yeah, a mistake that often gets made is sort of shoehorning in story into games that don't need it. That that's probably why it gets a bad rap a lot of the time. I mean it's similar to how films just kind of jam in a romantic yeah. subplot when they don't need it. Those yeah. are usually pretty bad. Storytelling in gaming is so much younger than film and certainly books. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's got room to grow. Yeah. We've had thousands of years of books and we've had a about a century 120 of, like, yeah, film. yeah films and like we've had 70 years of tv more than yeah. that even 80 and you know same for like and stage then, plays with thousands of years as well um as so far as games go we've had performance is still very old and yeah. games are what like 40 years 30? old 50 years old 
And I mean, yeah, games terms have of... stories that are really important to them. That's only been a thing since like the late nineties. Uh, well, and yeah. no, I don't want to say that. No, no, no. Cause there'll be so many, there'll be so many ones that actually did try to do stories in the early nineties, like earlier final fantasy games and like those Mario RPGs and stuff like that. Those text, yeah, for um, those text-based uh, RPGs. Text-based adventure games. It's taking ages for them to be taken seriously. Because I, I don't want to buy it, because it's one of the things that always annoyed me when it... 2013 was like a particularly bad year for video games, from what I remember. Like, there weren't a lot of games that came out. A lot of the games that got praised, like Bioshock Infinite, was just like dog shit. Yeah. Um, and it felt like the era when it's like, ah, see, video games are finally starting to tell yeah. stories. I hate it. I hate it so much <laughs> because when you think about a lot of the best stories in video games, you can pull a lot of them from before that time. God damn, the early days of like PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and I guess you can include Dreamcast as well. Oh boy, we had a lot of games with great stories and great writing. Great, great, great writing. Like the Guys Jack and Baxter series had great writing. Um, I always know that people talk about Metal Gear Solid, that that has cool stuff going on in it. The Grand Theft Auto games. Oh, those are some well-written, like, we're talking some tight, like comedy and and world building, uh, and and all that. Sorry, and, uh, Freddy, can you can you justify saying that Jack and Daxter has great writing? Jack and Daxter Ooh. is incredible. Jack and Daxter is super. So to clarify, I think that the like Jack Two story. <laughs> I don't think that that works. I'm pretty sure that it doesn't work. Yeah, I'm just thinking, but, like, Jack 2's story doesn't really work. Jack but, 1 barely has a story. And Jack 3 is probably the strongest of the bunch, but it still has a lot of the problems. And But, but yeah. great fucking characters and super sharp dialogue. That's, that's true. Uh, that's the thing. And, and it's interesting to think about because I'm not sure how many people have said this, but, like, Jack and Daxter, the writing in those games may well be sharper than Uncharted in terms of dialogue. Um, oh, and, and also someone's mentioned Sly Cooper. Fucking great. Like, surprisingly great story, considering what it is. Fringy um, thinks that furry games have really good stories in them. I was oh, about God. to say that Ratchet and Clank is really sharp and <laughs> funny too. And that's, that's a 50-50. It's a robot game too, so... Um... Well, I mean, like, the opposite, like, a, a human version of a furry is a fleshy. Yeah. A skinny? Fleshy. Um, um, well, on that note, my answer would be that it seems to me the potential in games is all the other ones put together. At least it could be. Um, mm -hmm. I know that there's a distinction to be made that, well, yeah, but you still have to, like, engage with it, though. So that's a level of interactivity, or the interactivity as opposed to like just watching, that can take away from being immersed. And that's actually the way I would kind of tackle the question. I find my immersion currently, um, it seems to be film is the best bet. Um, it would be TV, if only they were more consistent, but as Fringy went over, the shows, it's so fucking hard to find a TV show that can stay consistent. Uh, films are a much lower gamble because... Hey, you can find a lot of TV shows that say consistently bad. Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Netflix um, comedies, apparently. But then games, I think, at their very best, and I've experienced a couple, have been fucking phenomenal. Um, in terms of, but the thing is, like, there's, there's just... I don't find... Well, in my, maybe it's because of the fact that I don't consume as many games as I do films, but uh, films just seem more reliable. Though I, I guess what I'm saying is... I probably pick film, but I think gaming is currently the winner uh, if they were all pushed to their best. Outside of maybe if VR pushed to its best, where you're like that level of immersion, where it's and it's like you know fucking top tier production, everything looks incredible. I imagine that level of storytelling, where you're walking around in a world yourself, like that's probably going to be one of the most incredible ways to consume stories as well. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th I think for now because gaming has music in it, it has reading in it, it has the visuals, the splendor, and it has the ability for the the creators to take the camera from you and show you what they want to show you. So like a an author intended experience, or they can have it so that you're free to explore as you wish. Like it just seems gaming is the um, a step up again. I guess uh, to interject because I think John touched on it briefly, but it's probably worth talking about. Is that when it comes to like books which we haven't talked about a lot i think books have a unique strength uh in, in the same way the video games have a unique strength books also have the unique strength in that uh the the like 
there's something about prose and just the fact that you have to like imagine what's happening that there's a certain effect that you can achieve with with books in terms of like really um provoke uh, i guess not provoking evoking uh emotional responses to like things that you otherwise wouldn't get emotional responses to as easily in like film a really good description of like a cold breeze can kind of like emulate that effect in you uh in a way that you don't necessarily get by like watching somebody be cold on a screen um I mm -hmm. see where you're coming from. I think this is a problem of it's between people, though, because you could have the one guy say, when they described Rivendell, I was imagining this incredible place. When I saw Lord of the Rings and saw Rivendell, I was like, oh, well, that's fine, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then flipping it, you could have someone who was like, man, it looks so much better in the movies than I had imagined. Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting one, because I often hear people say this, where it's like, well, with books, it's your imagination, and there's no imagination in, like, film. It's presented to you, and it's like, yeah, you know what? That could be really fucking cool. I don't like. I don't. Well, like, I don't want to discredit the idea of somebody else creating something really awesome that I can look at. How I don't want to. Like, cool? Yeah, like watching that Balrog. It's like, I guess I could have come up with something well, better in my imagination, I guess it's, but it's the idea of what's impressive about Looney Tunes, I could just imagine Bugs Bunny doing all this crazy shit. It's like, well, the craft of the animation. That's like a really big part of it. It's a really yeah. cool experience that you can get, and it's something you get, right? Like, that film, television, visual mediums, and of course, like, you know, books can't leverage music either, or sound. They can evoke sound, but, like, music, I guess, is kind of absent, um, or at least, like, score non-diegetic music. Um, film and television, they definitely have an edge over books in that regard, in that the barrier between the audience and what's happening in the reality of the story is at its thinnest where you're mm -hmm. just you're seeing what's I happening think seeing real people uh really helps me get immersed in stories like it's, yeah yeah I think, I think so um yeah and i guess it's uh it's kind of a i guess we haven't really i'm not sure if this is worth clarifying but i guess animation we're not including as a in this in the same way that we're talking about like film and television and stuff because of the fact that animation is present in film television and games yeah yeah i figure that makes sense because to we're clarify very... animation is fucking cool yeah I contrary to animation is awesome. random weird thoughts some people have is like we're very pro animation here okay Just, i don't know yes, I, very i'm not pro sure animation, why that yeah. would i guess like you know, The Simpsons is an animated show, right? <laughs> Look at all the references. What? We can't go an episode without a Simpsons yeah, reference going to Simpsons nobody in particular. Futurama, <laughs> South Park, Family Guy, even, and um, Archer, we recently Looney talked Tunes. about Smiling Friends. We watched Smiling that like, day Wally, one. Like, all of the Pixar classics, a lot of the Disney classics, 101 Dalmatians we watched, and that was such a pleasant, quaint experience. Yeah, you guys saw we were the happiest with the stuff. first one. It was the next that's two. One Punch Man, all right? You know, yeah. and, uh... I like Death Note, and I've been liking Cowboy Bebop. That's a cool show. And Acura. Duma brought up I, I I think I will watch Acura um, based on the recommendation. I've always heard really yeah, good I things see about it. that film. Oh, man. Like, hit me up when that. you see it. I'd be curious to know what you think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a... It's a I, I think it's an incredibly good film, but it's also very weird. <laughs> and I'm, I'm I, always well, curious to see what people what people's I reaction is. Be, I... I because I'm not super familiar with anime, but um, I know that Akira is often referenced as one of the more influential uh, anime, like up there with like Ghost in the Shell and stuff. Because they're both kind of probably the single most right? influential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, it's very cyberpunk. And I guess that's interesting because a lot of the I know that I've seen comparisons, and maybe I would change my mind if I watched the films, uh, like the anime films that uh, Blade Runner was significantly influential in uh, the development of the style of uh, like cyberpunk anime, which I guess is interesting, again, because Blade Runner was obviously influenced in some way by Japanese aesthetics. Yeah, there's um, a big yeah Japanese uh, uh, cultural component in a lot of cyberpunk stuff now. A lot of I, Japanese I, yeah. writing and words and... You know, which the uh, presence of Japanese companies makes Deus Ex super interesting because like Deus Ex doesn't have as much of that compared to a lot of other cyberpunk. Deus mm -hmm. Ex has a much more industrial. No, I don't want to because there's a lot of cyberpunk anime stuff that has like industrial. It just seems like it has less of that. Like uh, so, definitely the the reboot games have much more of like a sleek Western minimalist. 
kind of thing informing the designs. A uh, really, really right, quick right note, uh, responding to yeah, someone in chat, they said, you're better off reading the Akira manga as the movie is a fraction of the story. Um, I don't think the movie or the manga are particularly better or worse. They're just profoundly different. I don't even, I don't regard them as the same story, honestly. Yeah. Like the, the, the plot's completely different. Some of the characters are completely different. Uh, the emphasis is, are, I mean, it, it's, it's insane how different the manga is from the film. Um, I mean, they're, they're pretty much distinct. I, like if you read the manga and then saw the movie, you would just be confused. I think you're like, wait, uh, nothing, uh, the same happens. <laughs> now, this is <laughs> interesting to me because I haven't read a lot of manga. I read, uh, I've, in fact, I think the only ones I own is All You Need Is Kill, which I thought was really cool. And uh, I think the first volume of One Punch Man. And I read the first volume of One Punch Man before I watched the show. And like, it was uncanny. Like there were certain uh, like key frames that were just pulled directly from the comics. I think yeah. when I watch that, I'm like, dude, is this like, is the anime like a one to one adaptation of manga? Is that like how yeah, it works? Pretty much is. Pretty much is. Uh, yeah. So, sometimes. Um, Some, right. Okay. I mean, in the case of in the case of Akira, like, I, I, I'm assuming that nobody wants me to go into the details of the differences, no, but it's profoundly it's different. Yeah. I mean, like, almost every, almost every single character has meaningfully different characteristics. The plot is totally different. It's like they said, it's way longer. There's like, pl like, there's plot lines that don't. It, it's it's very very different. Yeah, I guess that is the thing though. Of like, if you're adapting a long manga and you're turning it into a film, you're gonna have to make decisions about what to. I mean, it's always the conversation, right? Of like adaptation when it comes to film of something that's much bigger than that. Is uh, what do yeah. we keep? What do we cut? What are the essentials? And I mean, it seems like generally a book. Like a full length book doesn't strictly translate to a two hour film. Like there's often more stuff in a book. Um, oh, so, someone uh, mentioned in chat, by the way, which is worth clarifying. Blade Runner was inspired by some French comics because France has yeah. had, and I think still has a very active and prevalent graphic novel scene, which is like big in popular culture. Let's go for it. Mubes. Speaking of that, yeah, uh, Metal. Oh, we haven't talked about the last that, one. Uh, the wanna, last wanna... and the least again. Sorry. Wait, no, we didn't talk uh, comic books. Okay, How fine. Can you just yeah, leave? It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I can just. No, I, I just, I just <laughs> figured because maybe that will influence your decision. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't, no, don't, <laughs> don't, don't go. <laughs> the, um, the moment okay. he opens his mouth, finally. <laughs> Uh, comic books well because we uh, we because i feel like we can't just include comic books with books right there's there's a difference in the visuals i would agree there's an element they are different things um this is why germany starts world wars <laughs> maybe yeah. we don't have anything to really say about it at the moment because <laughs> it's a whole i'm personally thing personally i'm really inspired by comic books in my approach to film because I always think like when I'm writing a script or storyboarding, it's like, how would I frame this if I was drawing a comic book? You know, like if mm -hmm. I think well, if you're if you're if you just make a film of something right off the bat, it can be easy to base your shots around where physically you can place a camera or put a crane or whatever. But like with comic books, you have this God's eye. You can put it anywhere. And, uh, you know with me doing machinima i can put the camera anywhere i want and so i'm just like if I, if this was a graphic novel how would how would this look like if it was a comic book how would this look i think that's the and, interesting aspect of well there are a couple of things with comics because the 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 main thing is because it's still images it's an emphasis on really strong if it was animation it would be like keyframes but like really mm -hmm. strong images but also just how do we connect these images together like what is a good sequence um because i mean i know that that's will eisner said sequential art which is probably a good umbrella term for it um but also i guess the unique benefit of comic books is that in film there is one framing like throughout the film in terms of the size of the image i guess you have variations in aspect ratio but like generally it's it's pretty it's 16 by 9 or mm. you know letterboxed like uh and film was 4 by 3 and then 16 by 9 Video games are typically 16 by 9, but with comic books, it's like you can basically do whatever shape you want uh, for, for a panel. Um, 
which mm-hmm. is like the, the I'd say that's probably like the unique element of of uh, of comic books. It's interesting yeah. to think about how those can inform storytelling. Like, how do I convey this best without being able to move anything? Yeah, that's a thought. But that's mm. it. I'm done. Metal. <laughs> Go for it. No, I, got no I don't want to quick. anymore. <laughs> oh, boy. Tangent. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I legit just forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> no. That's uh, it. Look at your damage, Fringy. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's so really traumatized. Yeah. He's lost his mind. Just say film and give the objectively correct again. answer. <laughs> uh, so I think also that games at their peak are probably the best. Uh, but then again, as we mentioned a bunch of times already, it's not being used well because at the end, it's all about execution. I mean, you can execute it well in pretty much all of them, I- I'd say. Um, but yeah, uh, storytelling in games pretty young still. Um, but yeah, VR is probably the one I want to touch on because I think I'm the only one with a VR set here, right? I don't think I have one. Has- one. Oh, you do? Um, not a proper one, like a phone one. But I, it's like a. <laughs> It is a it is a little <laughs> a, a built one. I mean, use a little VR with yeah. it. Little little bits of VR. Yeah, but I you mean VR sets with games you can play. Yeah, there are games that you can get on it. Yeah. You know, what? I'm sorry I spoke. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm tempted uh, to get a quest, but I don't want to get zucked. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the quest is probably the best value, but you have to be. I think online all the time when you play or something. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I I played a whole bunch on uh, of VR on stream as well. Uh, I think the last thing I finished was Half Life Alex, and man, that was some that was some good shit. I I don't know if the story was super good, but just the immersion in it was like really well executed, which just reminds me it's like man, Valve, please make more games because you're really good at that. <laughs> Stop making so much money and make games again. That would be that would be nice. Uh, Has yeah. anyone played Resident Evil Four in VR yet? Because I'm quite no, that's, interested in what, playing that. Quest exclusive. I'm not allowed to play that. Uh, uh, that's kind of lame. Exclusives uh, for VR headsets. It's, yeah, it's no, only VR enough, exclusive. It Quest exclusives. It's really annoying. I did hear though there's VR mods for Resident Evil 2 and 3 remake. I'm going to want to check those out. Apparently they're like yeah, pretty well made. Too. If you if you go into VR you can play Skyrim a whole new way. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm good. Because the <laughs> VR the VR version is full price I think or something or like pretty pretty high priced. Oh, there so, actually is. <laughs> of course there I, is. It's it's a separate version. <laughs> it's just me me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> No, there's an actual Sky, uh, Skyrim VR. It's it's Not its own surprising. version. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm I'm good. It's probably moddable and shit, but I don't I don't nah nah. It's Skyrim. You, you know what's up. Uh, but yeah, if it's Skyrim's very it's... bad. That's what I hear. Yeah. Some word on the street. I was the world not sick of Skyrim yet. That's a good question. Uh, but yeah, if it's very well executed, you can utilize the gaming <clears throat> the gaming part of storytelling very well like i guess i'll go back to god of war 2018 like even if you're not doing the main story missions and you're just traveling around on your little or your little boat it's either atreus and kratos having conversations and giving you story from different timelines of the gods or uh stories about the mom or later, when the Giga Chat Mimir comes on the head and just starts telling stories, and man, you just want to r- go around with the boat and listen to his stories because it's so great. He tells stories about the gods, and it's just funny as well. Like it's just the game doesn't waste your time with like silence while you rudder around. Like it's giving you backstories and. Shows you the char- character characterizations of the different people and between them. 
uh, and the the side quests. I remember one particular one because Kratos is always like, oh, we don't have time for like silly side quests. We're here for our goal. But then we come across this one guy who lost his crew and he can relate to that guy. He's like, nah, we should help him. And then obviously Atreus is like, wait, but we just said we're not doing any side quests. Like, yeah, but I, I basically just like, yeah, I like him because he sacrificed himself for his crew and I want to give him like closure and stuff. Uh, yeah, that's really well made. But then again, yeah, th as Maul said already, your best bet is probably still movies and if you're really lucky, TV shows. Because uh, lots of times just... Movies are still a gameplay. fucking minefield right now. Yeah, too bad show. television production listen, listen, is audience. an embarrassing disaster. Yeah, the... Listen, listen, everyone listening right now, okay? Movies are not in a good yeah. place. But go back to the <laughs> 1970s the 1990s, there's a lot of great stuff back there, okay? Great, great, great stuff. If you want movies, there's there's plenty of movies there. We did it, everyone. Go back further than that into the, the 30s and the 40s. And no, fuck all that. It. It's overrated. What? <laughs> no, get out of here. <laughs> we did it. 28 questions in six hours and a half hour. Yeah, you're, you're generous calling it 28. I was going to say four. Well, you see, when you ask a question seven times, you could call it the same question. But when you're asking different people, Good. it ends up being different yeah. sort of answers. And well, maybe no, it's the same question. Maybe though, you should it? say maybe you should say four questions, twenty eight answers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like it. Well, yeah. There you go. It's the best twenty eight answers in six hours and a half an hour and a three minutes. We did it. Nice. What a strange we EFAP we did today. It's an odd yeah, one. we were talking about stuff that we like. That's mm -hmm. excuse me. Yeah, just don't worry. We'll be back to normal in no time. We need to make an inverse one of this, where the questions are just like, "What do you hate the most about storytelling? What story do you hate the most?" It's like, oh god, what element of storytelling is the most destructive? Oh man, I actually have an answer to that. <laughs> well, I think there would actually be. A, we could do that sometime if you guys are all up for it. We could do the, the evil version. Oh of yeah. This. For sure. I'll funny. take some vacation days. I'll, I'll get to live up to my name. <laughs> Look at that, immediately in chat, everything. TLJ. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with TLJ? Oh, nothing, nothing. The Pretty. letters itself, they're fine. I use them all yeah, the time. Yeah, T, L, and J are yeah. very commonly used. What story is the most poo? Hmm. That would Finally, be a Isaac. poo story. Yeah, poo hmm. story is probably I, No, I think, I think a poo story, too, <laughs> took what the original did. Uh, I'm sorry. A poo Shallow. I'm sorry. It, it, that's it, it's really called a poo story number two. Oh, um, a poo is my favorite Simpsons but, character. Yeah. Story two resurrections. Racism. A Mr. Hanky oh, Christmas. Hanky. Um. But yeah, I actually had some. Well, well, in the past hour, no, it was before we even this turn of this day. God, time went fast. It was it was like two hours ago. Mm. I've been reminded of an appointment I have this morning. Which means oh, um, I, I figured that the best thing to do was to just try and make sure everyone got their questions answered, but I'm afraid nice. EFAP is going to have to be cut short. And by that I mean... Oh. Oh, cut short at what? A, a, a little <laughs> short six and a half hours. That's true. That's more, true. We wait, made a deal. It's more than six... Wait, wait a minute. Hold on. It, it's more than... Wait. Oh my god, wait, my brain is melting. No, it's six and a half hours. That's about right. I'm looking we, at the banner on your channel and it says long form. Like six and a half hours? What the fuck? I know that's almost too long. I agree, Doom. I think you're right. Thank you. No, no, no. A mere six and a half hours. That's embarrassing. Mamiya. You should be embarrassed, Molo. Well, I mean, I brought you on, so it's already like capped out. We are. Yeah. We're already. Hey. Oh, I mean, yeah. Hey. Out. <laughs> Get schleamed on. Get schleamed on. But. Yeah. yeah. Before we go, we'll we'll do a little chat about what everyone's up to. We'll go from left to right, shall we? Fine. Shall we? Allow it. Shall we shall. Oh, is, it, is it on me? It is on you, <laughs> Doom person. What are you up to in your Doomland? Uh, right now I'm working on a video on Netflix's Arcane that's pretty good. And I'm going to be talking about uh, why it is pretty good and how it could be better. Um, that's, uh, that's about it. Is there, is there anything else you want? Is that it? They usually, okay. usually take like a good 20 seconds or even 30. 
right. I don't know. Yeah, you should talk about like how they're probably the best channel on YouTube, how everyone should subscribe. <laughs> Oh, yeah, about... if you want to go subscribe to my channel, it's called Mauler. Uh, we have about 300,000 subscribers. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> go uh, go subscribe to that. Wow. No, I'm, I'm Tumor Media on YouTube. You can go subscribe if you want. Oh, he's not really. He's not really Mauler, guys. He yeah. was just joking. Damn. Oh, shit. I thought this whole time. Oh, shit. I'm yeah, it, was, it was a convincing, convincing uh, charade. Facade. Yeah. That's right. Very well. Um, you... Facade. Your latest video is still on Django, correct? Yeah, I haven't released a video. I, I've canceled wow. like three or four videos since Django. I last released one. <laughs> what, but what there you... will be there will be more soon. Oh, okay. You, what's what are the other ones then? What's what, 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 you can do it, Mahler. Oh, uh, the ones that got canceled. Um, the, the one that's relevant to us is I was going to make a video called "Art is Not Subjective," <gasps> um, but I spent. I spent about three weeks working on the script, and at this point, I think I'd rather eat glass than finish that video because it's. <laughs> it it ballooned, seems like such an. It? it seems like such a simple thing, it, like I, I, like I could explain the core argument and idea in maybe five minutes, but it just there's so many ideas that branch off of it, and there's all these things you have to explain, otherwise. You know, you're not really doing the topic any service because people will just be like, "Oh, well, what about that?" Right? And it just, oh man, I, if I ever go back to the video, I think it'll end up being legitimately two hours long, which I guess yours is like two or three hours long. So do it. Target. Now I understand why it's uh, it's a really unpleasant bag of marbles. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that you can't say and get away with unless you extensively describe it in anal levels of detail and carefulness. <laughs> and even then people will be like, mm, I didn't watch it, but your video is wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's such a it's such a fashionable thing to say, oh, well, it's subjective. But my, like my, my core problem with that is it just kind of undermines the purpose of discussion, right? It's like uh, I, I actually have I actually don't think um, saying that art isn't subjective is even the hottest take in that video. The hottest take is that saying people's opinions are not equal. <laughs> Some opinions oh actually are God, um, more people, useful than people others. People like to say that, and they will crumble in just an instant on that. In instant. But everyone it's this, says it's it. The, it's the simplest thing. Like, are you actually going to tell me that if you talk to a six-year-old who's watching the movie for the first time, that their opinion on how good a movie is is of equal weight to like? You know, Martin Scorsese. Like, of course not. Yeah, Nobody the six-year-old is that. way more insane at that point. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it's a it's a really really pleasant discussion. I, I look forward to going back to it. Yeah, sweet. Well, uh, the free. What about you? What are you up to? Where did you go? Come back. I'm I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just I'm just working on stuff. It'll be done when it's done. Oh. Oh. That's all I got for you. Have you worked on anything recently that may be coming out tomorrow? Uh, no. Um, no. But oh, right, Boba. <laughs> That's <gasps> right. I've been working on Boba Fett, and it's been an adventure. Um, that's Boba that's Fett. coming out tomorrow, isn't it? Yes, it is on the Moolah channel. It'll be premiering. How exciting! And you can oh my all goodness. check out Hot me, goodness. Metal Rags, Fringy, and Jay enjoying episode three of Boba Fett, which if you've seen yourself, oh my. Um, <laughs> You're in for a treat. And lots of editing went into it. I'm betting oh, you lot are going to have it. some fun. I now, love what fun, time's uh, it coming funny... out again? That'll be like normal if I have time, probably. All righty. I love oh, funny bad that? stuff. Would you say it's funny bad? Um, it's hilarious. Yeah, there are I think it qualifies. Are funny, yeah. but I it's not because there are shows that are funny bad that I would watch on my own, and I would not watch Boba Fett on my own. Yeah, I'd, I'd never watch it alone. Yeah. I'd never watch It'd it. It'd be no. such a waste of time. You may as well just look at the wiki summary. But if you're with friends, oh boy, then it can be funny. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a hoot. Okay. Um, I mean, the gun train is like comedy gold. <laughs> <laughs> the gun train uh, jokes write themselves. Yeah. Oh, Jay, you have a channel. No, I don't. Talk about it. Da -da -da. As with the previous few appearances on EFAP I've made, I'm still working on, on a video about reaction content on Twitch and YouTube with a focus <gasps> on Hassan Piker. 
He has the best oh, reaction it's content. Probably what do you mean? gonna be 30 to 40 minutes long. Oh so my god. You're gonna be stealing his content to make money, is what you're saying. Yes. Wow, ultimate revenge. Jay, when is, the uh, people. Do you have any idea when that's coming out? Um well I was hoping to get it out um before I left for Christmas break. Um which Wait, was, that was on yeah. the twenty first of December mm -hmm. twenty twenty one. Wait, we're past that. What? Fuck. <laughs> when did we get, well, then, I was hoping to get it, then I was hoping to get it done like pretty soon uh, when I got back uh, after Christmas and then I got the coof and it felt very bad for several days. That's the days same thing that happened to me. Whoa. Oh my god. It's, yeah, well, the coof, you know, they say it's going around these days. Well, so do they? you're saying that coronavirus is a slut? Wow. Yes. Slut. Well, well dirty, Jay, I also... Dirty slut. So I'm also working on a video on Hassan, and I was probably going to mention Ooh. you in it <laughs> in a certain a certain event that may have transpired. Oh, you guys are just so clout many chasers. Looking on these videos right now. <laughs> what? You guys are clout chasers. Uh, Hassan is a fucking legend. Leave him alone. Yeah, you're riding on the coattails mm. of legendary men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hassan is a um, a stalwart Renaissance man, you know, and I mm. I can only he hope can't to speak out a little bit of his shadow. Probably. Not. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's not nice. <laughs> Don't make fun of retarded people. No. <laughs> no. Uh, John, what about you? What are you doing? Wait, wait, what, what's happening? I'm John Graham on YouTube. I've been working on a show called RB and the Chiefs since 2007, 2008. Is it done there. yet? And... Uh, no, but I just finished the latest episode of it. It's like an hour. It was oh. really good. I watched it. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm, I'll be premiering that publicly in uh, the next few days. I'm not exactly sure yet. I'm waiting to hear back on a from a few voice actors in regard to how they should be credited. But uh, anyway, um, I'm on the eighth season of my show. Uh, it's about toys that come to life and encounter people online and. Uh, Sounds cringe. You're right. You should watch it anyway. <laughs> oh, they're here. They don't care about that sort of thing. I love cringe. Yeah. And uh, I'm JCJ Graham on Twitter as well. That's you're all. you're in your eighth season. Yeah. Everything good happens in the eighth season. Is what I hear. I've heard that. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. I'm working on a mainline video. It's coming along. That's all I can tell you is. Um. And then we got, yeah, the, the latest thing I made was with Fringy the Boba Fett, which is going to be fun. It'll be tomorrow. Other than that, you'll see me and these some of these fine peeps on the when, Wednesday coming, which in fact will begin with us covering all the Super Chats from today. Um, nice. Catch-up style. And then again, the Saturday of, of Fappins. Um, that, that, that's, 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 that's that, you know? Uh, metal, what about you, you Hello. fuck? Whoa, you that's, fuck! That's very <laughs> oh nice. God, you motherfucker. What am I gonna do? Well, if he uh, was gay, he wouldn't. I mean. <laughs> yes. Well, Did I mean, the sentence, Rex? If he Finish was gay, sentence. he wouldn't have fucked his mother. Whoa. Yeah, that's. Would fucked his. He would. His dad would have fucked well, him. I, he would have I mean, tricked his father into fucking him in the butt. Step I feel like it's more of a line to cross he wants to gay, to fuck. gay daddy butt sex. I, I feel like I feel like it's um it's more of a line. It, the incest line is a is a bigger line to cross than the I am not attracted to this gender line. I think. Anyway, on that but note, Mel, do you have a, a, a peer-reviewed study mm -hmm. to prove that? No. How All right, an opinion discarded. <laughs> Oh, okay. Mel just shout. What's wrong? Internet incest? debates are easy. Uh, uh, but you've never even done incest rags. <laughs> well, I was inside my mom for a few months, but oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, 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 like last year. Are you, are you calling me a baby? Rick are on the stream. A... No. <laughs> Matt, Mel, Did you forge. do an incest? The forge. Talk about your gay little uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, on one hand, uh, Twitch streams were gonna be back on a regular basis uh, soon. I'm, I'm, I'm over. I'm, I'm done with vacation times. Uh, and also, Metal's Forge is gonna come. Well, not uh, back. It's gonna be continue. 
Uh, and it's going to be a new one tomorrow about Matrix Resurrections. And Ugh. I'm sure it's going to be a Ooh. great Yo, movie. Yo, that movie's... To... Mm. Yeah, I, I'm going to watch it tomorrow, do all them them notes and stuff. Uh, so Good luck. A, a fun day. <laughs> yeah, uh, your notes. Again. All, all mm. things Matrix, because I'm yeah. stupid. I'm just going to do it on my own without any guests tomorrow. So that's going to be fun. So, uh, uh, if I really good luck. Might, that, might, might, gonna, monster, I think, to might, might really quickly fast. talk about a little bit about the, the current Twitch meta that's out there because it's very annoying to me and I hate it. So, oh, I'm yeah, so hateful, that that's all. The DMCA uh, stuff? Ah, there's nothing to hate about oh, that. Yeah, they're, the, they're making use the, of the, content, they're entertaining people, and these evil corporations are trying to be like, oh, is that our copyright? It's bullshit, really. Hassan deserves to stream everything <laughs> that's ever been made. Exactly. <laughs> a, a funny a, a funny note on matrix resurrections um the first time i saw anything about it was the rlm review and i legitimately couldn't tell if they deep faked the audio like i couldn't really believe that this oh, was no. actually the movie oh their video so... i couldn't do it i couldn't do it i got like five minutes in and i was like i can't listen to this i can't do it i don't want to remember the, the you movie? this way <laughs> no no the rlm video oh because they were positive uh, if you watch Matrix Resurrection and you watch the video reviewing it, it it's hard to reconcile uh, a little bit, a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll watch it after I watch the Matrix Resurrection. So wait, it, was it was it deep fake? I still can't tell. Is is well, that like well, actually they're, they're the movie? clips from the movie? Are from the, the movie's horribly uh, ugly and horribly edited. Uh, it's just a, oh boy. Uh, enjoy that. Man, man. Good I luck watching that tomorrow. Movie. That's gonna be a great yeah. Sunday. Well, I mean, like, yeah, you'll have a great time. Know. Do it for the love yeah. of the craft. Woo! Them, them giving sort of a flaccid endorsement of something that's pretty bad is not new. <laughs> I've been watching their content well, for a while. It's I don't, I don't mind do disagreeing it. with them if uh, if they have their reasoning, but like their reasoning for Matrix Resurrection sucked. Jay was just like, it's it makes meta commentary about how fans of franchises suck. It's like, okay, okay, talk about how it was executed, you please. Suck. Yeah, see, Jay's doing it again. Can you believe it? But yeah, if you want to daddy. know more about that, I'm not CJ. We're talk about it tomorrow. It's gonna be CJ a great time. And then yeah. Mike was I saw like, the... all of it was horrible, and I couldn't even watch it in one go. But I loved it. And it was like, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw a clip of the bathroom scene on YouTube, and I thought I was watching an SNL skit mm -hmm. or like an M MTV Movie Awards kind mm -hmm. of bit. Mm -hmm. Where I was like, this isn't real, is it? Yeah. This is from the movie. The no, no, exactly no, but you not atrocious. being able to tell if yeah. it's real. That's meta commentary no, on the Matrix. No, no, oh, no, wow. That's so no. deep. Yeah. Right, that's I'm that's gonna ex punch exactly you. how I felt. It's so bad you can't believe it. That's just like meta, man. Wait, Rags, you're oh, the last one. Say stuff about channel. Channel is currently and videos making in progress potentially. Like, subscribe, smash comment below no. in the description you now in the description what comment well the actually i put below. out i put a video my descriptions are on top i get it all out of the way up front and then my video is at the bottom of the page i i encourage people to comment before they watch the video based on nothing but the <laughs> description all right um however they do a lot uh, of i time. do i do have um i i put out a video today about boba fett actually I was going to do one to release tomorrow, but then I remembered, oh, yeah, that's right. We've got EFAP today. I got to talk about Boromir. And so we did. <laughs> I got to cry for fun. Boromir. <laughs> I got to cry, cry for Boromir. Uh, but I put out a Dog Bites video uh, today. I should have one up Sunday. No, tomorrow is Sunday. I should have one out Monday because today I'm not working on it because this is what I'm doing with my life. Uh, so I'll have another one out Monday. Sweet. I decided that when I was going to do for uh, Dog Bites, I'll make a regular channel video because I need to get used to using the new stuff I've got. Um, and I want to get some old things done because I, I got to get over the hump of some old projects until I could slide greasily and smooth into my new stuff that I want to do. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned for the deets. Uh, await further bulletins as events warrant. Um, that is the news. Very well. Rag signing off. Oh, Is good. there anything you guys wanted to say before we turn the lights off? Raid Shadow Legends. Huh? Raid Shadow Legends. Raid I guess uh, subscribe to Quib Gift. 
And you know, just I won't forget about the referral code everybody. EFAP, which will get 20% uh, off your first month mm-hmm. or 15% off of a yearly membership. Uh, uh, let me see. Um, I think that was, I, that's it for me, I think. If you want to, if you want to learn how to use Audible, you can Noom and it made me laugh. That's my story to the for the end. I rarely get to talk about writing with other people, so uh, like who who also write. So this is really cool, man. Thanks for having me. This was pretty cool. This this was pretty awesome. Thanks for uh, joining us, Olivia's. For sure, it's a it's it's particularly difficult in my experience to like actually discuss this stuff. Like I've been to a bunch of writing groups and. My experience is that those gay. places are pretty unpleasant. Yeah, it's, it is pretty gay. It's it's not it's not fun. This was much more fun. That's so gay. Metal would well, go there with his dad. In just almost seven hours, we covered we covered quite a bit. I think Rude. we did a good job. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the folks will like this out. This, this one you'll see us next week, probably talking about some movie being better or worse than the video we're covering claims. Who knows what adventures we'll get up to. Until that then. That sounds like an EFAP. Goodbye, everybody. Fringy, yeah, Fringy and I gotta go watch uh, Ak- Akira. Akira. Oh, Akira. namaste. Akira. Uh, Akira. Konnichiwa. By the way, the, the proper name is Mononoke Hime. People in Chicago. Mononoke Akira. Mononoke Hime. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sayonara. Namaste. Cool. Let's go.